Honorable Prime Minister, Honorable President of the National Assembly, Honorable President of the Const Constitutional Court, distinguished deputies, distinguished members of the government, Your Excellencies, distinguished representatives of civil society, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Freedom House International Organization and the Union of Informed Citizens NGO, allow me to warmly welcome your participation in the Armenian Forum for Democracy. This is the first time in Armenia that such a comprehensive public forum on democracy is taking place. It aspires to become an annual event. The aim of the forum is to bring together all stakeholders involved in uh, supporting democracy in order to jointly analyze the agenda of uh, democratic reforms that have started in the country. Just a few words on the agenda. After the opening and welcoming speeches, we will have three panel discussions, respectively, on the ongoing democratic reforms in Armenia, followed by the panel on the consolidation of democracy and human rights, and then on the media and disinformation. As you will see, speakers include representatives of uh, the sectors who best know uh, their sectors. So our speakers include representatives of the executive and legislative authorities of the Republic of Armenia, heads of state agencies, ambassadors, representatives of international organizations and civil society. So, and now I would like uh, to invite the Prime Minister of the Republic of Armenia, Nicole Pashinyan, to open the forum and deliver a welcoming speech. Mr. Prime Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable President of the National Assembly, Honorable President of the Constitutional Court, uh, distinguished members of the government, distinguished members of the law enforcement agencies, uh, distinguished uh, deputies, Your Excellencies, dear representatives of Freedom House, de uh, dear guests, dear compatriots, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to welcome the Forum on Democracy, the Armenian Forum for Democracy, and I think that uh, it's the, um, it, or the Republic of Armenia is the proper place to hold such an event, and it, uh, we are doing in a very timely manner, and it has a very proper title, because I generally say that democracy is the main international brand of the Republic of Armenia. Uh, when I make this statement, I refer to different international organizations and the reports they publish. But because uh, we have a lot of representatives who deal with those reports, uh, uh, I would like to view the issue from another point of view, because these reports are very important, but they are not the most significant uh, ones, because reports are not a cause, they are a consequence. And I would like to state that if in the Republic of Armenia I, when talking about democracy, I refer to the reports of international organizations. Now, I would like uh, to refer to the citizen of the Republic of Armenia when talking on democracy. Because in the Republic of Armenia, the most important institution of democracy is the institution of the citizen. And I think that the citizen is the one who is the key guarantor of democracy in Armenia. And I think that this is related to the circumstance that the citizen of the Republic of Armenia knows that they are the ones who decide, that uh, they are the key subjects to, of decision making, just as it is env envisaged by the Constitution of the Republic of Armenia. And how does democ democratic country citizen differ from a conditionally non-democratic uh, country citizen? I think there is a very significant circumstance. 
the citizen of a democratic state has a high uh, sense of responsibility and hence the citizen of a democratic country has a lot to think, to analyze, to weigh and spends more time on analyzing democratic events because each citizen in a democratic country knows the scope of their responsibility for uh, the past, the, the present, and the future of the country. And consequently, I would like to add that the Republic of Armenia during, after the war, 2020 war, we went through a lot of uh, crisis, and it was the citizen of Armenia that uh, did not allow the failure of the state and the loss of the, the constitutional order. I, I don't know how much uh, this fits into the protocol of today's event, but because uh, our event is called Armenian Forum for Democracy, I would like to us to applaud the citizen of the Republic of Armenia, who is uh, the pillar of democracy in Armenia. And I do think that it, there are two important issues, which we uh, questions we should answer. First of all, to what extent democracy is able to preserve and protect security in the country, and to what extent democracy is able to maintain and protect uh, the autonomy and independence of the country. I think that the answer of the, uh, to the second question is very definite, and I gave the answer to the question that democracy today is uh, the guarantor of independence uh, uh, in the Republic of Armenia. It's the pillar of uh, independence, and it is our task to prove that, yes, democracy is able to ensure the external uh, security of the country country and the internal security of the country. And in this respect, I would like to uh, attach importance to the peace agenda that the citizen of the Republic of Armenia has adopted. I mean, uh, sorry, I didn't mean the citizen. I meant that uh, it was, has been adopted by the government, and the citizen has given a mandate for it. In general, I think that uh, the, the formulation and discussion of the peace agenda is of crucial importance, especially in the logical framework of uh, uh, the circumstance that, uh, based on the Constitution, the decisions in the country are made by the citizen. And it is very of crucial importance that we provide proper information to the citizen so that the citizen can be well informed when making decisions and recently and very often we address the peace agenda and related issues, the negotiation process, the history. Sometimes some people interpret it as a debate between former and current authorities. It doesn't have anything to do with that and our government, our political team uh, has to provide, it uh, considers it's their duty to provide proper information to the citizen so that the citizen can have in-depth information about uh, the issues and relevant information and so that the citizen can make the decisions they are supposed to make. And based on that analysis of the uh, situation, the citizen has so far made their decisions. And today, I have to also publicly say the following. You know, today we talk about democracy in Armenia, but uh, in this hall there are people in the first row, second, third rows, in all the rows. There are people with whom we have maybe uh, we have maybe worked independently, separately, uh, or jointly to uh, establish democracy in the Republic of Armenia. And I think we have implemented our mission, although we have not finished 
adjusted here yet. But now I would like to state that it is very important to consolidate democracy, and for that purpose, we should unite around another mission because we have brought uh, democracy to the Republic of Armenia and in the same way we should bring peace to the Republic of Armenia because peace without democracy and democracy without peace cannot exist and I can state with pride that there is a political authority in Armenia which is united around this mission and I think that we should uh, that all the uh, democratic uh, forces should unite around this agenda because they elaborate on each other's activities. Uh, it doesn't mean that we should uh, have the same uh, opinion or vision about different issues. But I think that at this stage, it is very important to be very frank with each other, to be very honest with each other and to analyze the history in the recent, of the recent 30 years, to do it in an atmosphere of honesty, frankness, and uh, do it looking directly into each other's eyes. And democracy creates enough and sufficient conditions for this. And hence, uh, the continuation of our democratic mission is the mission of peace, which is more grave, which is more complicated, and which requires much more power and willingness. And I think that uh, I am sure that we are going to implement that mission, because if we do not have faith, if we do not have belief, then there will not be responsibility to take over this mission and implement it. Nevertheless, uh, well, of course, we can't talk a lot of positive uh, things about our democracy, but we, sh we should also state that uh, our democracy also f faces challenges, and we face two groups of issues. Uh, the first uh, group uh, is faced by all democratic countries in the world, and these issues or that that one issue is as follows, the exploitation of democracy against democracy. You know that uh, in all the, democratic, all the democratic countries of the world face this challenge. It's the phenomenon uh, when uh, the democratic principles are used in order to destroy democracy. And in this path, we should uh, definitely know what strategy are we going to have in order to overcome this uh, challenge. And my belief is that this challenge the, f the best way to overcome this challenge is the establishment and development of democratic institutions and the democratization of state institutions uh, in all the senses of this word. So in terms of prof professionalism, legality, transparency, and accountability. Today, our one of our main challenges is uh, the judiciary uh, system and in uh, we because we do not have much uh, progress in judiciary reform and that's why we are criticized by many people here in the hall and we think that that criticism is objective it is justified although uh, we also uh, criticize ourselves but we know better the issues uh, with which we deal with. So maybe some of our partners know about the issues in uh, uh, the same amount of depth. Uh, but anyhow, uh, yes, uh, it is. I don't want to, uh, to see it as a justification. And we are going to pursue this uh, path. And we should be consistent in our activities. Dear colleagues, uh, and uh, I would like to conclude my speech. I would like to refer to international reports, two of which, or even three of which, are very important for me. The first one uh, is as follows. I have to state that uh, in 2021, uh, the Republic of Armenia 
uh, inter has uh, transitioned from electoral authorian authoritarianism to electoral democracy. And this is a very important development and change. And I think that this means that the Republic of Armenia is uh, has maybe moved from the second group to the first group, that is the highest league of democracy. Next is a media freedom indicator. And in t starting 2018, the Republic Republic of Armenia has registered immense progress, and that progress is going to continue. Uh, the f freedom of the media and freedom of the press is very important and cru crucial for the citizen to get sufficient and uh, quality information, and uh, we should care about it. And many democratic states actually face this challenge of uh, increasing and developing media literacy of our citizens so that uh, they are able uh, to distinguish uh, fake information from real information without administ using administrative levers. And there is an issue here, and we should deal with it. Uh, uh, we should. Uh, uh, establish the institution of the media and media stakeholders so that people know the source of the information and what purpose it might have. It might uh, refer to both the authorities and the opposition. The issue is that the citizens should be able to be uh, well informed to the extent possible on the sources of information. And the third uh, circumstance I would like to refer to is uh, the density of the prison population. I think uh, that it it is not uh, given enough uh, attention, and it, but it provides enough information about the nature of the country. In 2021, the, re the prison uh, for the density of the prison population of uh, Armenia uh, is uh, better only for, uh, inter is, uh, has better indicators only from one country in Europe, which is Monaco. So this is an important indicator, and uh, very often they say that the political team who has uh, come to power through democracy is trying to establish authoritarianism in the country. So many forces use it to uh, say that we are, uh, are this country, these authorities are trying to oppress uh, the population, etc. But I think that in the uh, authoritarian uh, countries, uh, the number of prisons increase and do not decrease decrease. And hence, I would like to mention that during this period, we have closed two penitentiary institutions for two reasons. First, because there was no need for that penitentiary institution anymore. And second, those penitentiary institutions do not conform to the criteria we want to have. Of course, uh, the other penitentiary institutions do not conform to the criteria either. But unfortunately, at least we cannot, of course, close all the penitentiary institutions altogether. And as our Minister of Justice mentioned, uh, we have now the task of having uh, the penitentiary institutions of our dreams. Of course, it sounds a bit strange, but I think that reveals our our intentions. And I would like to conclude my speech with a phrase which actually was born in the Republic of Armenia in the National Assembly. So let's give cheers to the democracy of Armenia. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Honorable Prime Minister. And now uh, the, the head of the EU delegation in Armenia will deliver a welcoming speech. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Esteemed Prime Minister, esteemed uh, Speaker of the National Assembly, esteemed uh, President of the Constitutional Court, ministers, deputies, excellencies, Ladies and gentlemen, Andranik, uh, thank you for inviting me, Mr. Behrens. Uh, I'm really very honored to be here and to speak to you. And I'm looking forward to an open and interesting discussion about democracy and promotion of human rights. 
democracy, development, rule of law, and respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms are interdependent and mutually reinforcing. They are not achieved once. Hmm? We don't have a democracy and we are happy and it remains a democracy. It is a daily process and we all have to fight. So what in the end is democracy? Democracy provides an environment that everybody can enjoy equal rights, that everybody can freely express his or her opinion, that people have a say in decisions and can hold decision makers accountable. Democracy means access to power and exercise of power according to rule of law. To have a separation of power, to have checks and balances, and an independent judiciary. To have pluralism in political parties and organizations, and pluralism in society and independent media. To have, in the end, strong, transparent, and accountable institutions. So this is not coming overnight. We know it. So it means a constant effort to make progress. Nowadays, I think significant new challenges are affecting democracy and human rights worldwide. We notice that after a period of increased democratization around the world, many democracies appear to backslide. Armenia as well has faced major challenges, such as the COVID pandemic, the 44 days war, the post-war situation, and recently the impact of Russia's war in Ukraine. And Prime Minister, I totally agree, there will be no peace, no security without democracy. These challenges have important social, psychological, and economic consequences, and it is difficult to tackle them and in the same time to safeguard freedom of expression and human rights. I think we can say Armenia managed to maintain the main freedoms as a functioning of the National Assembly during the pandemic, a pluralism in media, and one of the major achievements of Armenia was the free and fair, competitive, transparent, and well-managed early parliamentary ele elections 2021, despite the short preparatory period and in the middle of an international uh, health crisis. With these elections, Armenia expressed the will of its people to continue the dem democracy path, to continue the reform process. For this engagement, Armenia needs an independent, pluralistic, reliable, and responsible media sector, as also the Prime Minister said. Strengthening human rights to freedom of expression, developing independent media and responsible journalism are important uh, elements for peace and democracy in order to get the real information and uh, not to get uh, um, affected by disinformation. The European uh, Union upholds media freedom, pluralism of society, as pillars of a modern democracy and enablers of free and open debate. Armenia also needs an empowered civil society, which is a crucial com component of any democratic system. A proactive involvement of civil society in policy making and governance reform is important to deliver the political transformation. However, Armenian civil society faced criticism, human rights activists and civil society organizations promoting human rights, democratic values, and peace building have become a target for attacks, for accusations, and hate speech. 
In the last week, I heard complaints by NGOs defending and supporting rights of women, of promoting children's rights, fighting domestic violence, supporting the rights of the LGBTI community, and they were targeted by people and groups who in the same time complain restriction of their freedom of expression. Sorry, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is not a menu card where you can choose what you like. It says everybody, everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration without distinction of any kind, such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth or other status. So it means we all together have to support the human rights defenders who are active in this country and whom I am, admire very much and we have a strong cooperation. We need to have a comprehensive approach to human rights, the legal framework, and we need a transparent implementation of laws. All are equal before the law and are entitled without discrimination to equal protection by the law. The National Assembly's approval of 2020 of a law criminalizing public calls and justification of violence is, I think, a step in the right direction. On the other hand, regarding the defamation law, there are concerns that it could uh, limit or having a, a serious chilling effect on the right of freedom of expression. Again, this is a process and this has to be developed together. Um, allow me to quote Albert Einstein, who said, laws alone cannot secure freedom of expression. In order that every man present his views without penalty, there must be a spirit of tolerance in the entire population. This means we need to listen to each other. We need to use arguments and not just slogans and an aggressive language. We have to strive for compromise. We have to strive for a public debate. And we have to look together for peaceful solutions. Democracy is a continuous endeavor. And with the SEPA agreement, the European Union supports Armenia to strengthen the democracy, rule of law, human rights, and together to create a prosperous, safe, peaceful environment for all citizens of Armenia. Thank you, and I wish us an interesting discussion. Thank you, Ms. Ambassador. Next, I would like to kindly give the floor to Mr. Mark Behrendt, Freedom House Director for Europe and Eurasia Programs. Mr. Behrendt, you're most welcome. Yes, in summer, Mets had you cared. Says Vochunel Eyes Forum in Tatskum, you have Freedom House City Mahayastanum. Freedom House was established in 1941 at a time of great challenge to democracy. Freedom House's Freedom in the World Report has documented 16 years of democratic declines globally. So we're, we're in another, another very dangerous situation. Freedom House is known for its reports, but an essential component of our work is in implementing programming to support human rights defenders and democracy advocates to build democracy in their own countries. I'm cu currently in Armenia to participate in our advancing democratic values in Armenia project. 
supported by the U.S. State Department's Bureau for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Today's Forum for Democracy is part of this project, and it's an opportunity to bring together a wide cross-section of civil society, leaders working on many aspects of democracy in Armenia, grassroots organizations and groups usually excluded from participation in policymaking, but those whose perspectives are essential for policy development and, and govern, governments. The Advancing Democratic Culture in Armenia project was designed before pandemic and, and more, and collaboratively, and the idea was to collaboratively address challenges to disinformation and, and democratic progress. While the context has dramatically changed with the pandemic, the Second Karabakh War, and now new war impacting the country in unpredictable ways, disinformation continues and and partnerships, vertical and horizontal, continue to be necessary to address even, even the substance of disinformation which changes with, with the changing context. We will continue to create spaces for a dialogue between authorities, CSOs, lawmakers, and bring positive change to Armenia's fight against dis disinformation and jointly, de and jointly def defend democratic values. Authoritarians have always used the excuse of national security to limit rights. But even democracies like Armenia face real national security threats. The solution is not to reject democracy and stop protecting human rights. In fact, that will only increase security challenges and undermine society's ability to respond to them. But to double down on democratic rights, to build broad human security, the exploitation of this false narrative is a threat to the country's democratic development. Another issue endangering Armenia's democratization is the dis dysfunction of the media landscape in the country, its polarization and sensationalism. This is a problem not unique to Armenia, and it, it only undermines public trust and builds cynicism and apathy in society when public involvement is most needed. This is used for new, there is need for new and human rights centered political and public discourse. Despite various challenges in global and local crises, situations such as COVID-19 and the Nagorno-Karabakh War. Freedom House reports indicate that Armenia in recent years has made significant progress in the field of democracy and human rights. Freedom House took notice of the recent well-run parliamentary elections and the reform agenda of the re-elected government. But at the same time, we raised concern about the criminalization of insults and slander against officials and public figures, increasing fines for defamation and insults, and seriously, that seriously threatened freedom of expression in Armenia. Armenian civil society was at the forefront to warn society about the risks this legislation poses to freedom of expression. It is essential that government and parliament listen to these voices and allow civil society and human rights activists to participate in major policy processes. Freedom House remains committed to supporting the progress of democracy, human rights, and civil society in Armenia. I would like to thank the Prime Minister Pashinyan other government officials and the diplomatic community for coming today. I'm excited that Freedom House has played a role in bringing you together with such a broad range of civil society working in many spheres with perspectives necessarily necessary for effective policy. This meeting can serve as an important opportunity for dialogue and boosting opportunities for cooperation. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mr. Berendt. Uh, and now I will just ha we will ha just have a small break so that we technically prepare for the panel discussions. We will have a five-minute break. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Honorable President of the National Assembly, distinguished representatives of the executive, legislative, and judicial authorities, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, uh, representatives of the CSOs, dear guests, on behalf of the Union of Informed Citizens, I would like to once again thank you for uh, accepting the invitation and uh, honoring this unprecedented event with your presence. Democracy is not and cannot be an end in itself, but democracy is the only and an uh, uh, way to achieve prosperity and uh, justice, and it has no alternative. Unfortunately, in recent years, a number of forces have tried to place democracy in contradiction to security and stability. But I'm glad that not only do I not need to prove the opposite in this hall, but I can state with confidence that the citizens of Armenia have 
unequivocally stated the opposite in 2018 and in 2021. However, we should put flesh on the will of the people. We should achieve the goal of an efficient, democratic and just state through reforms. And today, at this forum, we have the honor of hosting the people who play a key role in those reforms. Some of these reforms are going well, some are lagging behind. However, fortunately, we know that the Armenian people are not alone in this endeavor. Reforms uh, are also strongly supported by friendly states uh, of uh, the Armenian people. And uh, the United States of America has a key role among those friends. And today we we'll host uh, the Ambassador to, uh, the of the United States of America to the Republic of Armenia, Ms. Lynn Tracy. Ms. Tracy, your uh, ambas uh, embassy and your government uh, provides immense support in democratic uh, reforms and other sectoral reforms. How do you, what, what assessment would you like to give to, to these reforms and the, how does the Armenian society consume those reforms? Well, and first of all, let me just say how very pleased I am uh, to be here uh, today with uh, um, uh, friends and colleagues uh, and partners. Uh, I want to congratulate um, Freedom House on holding uh, this first Armenian Forum for Democracy. I think it really demonstrates the level of, of um, uh, engagement that we're able to have in Armenia and, and uh, the place of um, where Armenia is on its democratic path. And I want to um, uh, express my appreciation also to the Prime Minister, to my colleague, uh, Ambassador Victorin. I thought both sets of remarks were uh, really on point and helped set us up for these panel discussions. Uh, the United States, uh, as I think many of my um, uh, others in the diplomatic community are celebrating 30 years of relations um, with Armenia, diplomatic relations, uh, and certainly since 1992, um, um, uh, in terms of assistance, uh, what I can say is that the United States government has provided uh, close to $3 billion um, in funding to improve the lives of Armenians. Uh, I also want to note that you know, we are not alone in providing assistance. Uh, we have many partners and actors uh, our colleagues um, from the European Union, as well as the member states uh, there who act bilaterally, uh, other countries that have been good partners with Armenia. Um, I, will focus my, I will focus my remarks on U.S. assistance, since I know that best, but I, 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 I don't want to uh, forget that there is a lot of good work happening, a lot of complementary uh, work so that we are not duplicating, but we try to be effective by complementing uh, um, our efforts. Uh, but I think that some of my assessment uh, may hold true for some of the work of, of others. Uh, and I certainly want in this to give enormous credit to the Armenian people, uh, because what we are doing um, uh, in the assistance um, space uh, is not possible without that kind of a partnership that will from, from the people uh, who want uh, to take advantage of, of the assistance that's being offered. And we also, I think, I will say for the United States, we have found a good partner um, with um, uh, this government uh, as a partner on re the reform agenda and democratic activities. Uh, we're working in many sectors. Um, uh, that promote democracy, including building democratic institutions, uh, fighting corruption, developing the economy, and uh, something that I think is above all important to note is investing in people. Uh, that investment in people is absolutely essential. It's just not possible to be successful in these other areas if you are not investing in people. Uh, and 
I really liked what the Prime Minister had to say uh, about preparing citizens to participate in democracy. I think that's part of what we're doing when we're investing in people, and it is essential for a democracy to grow and thrive. Um, you know, it's hard to provide a, a complete report card, <laughs> given the scope of, uh, uh, of the, uh, the efforts that have been taking place um, over the past 30 years. Um, I think when I look at, I will take one quick look at the long-term effectiveness, uh, where we can make some assessments and then maybe move forward uh, and make some very uh, uh, brief comments on some specific areas in more recent years. Uh, I think that the people investment is a very good place to look at from the long term. Uh, for me, an example that I find very powerful is uh, that we have uh, a very long-standing partner in the American um, <coughs> University in Armenia. This was uh, an institution that with other partners was established uh, uh, nearly 30 years ago. Uh, the United States provided through USAID provided seed money uh, uh, and has continued to support through um, the, the university through various projects. And so when I look at one gauge of effectiveness, I look at these kinds of institutions that are educating people, young people, and that continue to be a partner over time that we can go back to, and it's not just the U.S. government, uh, that those um, layered benefits uh, of investment and partnership are really important, I think, in noting effectiveness, that it's not just a drop in, in the bucket or something very short term, but long term. Um, I also would like to, to just note we have had many exchange programs, another example of investing in people. And here again, I feel very pleased. Uh, um, uh, these exchange programs range across from young people to technical uh, experts to professionals uh, to civil society. And I think when Armenia was ready, and I think there, was, there have been certainly different moments in Armenia's path since independence, uh, these investments in people have paid off, where the right people have been ready to take advantage of, of Armenia's development. If I was to say something then about where uh, we need to continue to look for improvement on, on human capacity and investment, I think it is in the public sector. Uh, in government, we see uh, a continued need for um, a strong uh, merit-based um, uh, system that brings uh, competent people into the service of government for the service of the people. Over the past four years, uh, I would say um, uh, I can point to uh, I think a number of areas that have already been touched on by the Prime Minister and, and uh, Ambassador Victorin. Uh, but let me note electoral reform uh, and two free and fair elections. And two free and fair elections, uh, one of which took place in extremely challenging circumstances. Uh, uh, and this was a place where I think the work certainly of USAID and others in preparing the electoral code um, working with civil society, working with the, um, uh, uh, those that manage and administer the election system, all of those components came together to produce a very important and powerful result in a very difficult time for Armenia uh, that I think reaffirmed uh, um, Armenia's uh, progress on a democratic path and gave them an opportunity to make a decision about leaders, uh, um, whether they would retain leaders or look for new ones. I mean, that's what democracy is about. Media development, um, here, uh, you know, I think the picture is, is mixed. I see good things happening. We have certainly been investing in uh, uh, training um, journalists, trying to help journalists develop a sense of independence, neutrality, uh, integrity in their, their work. Uh, we have supported young journalists as they work on their skills in investigative journalism, uh, um, taking advantage of new technologies such as podcasting to reach more people, and this is very important. Uh, 
But uh, on the other side of the ledger and where I think there is still room for improvement, uh, it is in legislation and ensuring that legislation is addressing areas of concern, but without uh, suppressing or trampling on critical freedoms, freedom of speech, the ability of journalists to conduct their work. Uh, Anti-corruption is another place where the United States and others have partnered very closely with Armenia. We've had a number of new institutions set up, the Corruption uh, Prevention Commission, the Anti-Corruption Court, the Anti-Corruption Investigative Committee. These are institutions that are largely just getting started. I think we've seen good things from the Prevention uh, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, Prevention, the Corruption Prevention Commission that I think are preparing the way, but obviously there will need to be more work. You can't set an institution up and then walk away from it. You have to continue to invest in it. Uh, the Prime Minister said it best, the judiciary needs uh, a lot of attention. Uh, this was an area um, that had, um, the, ch the challenges there are enormous. And, and to be fair, I think it's important to note that, that the idea of simply throwing out all just judges uh, would have created its own set of challenges. Um, uh, but it, it can't go left unaddressed because the, this is such an important area of democracy that to not address uh, um, the need for independence and for integrity in the judiciary is, is really essential for Armenia continuing to be able to move forward. Uh, a last area on reform that I want to touch on is police reform. I mean, this has certainly gotten a lot of attention in recent days. Uh, the United States, the EU, and others have partnered with the uh, police reform, the patrol police, which was launched last year. Um, uh, but, you know, in watching what's been happening with the demonstrations, uh, it's clear that there are concerns uh, um, uh, through what we've seen um, in reporting and videos about excessive use of force. Uh, that needs to be investigated. It needs to be, uh, it's a, an area where there needs to be accountability. I think we've seen um, uh, indications that the government is uh, uh, taking heed of the need to investigate. Uh, and particularly, um, uh, in addition to respecting the rights of protesters to demonstrate peacefully, uh, there's a need to respect the right of journalists uh, to cover these events without um, harassment or interference. I mean, that's all to say that protesters also have responsibilities, the right to, to act in a peaceful manner um, that does not um, uh, 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 contribute to to chaos or, or disorder or to vo the violations of the rights of others. Uh, so I think that um, uh, this reform is particularly important and I want to say how much we appreciate the cooperation of the Ministry of Justice um, in working together. Uh, and to, to note, and this is turning back to something that Ambassador Victorin said, uh, that democracy is, is a process, that it is about making progress. I've had people writing to me about the police reform because they know the United States has been involved and they've said to me, so this is your democracy. And I say, you know, um, no, uh, democracy is not a state of perfection. Uh, democracy is a constant state of, of process, of um, uh, seeking accountability, ensuring that the rights of people are protected. Uh, but it is not one state. And I think in the, in the case of the police, as I said, we'll look for accountability and for investigation. Um, and uh, I would remind um, those who are making that kind of a criticism, uh, you know, coming from the United States, which is a democracy, we have our own challenges uh, and the police and the, the, the conduct of police is one that we are constantly also having to, to struggle with, to review, uh, and to seek to improve. So this is, not, this is not a situation unique to Armenia. What is important at the end of the day is that seeking of accountability. Um, I think the last note that I'll make, um, and here I would say 
um, uh, uh, where I think that we need to do more um, in terms of effectiveness of assistance and finding partnership with government. And this is on the protection of those who are most vulnerable and are at the margins of society. Uh, uh, women, uh, the elderly, those who are disabled, our LGBTQI community, these are all people who deserve and need that special uh, uh, attention. Um, and I think this is where assistance, but partnership with the government of Armenia could do better. But in closing, let me say that I just am very, very, um, uh, I am very optimistic, despite the challenges that Armenia um, is facing. Because what I see is a society and a government that is committed to a reform agenda that is um, focused on uh, improving the lives and the future of Armenia. And as long as we have that kind of will and partnership, um, I will remain optimistic. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. And I think we have the consensus that the judiciary reform and the judiciary system reform are the most slow ones, but Armenia is not an exception in this matter. We, there are, uh, we have seen the experience of other countries who have gone through transition to democracy, and the judiciary reform have been the most failed ones and the most difficult ones. And it's no secret uh, uh, that, uh, and Mr. Prime Minister also mentioned it, that these reforms are the most criticized ones. And I will just uh, add to what was said. Uh, maybe a Prime Minister would might not agree with it, but it, they are uh, criticized for a purpose. Uh, Mr. Karen Andreasian is here with us uh, together today, who has uh, voiced these issues regarding judiciary uh, reform and the issues in the state since uh, 2011, and has a better idea of the problems in the system. Mr. Andreasian, what are our prospects here? When will we achieve tangible results? tangible changes in the judiciary system. If you allow me, uh, before starting my speech, I would like to say that uh, walking, I came here walking from the ministry, and uh, there were uh, several hundreds of people rallying in the street, and they were whistling after me. They were voicing criticism, and some of them were voicing insults. And I smiled to them, I greeted them, and I wished them health and prosperity. And I think that as a, as government today and yesterday and tomorrow as well, we have to try in this manner to turn uh, to um, realize to exercise democracy in Armenia. Uh, of course, before coming to the substantiative uh, issues, I would like to thank the organizers, the Freedom House and Uni Union of uh, Informed Citizens, Mr. Ioannis. And I'm thankful for this opportunity. I'm, th I'm thankful that uh, the Minister of the Constitutional Court and the members of the Cos Constitutional Court are sitting here, the uh, Deputy President of the National Assembly, the deputies of uh, the uh, National Assembly, and uh, the ambassadors. And I'm thankful for Ms. Uh, Tracy for being here today at uh, this uh, discussion and all the other ambassadors sitting in the hall here. I would like to emphasize that the beginning and the end of our panel are represented by civil society organizations, and they are together with us in this hall. And I'm glad for this opportunity to discuss uh, with uh, such a uh, company, with uh, such uh, stuff, and uh, speak about democracy. And by this, we can say that democracy has a future in Armenia and it will not uh, be left uh, neglected.
affected. I would like to say that we need uh, each other's support and assistance. Even the foreign uh, ambassadors in Armenia are targeted and exposed to verbal uh, insults and and uh, I'm not even speaking about the officials who have to be, uh, who, who deserve criticism, but the officials are uh, targeted uh, twice, uh, as everyone, the passers-by, uh, who might not be to the taste of certain groups of people who use democracy to attack democracy. This doesn't justify uh, the, the ministers, the police, the judges, and uh, or any other officials when uh, they make omissions or violations. I just want to say uh, that all the people who, who are who have gathered here for democracy, they should support each other and give each other power, empower each other to undergo uh, and uh, to differentiate between the real journalist from a diversionist who is uh, holding a microphone, to di differentiate between uh, the real judge from a corrupted judge, uh, a public uh, uh, organization from uh, uh, paid political uh, defenders of some political parties. And this is not the topic of today's e uh, discussion. I was given another question, but since I have uh, very um, little, uh, few opportunities uh, to speak about politics, and I'm uh, spoke, uh, speaking about my professional issues, I took the opportunity uh, to speak about what was uh, has uh, accumulated uh, through uh, months or even years. And I would like to highlight that I'm proud that I'm sitting here in the panel together with Ms. Harutunyan, who is the head of uh, Corruption Prevention Committee. And uh, I'm glad that there is such an institute uh, which has been proving on daily basis that we are able to establish a uh, crucial institution. I, today I was informed that the, uh, this commission has uh, re sent me secret uh, documents about several uh, judges. I, I don't want to uh, voice their names. I'm, I I hope I will not be uh, held accountable for uh, voicing this information. But this is another example of how we are trying to fight for democracy and for the dreams that we have, uh, that the Prime Minister talked about today. I would like to highlight another factor uh, that today a new Deputy Minister of Justice, um, Deputy Minister was appointed, and uh, again, we're woman. And uh, the, we have two powerful women. And when uh, the ambassador Tracy spoke about the uh, role of the women, I would like to highlight that today, uh, during my um, uh, rule, four um, women deputy ministers were appointed who are the most powerful representatives of our government. And I'm glad to welcome another powerful representative in our team. And uh, I used a lot of my time. And coming back to the topic, I would say the following. There, whether there will be vetting or not, the question of this answer was given during recent months. There was a, a vetting, there has been vetting, and it has been ongoing, but it is not the vetting that our political and public officials have been talking about. Uh, for that vetting, we need constitutional reforms. And today, the two uh, member council members of the Constitutional Court are sitting here, and they will not hide that this is another important issue on our agenda. Um, and at the same time, we understand, and which was highlighted by the Ambassador Tracy, we cannot uh, empty the judiciary system in one day and not have a judiciary collapse. And uh, the work that has been uh, ongoing now for the accountability of judges, uh, I think, is the one of the most important and efficient and serious steps of which the society is uh, not really informed. And I would like to 
used the following uh, few minutes to speak about it. But before that, again, we have uh, been deal engaged in uh, the increase of number of judges and the uh, improvement of the uh, building and the working conditions and the increase in um, uh, their salaries, and the professional training, and the legislative reforms but, uh, in their favor, but these are not sufficient. For us, as a ministry, as government, the most important, one of the most important steps is the conduct uh, system of uh, uh, disciplinary uh, system of uh, the judges so that we have uh, uh, justice. And it means that every judge must know that there is an objective disciplinary body which is not there represented by their friends in the C Council of Ethics, for example. The this is another body which is objective and initiates disciplinary proceedings. And in the second stage, every uh, judge must know that the Corruption Prevention Commission, the, the Minister of Justice, uh, bring the disciplinary proceedings to the higher, to the Supreme Council, where there will be a fair decision. And for that fair decision, uh, everyone. Uh, or not, um, the uh, amb ambassadors, the NGOs are not sufficient. Here we need uh, the work of the Supreme Council, Judiciary Council, and we call on everyone to uh, follow what is going on in the Supreme Judiciary Council. If uh, a minister has uh, expressed, has misconducted, uh, and then uh, the, the he or she needs to be held accountable. We need uh, to implement this simple mechanism to achieve in a few months substantial reforms and changes in the judiciary system. And uh, the objective uh, criticism of the prime minister, which Mr. Yonisian highlighted and which has been a topic of all my speeches, will be addressed uh, in uh, rapidly, but the 10 uh, honorable people who are sitting in the Supreme Judiciary Council receive uh, 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 and uh, the, uh, the Commission of Corruption Prevention need to know that we are all under your watch, and and we need and we will be held accountable for uh, in terms of public opinion. Uh, not to exploit my time, I will be here, and if there is a need, I will uh, go into details uh, through question and answers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you that uh, in uh, the Armenian society, uh, women play a crucial role, and sometimes they are better professionals than uh, the males. We see it also in our organization, in the Union of Informed Citizens NGO. But of course, uh, we should state that even in the National Assembly and in the executive body, are, uh, women are a uh, minority, unfortunate, and that's an unfortunate thing. After 2018, uh, the fight against corruption is in the focus of attention of the Armenian public. However, we must state with regret that the public is more interested in disclosing individuals involved in corruption rather than in the systemic fight against corruption. Nevertheless, during this year, significant institutional changes have taken place. The, and they have been also mentioned by you, Mr. Andreasian, and Ms. Lynn Tracy also mentioned it. And uh, the, uh, the pros and cons of these reforms have not received due public attention. Perhaps the most successful of these changes is the institutionalization of prevention of corruption through uh, the Corruption Prevention Commission headed by Hayakuhi Harutunyan, who has honored us with her presence today. Ms. Harutunyan, could you kindly present the institutional uh, changes that shall ensure the 
systematization and irreversibility of the fight against corruption. So the process, I mean that the process that has been started should, no, should not turn in any of the scenarios. Taking taking the opportunity to speak, I would like to thank the Armenian Democracy Forum uh, for making me a part of this because uh, the, the for the rule of uh, as a um, uh, advocate of a rule, a rule of law, it is an honor for me to be here, but it is more uh, uh, responsible for me to be here to represent as a public official and to convince that in the, in the Republic of Armenia, the democratization is uh, uh, on tr uh, well-established tracks and in everyday uh, work that I have, I see a system that is being established uh, uh, continually and uh, the officials are accountable and on the part of decision making, uh, the conflict of interest, in terms of conflict of interest, there are uh, efficient mechanism to exclude them and which is more important, the uh, state uh, system is on high levels of responsibility and I am also a beneficiary of the American uh, uh, programs because I had the opportunity to participate in one of the programs of, uh, provided by uh, USA and I have the opportunity to localize my knowledge in the uh, government system in Armenia and uh, the prevention of corruption is different from the fight against corruption uh, in terms of uh, criminal uh, punishment as uh, a body uh, against prevention of corruption our duty is to instill uh, long standing mechanisms against a uh, feist of corruption which will uh, rule out uh, corruption both on individual and institutional levels uh, the commission which was established in 2019 has a bro quite broad mandate and uh, until uh, May of 2020, let me uh, introduce uh, the achievements that are, are at least the, the most important for me. We spoke about the uh, state administration system, uh, one about the judiciary system, and from this regard, I am, I agree and. Um, I want to thank Mr. Andreasen for warm words and I have to highlight that uh, in terms of uh, judiciary reforms, uh, the Commission has a big role and in order to exercise it, we uh, and we have already two achievements of this uh, of exercise of this power. It has been already second year where uh, the uh, the conduct of uh, appointment uh, of uh, judiciary members uh, have been in place. We have checked the conduct of uh, judges uh, and we have highlighted the importance of the appointment of new judges and m uh, during the checks of conduct, the Pre Prevention Commission has guarantees and uh, presents conclusions regarding any corruption risk or any uh, type of interaction uh, which was done in the past in order to give valid uh, data, in order to be able to exclude the, any um, uh, decision making through such mechanisms and uh, to praise ourselves and the state administration we need to say that the tens tendencies uh, are m mainly uh, 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 the tendencies of excluding people in appointment uh, have been decreasing uh, the evidence 
are uh, more are strong and the prevention body can evaluate uh, the risks uh, so that uh, no corruption risks uh, evade into the system. Of course, about, I'm speaking about the positive tendency, and I will not. But I will not be able to uh, state for sure that we have already excluded uh, decision making by any public officials, which might exploit uh, the public position. But uh, I would like to take advantage of the. Uh, speeches of the previous speakers that democracy is a process which is a hard and um, difficult endeavor and in, in the personal level it is about uh, consistency and um, a conviction that it succeeds. Uh, and in terms of institutional reforms, I can say that uh, as a collegial um, body, uh, 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 the scheme of making decisions has given us the guarantee that all inside there are already checks and balances inside the system so that uh, the decision of uh, made by one person are excluded in, at least in inside our institution and this is the guarantee that makes me more to feel more uh, safer and um, uh, when there are when there are attempts by other public officials to discard our decisions. It is also crucial, the, uh, the, which is another part of the judiciary system, to prevent the risks in the judiciary system while uh, the appointment of judges, uh, the uh, we have uh, also uh, presented conclusions regarding the investigative uh, bodies, and uh, here uh, I will reveal a small secret like Mr. Andreasian, uh, that uh, not only separate individual people were not appointed based on um, conduct uh, basis, but also there were uh, false uh, information presented or tax evasion uh, that was present in their conduct. And in uh, the terms of long-term investment, uh, this I can convince the public that these uh, steps are ongoing, but these are not the only ones. At the individual level, I think that the, the most important uh, system mechanism is has been already working in Armenia, but it it will be well established, which is the declaration of public officials, the mechanism of declaration. Again, my colleagues will complain about the technical issues of that mechanism, but at the individual level, uh, at least for the time being, in the, Ar the Republic of Armenia, not only in the Republic of Armenia, but also in the regions, uh, in the other countries of the regions, we have the declarations of uh, uh, incomes and properties, which is the most uh, comprehensive one. And uh, it records the dynamics and change in the pro properties uh, of uh, the public officials. And in order to avoid the human factor and uh, to avoid we have initiated, we have launched a new electronic system, and starting from 2023, the new technologies will be integrated, which is again first in the region, uh, as where at least 9,000 public officials and also at least 35,000 Armenian citizens who are members of the families of public officials will present their incomes, profits, uh, property, and the system will be automatized uh, to uh, reveal the risks and the tendencies by which the public officials uh, have ever tried or have uh, actually um, procured, acquired a property or 
they have made a decision which are uh, evident that have created conflict of interests. In this regard, I think that it, we can state that the Commission has a clear disposition that the business uh, activity is incompatible with the with the post. Uh, so we have made uh, several decisions, we, one of which is related to the uh, Speaker of the National Assembly and the, and the announcement was made that uh, the business cannot be compatible with uh, public uh, withholding a public post. So this is uh, important that in another important achievement for the Commission is that uh, the proper environment has been established not only in the system of state administration but in general the, uh, an environment was established where a citizen can be can feel safe from corruption and uh, refuse it and as a mechanism, the, uh, the Commission has is elaborated, has developed, and we're speaking, we're waiting for the formal part uh, of, of the uh, uh, rules of conduct of public officials. This excludes the conflict of interests, other restrictions, uh, which are based on the human rights principle. Uh, excluding uh, the discrimination by public officials, any other expression, any other treatment uh, in terms of, uh, of be it verbal or physical uh, or, or any uh, treatment that will form such a perception uh, regarding a citizen or a colleague. And for implementing this uh, uh, system. We have carried out some works with the ministry, and in the future, we will have not only a reporting system for the criminal cases, but also for the administrative cases. And um, the omissions in the administrative system will be revealed without restrictions, without reservations, uh, in uh, and to, uh, to ensure accountability in the uh, official bodies. Of course, I selected the limited number of achievements which we have re recorded, uh, but I can ensure, assure that these are the important systematic uh, uh, mechanisms that are in place in the whole uh, public administration system and we will uh, e present to the public the what principles have been uh, have to be there and how they will be exercised in order to uh, prevent corruption and bring uh, become a, so, to make the corruption uh, controllable and uh, to give us an opportunity to speak in the future about the decrease of number of corruption cases and to exclude the corruption expression of corruptions in the system. I would like to thank my colleagues, members of the commission and all the staff. Uh, despite uh, this investment, uh, in, we are facing with the challenges in institutional terms and uh, which were we, were we were able to overcome them by the assistance of our international co partners. We have uh, the support Support of uh, USA. We uh, are waiting for the European Union support and we are waiting for the twinning project in the future, which, are, which, which deals with the education uh, sector. And here we have in depth approaches. Oh, as we spoke about the electoral processes, we 
uh, in the scope of the mandate of the Commission, we have um, enlargement, extension, and the uh, legislative change has been signed that the uh, financing of the parties uh, have to be uh, superv uh, supervised, controlled, and uh, the annual uh, reports have to be checked uh, the, through the political to in order to exclude uh, corruption cases in the political processes. Uh, these mechanisms are applied for the first time in Armenia, but we hope that they will become institutional anchors of, as uh, the Prime Minister said, of which we will be uh, proud and we will be able to share our experience with other countries. Thank you for the opportunity once again. Thank you, Ms. Arutunyan. You know, perhaps uh, uh, with no intention to underestimate the depth and scope of other reforms, we must state that uh, the major structural uh, changes are envisaged by police reforms. For example, the establishment of a Ministry of Internal Affairs from the scratch or the creation of a uh, of, of uh, National Guard based on new principles within the demil demilitarization of police forces. But in contrast to the, these changes, we already have a new petrol service. It has been already a year. It is based on new principles and new values, and the officers have been recruited based on whole new procedures and have und undergone a completely updated training. Today we are honored to have the head of the patrol service, Colonel uh, Arthur Mushatian. Mr. Kun Colonel, the public sees many fruits of the work of the patrol service, but as a person with experience uh, working in different systems, can you present a profound changes in the pet patrol service and the differences that may not be obvious at first glance for the society. Uh, thank you. First of all, allow me to thank uh, you to, for involving me in this um, event. As for the patrol service, uh, and it's uh, testing. So from the very beginning, I have to mention that uh, we have had both uh, very serious resistance from the very point of the la launching it. But we have also had a great team uh, by our side on behalf uh, of our uh, of people inside the system and also the representatives of the civil society and uh, international uh, partners who have provided immense uh, support and uh, motivation and I particularly would like to mention the Embassy of the United States uh, Miss uh, Ambassador thank you for that uh, invaluable uh, assistance and I would also like to uh, mention and thank the Ministry of Justice for assisting us uh, in the process for 24 hours a day. Why am I mentioning it? Because uh, the launch of the patrol service uh, and its introduction, you mentioned it uh, rightfully that it has its visible sides and not very visible sides. And the invisible side is more difficult. And in this regard, I would like to uh, mention what has happened. Yes, I would like to mention what has happened. 
there is a service uh, that is well equipped and it allows to carry out functions uh, in a more efficient way and it allows the citizen uh, uh, to be less disturbed during these functions. And this allow, because it's a restricting service to some extent, that process should be organized in a way that uh, the citizen and uh, different circles of the society do not feel this disruption. Uh, that's the visible side. And that's what we see in the street. That's what we see in the yards. Uh, that's what we see in Chirac and Lori provinces. So the main essence of the issue is well, here we can also, as you mentioned, Mr. Ioannisian, uh, we can actually make a distinction. For instance, uh, the uh, psychosocial changes uh, that is, and the creation of the new image of uh, the patrol serviceman. Uh, it's not only about these nice words that we are using. It's, I'll just bring a very... Uh, a vivid example. What is a psychosocially reformed police officers? For years, uh, the police system, in any police system or any law enforcement system, there were certain standards uh, that, for instance, young people or a young woman shall undergo certain educational process. For instance, uh, graduate from an X university, and then based on his or her initiative, and why not uh, also through certain mediations, he or she should appear in a certain system, and that practice was in place for years. Uh, but uh, this by saying psychosocial reform, we mean uh, the mechanism of selection of the patrol servicemen. What do I mean by this? See, in the society we're discussing a lot about why uh, higher education is not a mandatory requirement for becoming a patrol serviceman. So it actually brings, it's kind of a social uh, criterion. And we're saying, you, you know, only this layer of society can become a patrol serviceman. And um, but we realize very well that, uh, unfortunately, the cert by ha the having the certificate or diploma of the higher educational institution, many of the, those who have the diploma, they don't even know where these uh, higher education institutions are physically located. And we know have known that for years. And so what happened? We actually removed this social restriction. We tell the person, well, if there is no age uh, restriction, if there is not this age limit, well, you have re uh, received secondary education, you're welcome to our patrol service. You are welcome to take our five-month uh, course, which uh, is in conformity with international standards, and become a patrol serviceman. Don't become a professional lawyer. Don't become a professional uh, construction uh, employee. Just become a police officer. Study to become a police officer, because for years we did not have uh, the specialty for a police officer. Wait, we didn't have it for years, and it's a deep issue. Yes, uh, a person has some higher education diploma. For instance, he is um, involved in the building um, industry, or he is a nuclear physicist. But I'm just talking about the diplomas. <laughs> but he is not a police officer working in the street. And that's why I mentioned this psychosocial aspect. We say to all social layers, please come, take this training for five months, what, uh, training on what you will need for this uh, in the street and become a patrol serviceman. And that initial pressure that you know they don't have higher education and that's why they are not able to uh, control the traffic. Uh, so these conversations are left behind. They are not present, uh, almost not present anymore. And this kind of uh, talks, they come both from into Internally, both externally, both from the side. 
and in this respect we have that approach uh, and there is another second very important aspect about we talk a lot about integrity we repeat this word integrity so much and yes uh, 24 uh, on uh, the in the regime of 24 7 we have it as a priority but there is one issue if uh, during the Soviet so what did we have that came from the Soviet period in all the law enforcement agencies irrespective of their functions there was there certain standards and the subject had to be pressurized till the end oppressed till the end and then go to make a to implement the service so they sh they should have been put put into a certain framework uh, oppressed and then come out to the street and uh, interact with the citizen while smiling that will not never happen because that person was uh, already Yes, uh, standing in line you know, when the supervisor says you have to stand for four hours and they have to stand for four hours. So after this oppression, the police officer couldn't just uh, do a good job and smile at the citizen, and it wasn't the case. And I'm just talking about episodes, but all these episodes lead to these uh, deep-rooted issues. So what do we do now in this regard? We are uh, leaving them free in our instructions. We have changed the f our form of instructions completely. I will bring an ordinary example. There should be a f an honest environment between the supervisor and the subject. Yes, the subordination is a good thing. Discipline is a good thing. But uh, I myself uh, have I have been have had an experience of more than 20 years, and I can uh, clearly uh, I clearly know the psychology of the p person, like what the subject can think when they uh, like if if they stand under the sun for years, what thoughts they might have. Uh, so we should help create an environment, and we're now creating an environment to ensure that the patrol servicemen feel like individuals, and. and we don't want to oppress them, pressurize them, and then send them for service. But we should just explain them in a very calm environment what they have to do, what functions they have. Because uh, I'm not reinventing a bicycle here. I'm actually advocate. I'm an also an advocate of those ideas. But uh, why am I saying that also? Because the international best practice also points to that, that the countries that have the best uh, uh, police services to uh, the United States, the European countries, this practice has been applied and it has had its po uh, fruits and this, its positive fruits. So Mr. Ionisian, as for the second part of your question, it's again invisible part of the question, but it's very important. And I'm talking about integrity, yes, here. Integrity is something that uh, allows us to be achieved uh, in the course of service. But if uh, a serviceman is under pressure, there cannot be integrity. And hence, uh, we uh, have adopted the, the, the aforementioned approaches. Uh, I don't want to talk too long, but what I, um, because uh, CSOs are also here, I want to tell you one thing that is obvious, uh, that the involvement of the civil society, uh, the transparency, can only yield uh, positive results uh, f for each reform. It's, uh, um, it might be my subjective opinion, my, some people may not agree with me, but that's what I think and I have been convinced in that uh, on numerous occasions. Uh, well, the patrol service is still new, it's still young, of course, you will, but those who are involved in the patrol service uh, reform, they know very well what it means. Well, having a new service for one year, thank you so much, thank you for organizing this event. 
Uh, thank you to our partners for their support, uh, both the Ministry of Justice and the U.S. Embassy, and all our supporting organizations and states. Uh, and I would like to ask you once again to be involved in this reform more, even more intensively, because this uh, reform is still under establishment. We're not doing it for ourselves. We're uh, create. We're going to uh, want, uh, create a foundational basis for our uh, future generations. And I always tell that to my subjects as well. Dear officers, you uh, are not going to have any positive aspects for you apart from the emotional uh, satisfaction. You're not going to have cal uh, to be quiet and calm because we're not living in the times, I mean, in calm times. Uh, we are going to build the foundation, which is a difficult endeavor on which our new generations will uh, work. Uh, and I hope, I'm sure we will succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Murshatian, and I would also like to thank you for your warm words. Uh, and, well, the most important component of democracy is the presence of good electoral and party systems. This realization is not new. The first reform launched after the 2018 revolution. Uh, the revolution had even had not even formally changed and uh, the, when the electoral reform was uh, launched and your humble servant also participated in its coordination. However, uh, the reform failed at the parliament at that time, and it was finally adopted uh, only in 2021. Uh, it was adopted by the parliament, and uh, in 2020, the package of the law on parties was adopted, which made a, a lot of conceptual changes, at, at least at the legislative level. Uh, so today we have with us uh, a person uh, who has had a major investment in these reforms, Vardine Grigorian from the Helsinki Citizens Assembly Vanadzor office. Uh, Ms. Grigorian, uh, can we consider that uh, the reform of the electoral and party systems has been a success and has been completed, or is there still work to be done? Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, please allow me to thank uh, uh, everyone, and especially I uh, would like to mention uh, Ms. Tr uh, Ambassador Tracy's and Victor Ambassador Victorine's investments in this reform. And um, they have actually also, they also bear the responsibility and even the burden of uh, this criticism by anti-democratic forces. And I think that uh, this speaks to their real authentic investment and the proper path that we have taken in this process. And this process should be continued and it should be completed. The reform process should be as uh, structural as uh, possible. And your investment personally and on the institutional level uh, it is very it is of crucial importance the electoral reform can never end because uh, Technically, it's an endless uh, process, uh, and politically also, this change, a lot of changes take place, which should be reflected in the legislation. And maybe it was, it's good that these amendments did not take place in 2018 because they were quite spontaneous. And although the package was generally ready, it was obvious back then that uh, we didn't have uh, that the threats to elections that we had, for instance, in the year 2021, everything was clear and the uh, revolution result was to be consolidated. But uh, later we had the time uh, 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 to improve it, and this and um, Mazas Panielian was uh, actually coordinating this process, and it allowed us to approach the electoral processes in a very structural way. And
and the law on parties, I think it was the most successful endeavor uh, because it created the conditions in which uh, if parties wanted, uh, they, they can actually have a proper activity within the framework of this legislation. And the parties uh, were not very interested in the content of these reforms, unfortunately, back then. And they didn't see the role of the parties in the electoral processes outside of the level of uh, parliamentary elections. And this actually, and when we talk about elect electoral reform, it uh, turns out that there was a distinction between uh, local elections and other electoral processes. And in case of uh, local elections, we were seeing very segmented, fragmentary amendments. In 2020, there was a package and that there was a provision which was anti-constitutional because it was uh, mentioning that if you do not participate in two proportional elections, the uh, activity of the party is terminated. It means, for instance, if, two, uh, if the party does not participate in two local elections, then uh, their activity will be terminated. And that would actually allow to terminate the activity of the more than 100 uh, parties. But we do not need such opportunities in the 21st century. We should actually promote participation of the uh, parties and not punish them. And so I am really very happy that I'm the last one to talk here because we have, as a, as a civil society, we have our demands from all the parties here. And I would like to go one by one, yes? from the Ministry of Justice, we have uh, the demand for finalizing the reforms to the extent possible, taking into account the numerous elections in 2021 and the issues that came up during those elections. I think that here uh, the liability, uh, the improvement of liability mechanisms is of crucial importance. For instance, uh, in, we had an, one endeavor in parallel to a law on parties. It was about uh, liability for certain financial issues, for instance, payments to this uh, pre-election uh, fund and uh, ways to bypass the restrictions. So these are very well uh, formulated uh, in the codes. However, they are uh, worse re represented in the electoral code. And I think another issue was uh, that there was unjustified fear for having more regulations regulations in mechanisms that uh, simply do not support democracy but uh, actually hinder uh, and also hinder the usurpation of uh, power and uh, in terms of perception of the reform and also uh, the full we have an issue with full perception of, of in reform and integrity and in our further amendments of the electoral reform, it, it will allow us to, pro, uh, to sh uh, sh show proper prospects for a reform, especially on the local elections level. Uh, of course, we had unprecedented level in the, the local elections. Uh, however, there were certain uh, non-structural uh, approaches. There were certain issues which need to be addressed. and our or MPs know about it. I will not talk about the details. But I think it's unacceptable when the approach is not structural, but indivi individual, uh, on an individual level. Uh, about the Corruption Prevention Commission, of course, uh, this uh, uh, oversight over pre-election funds is very important. It, uh, it will uh, be added also to the um, uh, fin uh, oversight over financing of the political parties. And the holistic approach is very important in this regard. And the suggestions that have been provided by our international partners were as follows. Um, the political financing should be from one source, from, from one path and totally controlled. We have fragmentary oversight towards it. Uh, we have pol political party funds, uh, pre-election funds. So it's very fragmented and the oversight is not complete. If this were united under one umbrella and the political financing was under a uh, 
better working loop, then we would have a more uh, trustworthy uh, democracy and we would be sure that the political uh, forces uh, that uh, go run in the elections ensure that they really pr represent the, uh, the voters, that their financing comes from the citizen of the Republic of Armenia. They don't uh, have illegal funds and they are not using the political uh, of platform for advancing their personal interests. There's a lot to do in this uh, regard, and I think that um, we should also uh, prepare the candidates of political parties for the criteria of integrity that we want to see in the Republic of Armenia. As for the police reform, of course, I would like to first of all thank uh, them for more efficient involvement in the in electoral process. Uh, I think that we still will have a lot to do in this regard, but we do see uh, mostly a lot of wi willingness and participation, which was absent before. Uh, previously, we also were because we were also involved in observation missions. We were actually used to s seeing inability uh, in, in um, see them not functioning, because very often we had to uh, approach them and say you have to do something. They were very passive, and I uh, hope that it's going to be a priority in the future as well and the general perception of the electoral reform, uh, process and uh, the realization that their involvement is crucial is very important. And me, me, what Mr. Mushatian mentioned about the police officers, I think that's about the perception of dignity, that the person has to feel uh, dignified. Um, and uh, his dignity should not be overwhelmed. And this feeling of uh, dignity is very important. What has been recovered in the Republic of Armenia uh, after the revolution was this uh, dignity of being a citizen. For, m for me personally, that was the most important thing. And that's how we should approach the electoral legislation. And the electoral legislation should also approach the, both the, uh, uh, the voter and uh, the candidate from this point of view. Uh, it we shouldn't just have quotas. It should be meaningful involvement uh, by political parties. It means, for instance, persons with disabilities or uh, persons who have special needs in voting, they have to have the dignified opportunity for doing that. It's not a dignified opportunity when people just uh, g uh, help, when four people allow, uh, take the person to the voting booth. It's not a dignified way of voting. A person should be able to do it individually. Uh, with certain uh, equipment and means. A person has to know who he is going to vote for, uh, what candidates there are. This should be the and uh, we should also uh, ensure that the uh, pre uh, PEC members are trained. They feel the responsibility towards the citizen. They have respect towards the voters and uh, the observers. Uh, before we actually uh, had the expectation that the observation uh, missions have the burden of uh, uh, ensuring the legitimacy of elections, I think I think it's now the time to, uh, to uh, also re record the reforms uh, that uh, are the result of the electoral legislation reform. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Gregorian. And I have to state with regret that we are actually behind our agenda uh, a lot. And I suggest uh, that we just gather one round of short questions from uh, the hall so, and so that we can finish it in five, seven minutes. I, I see Navart's hand. Can we provide a microphone for our uh, audience? Now, now we can hear you. 
My question is addressed to Mr. Uh, Andreas Anaim Novart from Socioscope NGO. In, on May 17, the European Court of Human Rights made a decision, Oganesova uh, via versus Armenia case, and they stipulated that Oganesova's um, right for non-discrimination uh, based on sexual orientation has been violated. And uh, you were a human rights defender, uh, and you actually talked about this comprehensive legislation, uh, need for comprehensive legislation in this regard. As a Minister of Justice, what are you doing in that regard about uh, the discrimination issue? What, uh, where we are about in the law on e equality before the law? Uh, thank you very much. Next uh, question uh, will be addressed by Mr. Sisak Gabrielian. And also, I also see Mr. Varujan Hoktanyan's hand there. Thank you. Uh, because uh, we are uh, approaching the deadline for declarations. Uh, maybe I, it will be a more of a proposal. Of course, I, s I receive my salary from the state budget, and I'm, I don't mind de declaring my expenses and income. For instance, we are now declaring uh, our uh, expenses that we did, for instance, last May, last June. I would like to uh, uh, discuss this issue. Uh, I'm now actually repairing the roof of my house because I, I want to have the opportunity to uh, provide these expenses in the website right now because last, next year I may not remember what, uh, how, what expenses I had. And uh, next question will be addressed by Mr. Hoktanyan and also uh, Ambassador Andrea Victorin. Uh, to say that the United States and the European Union are in the police reform. So you have quite, no, I have to mention it, yeah, sorry, uh, because we are now just doing the procurement for the new police cars. Um, and uh, I still have, I know as the minister knows because I mention it regularly, I think you should uh, reconsider the law. Um, because the police cars with these blinking lights is something you will not find in our countries. You find it whenever there is an emergency. But a normal po police car driving through the city, and then you always use these megaphones. I would also, sorry that I say so, advise to reduce it a little bit because nobody understands what is said. and. Uh, and uh, it is a question how it is perceived by the citizens. So, uh, no question, just a comment. Before, before Varujan Oktanyan, I should say yes, uh, the procurement process of European Union, by the European Union is very important. And uh, uh, technical requirements or the generation of technical requirements for the cars was very inclusive. We attended it. Uh, thank you. My name is Varjan Hoktanyan from, from Transparency International Anti-Corruption Center. I would actually give this question to the, all of uh, the panel uh, speakers, but I would maybe ask it specifically to Ms. Saritunyan. Uh, of course, um, a lot of interesting and g a good image was presented here, but actually everything is decided by implementation. So those regulations are uh, on a quite a high level. You cannot even uh, compare it with what we had before. But how is it uh, brought to life? Uh, are there any issues in the implementation, and which are they? I could actually address my questions to all of the speakers, but maybe because of a uh, lack of time, I will just uh, address this question to Ms. Arutsunyan. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ogdanyan. Uh, let's try uh, to answer the questions in two minutes, if possible, because we're very short of time. And Mr. Andreasian will respond to the first question. 
Well, with Mr. Anisan, we had uh, agreed that I have uh, to go in five minutes. It's very interesting questions, and I would be happy to address them. I will just answer the question addressed to me, and then I will have to leave. I apologize for that. I would like to particularly mention that, yes, it was rightfully mentioned that uh, we initiated the legislation about the uh, equality before the law uh, uh, aspect, and I'm happy happy that uh, Ms. Krikorian is also here, and she was Deputy Minister of Justice uh, before she became Human Rights Defender. And it's a, of course, it's, I regret that uh, this initiative was not implemented uh, by the, uh, the Human Rights Defender that uh, before, that was there before uh, Ms. Grigorian, and Ms. Grigorian had a major contribution in this uh, works, and we actually did collaborate, we will, will collaborate with the Ombudsman's office and uh, create the uh, equal and uh, equal Armenia for everyone. Th sorry, I'm going to have to leave you now. Thank you, Mr. Andresian. Uh, Miss Ambassador, if you w would like to respond, to, respond to the questions, I'll just make a, a reaction to the the point about being able to continue to fulfill the responsibilities of declaration. You know, this is in the U.S. system, uh, especially at the the senior levels of government, where people have. Uh, greater authorities and decision-making powers. Um, we are also required every year, I think this is the same, I see my colleagues nodding their heads. You have to discipline yourself. You have to start making sure that you are saving the, the details of real estate transactions, of, of income streams that might be coming from outside of government. These are all a part of the responsibilities that come um, and, but I think that what Armenia is doing that is very important and we need to continue to help through assistance is the training and, um, and, and exposure to um, the ways of building a culture and system of, of integrity and in government service. Uh, and it takes time. It takes time, but it takes commitment and discipline from those who are in public service. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, Thank you for uh, the proposal and the question. As for the proposal, it is very clear. We already have an agreement with the Ministry of Justice. Uh, it's going to take place on uh, using this occasion. Uh, uh, we are actually going to introduce the new system of declaration on May 24. And uh, in, since 2023, the, all the data will be all, uh, gathered automatically by 2023. So. As for the filling in the information, at least 70% of the burden will be reduced. And structurally, it was actually the, uh, well, we did actually make, we did have, for instance, a motorcycle, and we were uh, trying to uh, move uh, furniture from the living room, yes? So that's, I just want to bring an example. So actually all the stakeholders can join us in this uh, endeavor. We are open to uh, new suggestions and we are now uh, establishing a whole new uh, uh, digital system. As for Mr. Hoktanyan's uh, question, of course, uh, yes, uh, I'm aware of the issues. I will, of course, we have a number of uh, issues as a new institution. Well, well, in terms of its aspirations and missions, yes, they are, the, aspira the, the bar is high, but the resources and the legislative regulations are not sufficient. I will bring a, a simple example. The Commission is the only, uh, uh, it provides uh, conclusions on declarations and uh, makes decisions. The staff is not selected uh, based on the experience and relevance the experience and education and the requirements that are there doesn't do not allow us to uh, 
hire a person who is, does not conform to it, but can be trained to conform to it. And um, I will also use this occasion to say that uh, in the previous, uh, compared to two uh, previous two years, the budget of the Commission uh, has already been almost approved, and we will have the opportunity to solve the same systemic uh, issues. Uh, this Institute of providing gifts, cor corruption risks, etc. But the most significant. Um, issue that we face is this capacity building, lack of knowledge and lack of capacities. It's uh, very difficult to hire people who will be able uh, to be paid the salaries of public service and do the job that has uh, that requires high qualifications. As for the operational independence, I think that we, uh, we can say that we are surviving at this moment, but it's not development, it's just survival. And using the occasion, I would we have also uh, proposed and we will consistently follow the uh, so that the, the establishment of the commission is stipulated in the constitution and so that uh, the majority of the MPs do not have the opportunity to make changes based on their uh, um, personal interests. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Artsunyan. I would like to add that uh, when we were discussing the uh, constitutional reforms, whether they should be addressed today or not, we realized that unfortunately w there, there not enough substance is still generated on the constitutional reform. The reform process has started, but uh, we ha it's not reflected here. Mr. Mushatian, please. Honorable. Ms. Victorin, please consider this an om omission of my speech. I thank you, uh, of obviously, without any restriction, without any reservation. Thank you deeply, and I'm sorry for my omission. And uh, next, with regard to the blinkers, I would like to say that this issue has been raised several times, many times, and no legislative regulation has been put in place uh, so far. We have uh, an order and instruction of the uh, head of police, and uh, there is a proposal by me uh, that during the daytime uh, the, to turn off the blinkers. I think there will be. I, I think we will achieve it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mwashatian. And uh, this idea has been uh, proposed by us. We also back, back that idea to uh, use uh, the blinkers only in the pro appropriate uh, cases. Mr. Ioannisian, please give a voice to the media as well. For 1 a.m., Kohara Rapetan, I address my speech to Ms. Ambassador. We have seen that during this uh, process uh, of uh, democratization reforms, uh, which we have been uh, discussing uh, the democracy, but the opposition has been uh, voicing calls uh, that there should be no uh, Arme uh, Armenia with no Tracy. I would like to thank you for your recent um, announcements uh, that the U.S. is committed to the uh, to preserving democracy in Armenia because uh, in in all the world uh, we can state that uh, democracy is the uh, guarantee guarantor of the security security in Armenia and I uh, the, I would like to thank you for your announcements thank you I would like to state with regret that the media were not invited to this event and miss Hara and you were uh, invited as a beneficiary of this program and in this regard, I would like to apologize uh, because 
but this was an there were there are other opportunities uh, to address questions to the uh, um, ambassador and if you see any need to uh, uh, answer please Yes, hard to let Yes, Barzapes make no ban to Yes. Uh, um, to respond, other than to say that uh, we um, fully support um, uh, an independent uh, media and its role in democracy. Uh, so I'm glad to see you here today. Um, but I think, as we're noting. Um, across the board, we see progress in democracy and we see room for improvement. And I think the point is that the room for improvement and the direction that I, that I assess Armenia to be pointing in is a very positive direction overall. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, dear colleagues. Although the panel was supposed to last longer, but uh, however, let us have a break for 15 minutes and come back at uh, 2.40. So I guess everyone is inside and we can start. English speaking, I will also be moderating the, the panel in English. Uh, so, dear excellencies, honorable guests, friends and colleagues, uh, good afternoon. As most of you know, I'm Andranik Shinyan. I'm the project coordinator of Freedom House in Armenia. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. And this is a real on honor for us at Freedom House uh, to be hosting and convening uh, the first Armenian Forum for Democracy and for me to be moderating this panel discussion uh, with such distinguished uh, guests and speakers. Um, Delighted to see so many people in the audience who for years have tirelessly advocated for democracy and human rights uh, in Armenia under targeting and attacks, physical and verbal violence, which continues to this day. And I'm glad to see you attend this discussion on the condition of democracy, the perilous situation of human rights. And I want to take this moment to, to applaud all the tireless efforts of the civil society that has been working in Armenia that made this discussion possible. So let's, let's applaud to all of us who are here. Uh, so it is obvious that the Velvet Revolution in Armenia, the second Nagorno-Karabakh war, uh, and the things that are happening around the world have uh, majorly changed the context of human rights and the dimension of human rights agenda that I'm sure our panelists will address. I and surely everyone here remembers the spring of 2018 and the slogan of the Armenian Velvet Revolution, which was uh, Velvet Revolution of Love and, uh, love and Unity, uh, Velvet Revolution of uh, Love and Solidarity, and our aim when we decided to organize this, this forum was to revive this notion, at least among those of us who have shared belief in humanity and the human dimension of the issues concerning the Armenian state. We wish to deepen our understanding of the meaning of these notions and also contribute to the understanding of what is going on and how do we know what is going on in such a polarized and politicized environment. Uh, I know that most of our colleagues that are here are discouraged by the continuous attacks and di di directed and targeted hatred against democracy and human rights activists. So before starting this discussion, I want to remind all of us of the love and solidarity that we have been talking about since the Velvet Revolution in the country that I feel that our nation is turning away from. And I specifically want to speak from a speak of love to emphasize the dangers of the movements of violence and hatred and call to act and speak from a place of love. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining the panel discussion. So uh, our first speaker is uh, Andrea Victorin. I know most of us are, most of us know Ms. Uh, Ms. Victorin, the head of the EU delegation to Armenia. Uh, first time that I met Ms. Victorin was uh, back in 2018 uh, in uh, Vosso, in Natoli campus. We were sitting together at the 
uh, same panel discussion and Ms. Ambassador was back then the head of the EU delegation to Belarus and I was participating at the panel discussion as the young representative from Armenia who participated at the Velvet Revolution and who, was, who has been active so far uh, in all of the movements in Armenia. So I would like to listen to Ms. Victorin's remarks regarding democracy and the dynamic that she's seeing in, in Armenia. Uh, so please, Ms. Victorin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I still remember <laughs> our meeting in Atolin uh, when I, I, I knew that I could come to Armenia, but the process was not yet started. So uh, um, uh, there was somebody who asked me at that time, but before you have the agreement, uh, naturally you are not talking about anything. So, and I'm happy to be, to be here again. Um, per, for, uh, for those who don't know a little bit my history, I have to say that I was here German ambassador between 2007 and 2009. So if you ask me how ev I evaluate the situation, for me always, and it is still now in my memory, um, is the 1st of March 2008. And the shock that went through the Armenian uh, society uh, with this big demonstration after we had really urged um, the authorities not to end the demonstration. And on the morning, early morning of the 1st of March, uh, the tents on the Freedom Square were cleared, and then we had a big demonstration and 10 casualties. And still, the investigation on these uh, incidents are not yet finalized, and there is no clear outcome. Um, and this uh, is a little bit also um, my perspective of civil society here. At that time, it was really difficult for human rights defenders to stand up, to defend the right of vulnerable groups, to defend people um, who are in need. Um, they were targeted, they were uh, harassed. Um, and it was also, let's say, the whole judiciary uh, system was not protecting them. Um, when I came back, I really had the impression that a lot of uh, 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 things have developed. Armenia has an ambition, ambitious reform um, program, which naturally uh, demands considerable uh, uh, efforts in administrative, but also in education because it is not enough, that's what I tried to say in my opening speech, it's not enough to change a law, you have to change the mind of people. And uh, that's why I, uh, I'm deeply convinced that tolerance, respect for the opinion of others are fundamental to really develop this democracy. Um, I would say now we have a, we, ha we have a very um, intensive cooperation um, among the main players here. E EU is the biggest donor, so uh, we, we try really to support all the major reform projects, but as I said, for us civil society is a central pillar and we do a lot together with civil society. Also, in order to change the perspective in society, what I think is special here from the international side is that we have an excellent cooperation. Um, EU and uh, United States are closely cooperating. Um, the example we mentioned before is police reform, but I also want to mention um, the importance of the UN office here because the UN are the institution that uh, with the Human Rights Council to uh, stand up. And um, I must say that we have, uh, we have a very good uh, uh, cooperation and we, we, we think in the same direction. And that is very important that, let's say, the major players of the international community are on one line and that we really together try to improve the situation. 
Um, uh, this, this also is valid naturally for all our member states because we have here a Team Europe approach uh, means we bring together the different experience we have also in our member states as be best practices. Um, and there is a big variety. If you want really to stabilize democracy and if you want to support human rights, you need to change the perspective. That's why, for example, I came this morning from a, from a closing event on a twinning project we have on civil um, service reform, um, something which is a game changer. If you, if you change the perspective of civil servants, um, that they are not, let's say, the masters of the game, but that they are responsible uh, to, to uh, support um, the citizens of the country, and that you have to show transparent, clear uh, vision of how you are uh, implementing the policy. I think uh, that is very important, and there we can learn together um, and you can learn from our mistakes, as my, my uh, uh, Estonian colleague said this morning, and this is right. So, um, if we talk about the development, uh, I can only repeat what I said before. Um, democracy is a process. And democracy demands that we never give up and that we continue the process. I see and there I'm very clear, there are people who do not like my perspective. I see considerable progress in Armenia. I see the willingness to really tackle a reform process. However, there are naturally shortcomings. And um, what is needed is, a, let's say, an open debate. Um, what can be done better? And that's why I'm so much relying, and for every step we do, we have consultation with civil society to get their assessment of the situation, and then to include it uh, in our recommendations and, and in our policy. Um, and we have, uh, and right now I see a very polluted situation. I see a situation where I wonder where is the Armenian citizen in it. Um, and there are so many questions and problems which we should tackle together. And again, I repeat, UN sets the basis. That's why this morning I, I, I quoted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, because this is a framework for all of us, I would say. But um, really to go on gender equality, women's rights, there is still room for improvement in this country. Um, and uh, it is very important also to, to um, take up certain difficult issues. Fight against domestic violence. This is not only in Armenia, but to ignore it is the wrong way. So there we have to do something. Non-discrimination, I think, is a principle we have to work on. Um, and um, this means we have to prevent uh, discrimination and uh, stigmatization for vulnerable groups. And there I come again, the LGBTI com I, I, uh, community here, um, they are targeted by certain, uh, by certain groups and this has to be addressed and this has to be named. So um, that's why I think in so many uh, in so many areas we have a very good um, cooperation with the Office of the Human Rights Defender. Why? I think this should be an independent um, institution. It is not, let's say, an agency of a government. This is not the idea. So. Um, you see, when I was here, German ambassador, I had uh, to defend uh, the human rights defender at that time, yeah? Because uh, due to the fact that he wanted to have the investigation on the 1st of March, he was also targeted. So uh, I think, and there we stand together, and this is very important. Um, uh, and it is very important also in such a difficult situation that both from the government side, but also from the civil society, we try to find a comprehensive approach and that we try to work together, not against each other, because then you can make no progress. So um, we all have to learn. 
um, and uh, and there is always a, a room for improvement. Um, what really concerns me now is the level of hate speech in this country. It is, uh, you see, uh, when, when I hear certain comments, when I see certain posts, I'm shocked about the language that is used. And it is even used in, let's say, institutions where I think a certain dignity and a certain code of conduct should be a rule. And I look at Armen. I mean, for example, the National Assembly. Yeah? So I'm really very much in favor of in, in, in introducing a code of conduct. Um, and uh, and uh, you see, it is so easy. Uh, I see that um, whenever you are not happy, you find a person you can target. So it can be, uh, it can be the prime minister, it can be the international community. Um, then it goes on a level where I say, OK, um, do I take this criticism? No, because it is really crossing a red line. The moment somebody comes to me and says, you see, we think you should do more on gender equality, you should defend um, institutions that, the, that are really working for women in need, I will take the point. If you, uh, somebody tells me, um, uh, the title I have, I will not repeat it, but uh, you all know what I mean. I say, okay, I'm, I'm free to respond because I don't, I don't see that this is something where I should consider the criticism. Um, and that's something which I think has a very, very basic importance. Only if we can all together from the side of the international community, from the side of government agency, from the side of civil society, find a decent way to present our arguments and present our interests. It's much easier to say what you do not want or of whom you want to get rid of without any argumentation. It remains an empty word. The moment you have a proposal how to better cope with the situation, how to improve government performance, how to uh, discuss with uh, deputies of the National Assembly, you are forced to formulate what you want. And then you have to check it with reality and the possibilities. So uh, uh, that's why I, I really say uh, what is important is that we listen to each other. Sometimes it's very difficult, no? Yeah. Shouting is easier, but we have to listen to each other and then we should develop, and this I mean really as international community, as uh, UN family, as uh, institutions here in Armenia, see how we can progress. The European Union stands ready. We are active in a lot of reform areas. We are the ones who also take up really regularly human rights because we have every year a human rights dialogue. And again, this process is never done without civil society. Before we start to prepare it, we have consultation with all um, different sectors of civil society to hear their ideas, to hear their concerns. I'm very happy that finally we now have the monitoring platform of civil society who, will, who are the watch. We recommended that the Armenian government took SEPA as a blueprint for the reform process. Again, if you have a pandemic, if you have a war, if you have a traumatized population, it takes time. And uh, it is perhaps good for, for, for once to step back and see what we have achieved and then to discuss how we can continue. Um, because especially in this difficult um, environment now, it is important without any naivety, but it is important to give hope to the people. And in order to give hope to the people, we have really to implement concrete reforms on economic growth, on regional development, on certain key areas of policy which are needed. And again, I say 
um, we do it together. We do it within the UN system because the sustainable development goals, they are really uh, one guideline how we improve and how we develop our cooperation. And there we are together. So, and everybody who has a good idea, whether on environment, uh, promotion of women, um, come and tell us, please, don't insult us, because this doesn't bring us any further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Ambassador for շատ երկար որտեղ եք դուք տեսնում դերակատարում մարդու իրավունքների պաշտպանի եւ այս դժվար թեմաների շուրջ խոսելու վերաբերյալ որտ է դիրքորոշումը այս այն հարցերի շուրջ որոնք հայաստանում են արդեն երկար ժամանակ Thank you, Andranik, and thank you for the uh, invitation. And I am pleased to be a part of this panel and to be a part of this discussion. I will uh, directly answering your question. First of all, the human rights defenders' mandate dictates all the uh, that all the highlighted points that are threats to democracy, that uh, pose risks uh, to the human rights and uh, to the guarantee of those, the, the exercise of those rights are the uh, base of our mandate. And as Ms. Ambassador noted, the Institute of Human Rights Defender has been uh, on high levels of uh, independency in our country, and this uh, is very important guarantee that all the issues that are raised by the human rights defender uh, will have a, a broad uh, um, impact and uh, I think that the democracy is a choice which is followed by daily work uh, which is uh, in irreversible daily work which is aimed at uh, making governance better and accountable and uh, more efficient. And as it was noted, and I am convinced that in the first part of uh, this um, event it has been noted, uh, noted that Armenia has made its choice of democracy. And if uh, we draw comparisons, we will see that we have uh, significant uh, progress recorded, but we still face a lot of challenges and there is no rest in democracy. Uh, challenges are born every day and this is our daily work. Uh, I am sure that my uh, colleagues from the executive body have talked about uh, these issues, but I would like to think uh, to talk about the um, fundamental challenges and issues. I keep can, uh, talking about this um, topic, and I think that the f after the 40-day war, uh, some members of the society, including intellectuals, we're actively questioning our country's choice in favor of democracy and also questioning uh, questioning our if our choice was correct in favor of democracy. And these uh, uh, conversations were ongoing for a long time. And those people were saying uh, whether uh, democracy and protection of human rights and respect um, towards those policies are bringing us in an unstabilized um, uh, situation in uh, the relationships with our neighbors. And sometimes democracy is compared to heavy burden, which hinders our rapid running and uh, leap in, in the marathon of life and death. 
In actually, these uh, conversations are still ongoing, and I think that people bring uh, practical examples, saying that, for example, if we don't use um, um, uh, equal uh, weapons, and we're speaking about uh, the limit restriction of uh, other dis dissenting opinions and total control over the opinions of people. These are these were tools which were used during a war situation, and um, of course we made a small attempt to restrict uh, the opinions of uh, people. But we uh, stood on the right path later. But uh, people were questioning also. Uh, on this, this argument, what, um, whether a democracy was worth it. And uh, I think that in regardless of the period, regardless of the events that are taking place, democracy is a choice and it has no alternative, no not good alternatives at least. I think in democracies, the justice the lack of justice, the lack of uh, fair ju um, trials is impeding uh, the democratic systems. Uh, for example, after the war, um, ma there are many missing persons and p persons who are still illegally kept in Azerbaijan and we were not able to re re restore justice for those people and they are still waiting for justice and uh, come the wounds of the returned prisoners of war and their families need time to heal. The families of our compatriots who died during the war are mourning and looking for relief. Numerous displaced persons who lost their homes and access to normal life are looking for social justice and are learning to be more resilient, cherishing a secret hope that one day they might return to their home homes. All these uh, people are part of our society, and their trauma is yet to be overcome. Therefore, the collective trauma of our society has not been overcome. Within the context of the mandate of the Human Rights Defender, I meet these people almost every day. Their issues are countless. And I have to say that we have outlined the groups of uh, problems which are which include social, psychological issues, but the major um, issue is uh, the justice. And this is the most important thing. I think that the trauma of uh, the of the war brings new challenges which uh, relate to democratic processes and protection and promotion of human rights. Extremely polarized public discourse and hate speech, as uh, Ms. Ambassador noted, are the result and the evidence of that collective trauma. Of course, we know that hate speech is a challenge that is typical of not only Armenia, but it is a challenge that exists in a number of uh, developed countries. But I think that uh, these the uh, trauma creates a provocative environment. Even when we speak about peace, this trauma provokes uh, hate speech. Uh, Actually, for a democracy, when speaking about this, the risks of this trauma, we regret to state that there are lawyers and advocates of human rights uh, who believe that th and take concrete steps uh, to to uh, suspend the operation of uh, the civil society organizations because they believe they are the true uh, uh, human rights advocates. And many times they say that uh, those values uh, led to war. Uh, they, those people believe that uh, advocacy of human rights is to restrict the pro, uh, operation of those people, and they believe that they are the true uh, adherers of uh, democracy, uh, of human rights. There are uh, deputies and decision makers in the National Assembly who believe that the principle of universality of human rights should be adapted to the distinction between the so-called fundamental and marginal, uh, marginal rights. I see that uh, this 
is problematic and very dangerous uh, in terms of human rights. But I agree with Ms. Ambassador that democracy is about taking into consideration everyone's opinions. It is an environment that uh, needs to raise the voices of uh, all the people, but also it is a rule of games where people need to bring arguments and facts. Otherwise, we will have, we will not be fighting with uh, equal weapons and tools. I think uh, this uh, addressing these issues. Uh, uh, by addressing these issues, we have to take care about the immunity of democracy as a state and as a society. I think that similar uh, developments are uh, forming the immunity of democracy. What does the immunity mean? I think it means that democratic institutions such as state governing bodies, independent institutions, civil societies, professional and accountable media, all these people, everyone, all of us, must be, uh, uh, must be directed towards disproportionate, uh, towards the fight against disproportionate attacks and threats to keep uh, the vulnerable groups away from threats and the harassments. But also, I think that it also means that we will we need to be open and we need to provide a platform for open debates, be it political opinions, be it human rights um, approaches, because our history also shows that uh, concealing uh, questions and issues does not lead to a good place. Therefore, we have to voice all our issues and problems. We need to bring evidence and uh, speak with proofs in order to be able to uh, take the path of solutions. I will sum up with this and I hope that we will speak in in the future about more important issues. Thank you. Speaker is uh, uh, Mark Behrendt, who's the director of Europe and Eurasia programs at Freedom House. Uh, so, uh, Mark, throughout the, the past more than one year, uh, while working together, we also had our like fair share of uh, heated discussions uh, on human rights, democracy, security. Uh, we have reached uh, to consensus on a lot of places, and we argue on a lot of things. But you have this institutional memory about the Armenian civil society, about the Armenian democracy, because you have extensive experience in the region and you have lived uh, in South Caucasus. So, uh, where do you see uh, the role of international organizations? Where do you see the role of the local civil society organizations to consolidate like-minded people around the topics of human rights and democracy to be able to have, again, heated discussions and arguments about these topics, but still be able to sit at the same table? What, what role do international organizations play in this? Well, international organizations, international actors in general can, can play a lot of roles. You know, they're donors, and we've heard a lot about the, the, the great support that, you know, USAID and the US government and the European Union and all the bilateral donors in the country have been playing. Um, but, but in terms of the substance of democracy, about the, the sort of the debate about <coughs> democracy, we, we, we don't really bring much to the table. We, we, we don't know it better than, than you. We, we, aren't, we aren't experts at democracies for some reason because we just grew up somewhere. Um, we, um, maybe we have a, an ability to you know, convene conversations, maybe, maybe because we're outside of the, 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 the polarization that you know, unfortunately um, challenged democracies find themselves in all the time. I mean, the, 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 the first thing that happens is they, they divide and conquer, and, and op opponents to democracy will, will, will do that, and they have done that, and they are doing it on the streets today. And, um, and so, so that, will, that causes fragmentation, that causes polarization, that causes, causes people that should be collaborating and that have common interest to collaborate not to. Um, and that's something that outsiders can sometimes do. We can sometimes you know, bring people together that wouldn't otherwise want to sit together. Um, sometimes we can, we can provide a little bit of security. Um, 
you know, we might be able to facilitate a conversation about a topic that is maybe a little bit more controversial, a little more difficult, um, because people are polite, <laughs> and, they're, and, they're willing to, and they're willing to give us that space to do that. Um, ultimately, it's because people are, are hospitable, but, but that allows us to leverage a little bit of space to support civil society and, and other actors to, to have some of the difficult conversations that, um, that they can't have. You know, I, I was here not on March 1st of 2008, but I was here on the 4th. Um, and I saw this, the, 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 the tremendous polarization and, and, and fragmentation that happened in civil society. People that were friends and willing to work together before were just absolutely at each other's throats. Um, and again, I was pleased because I got you know, them around the table to talk about, in those days, we, you know, we, I was facilitating conversations about peace building. Um, really difficult conversations, but not the conversation that was dividing them. And, you know, and, and, and it was possible for them to, to talk. But, but this, this, um, this looks like that period a little bit right, right again in, in, our, in Armenia, with this um, you know, over-securitization of the, of, the, of the question. You know, in those days, and, and, and in 2008, you know, the, I mean, the government, so literally, the government wanted to, co to, to, to create security, to, you know, you know, to force society to have order by using force, by, by, by violating the, vi the rights of, of demonstrators and, and actually killing them. Um, I mean, that's the classic, you know, uh, um, juxtaposition between security and democracy. You know, authoritarians will always use the excuse of, you know, national security concerns as, as a way to undermine democracy. Um, you know, how many times have we seen human rights defenders being absolutely falsely accused of, of either, either being narco-traffickers or of being terrorists or of being whatever um, and, and thrown into jail? Um, and this is happening not just here, this is happening all over the world. So we shouldn't be surprised that the security versus democracy question is happening. In, in, in Armenia, the, the, the problem is, is you have a real security problem. I mean, there really is a national security threat in this country. And, um, and how can democracies, given that, that very legitimate need, need for the state to, to provide security to its people, um, you know, do that in a democratic way? And of course, you know, I'm sure we all agree in this, you know, in this room, that um, there is not, there's not a tension between democracy and security. You can't actually have democracy without security. And, and democracy is security. The democracy itself and, and, the, and the, broader, the broader human dimension sort of framework around security that you know, includes democracy, protection of rights, the, the rule of law, the freedom of the media, and all of, all, all of the rest. Um, you know, it's, either, it's the, either it's the Helsinki Final Act that is, is, is going to be our framework or it's, or it's going to be the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or whatever it is. Um, I think oftentimes when we talk to each other, we, we don't make the case for democracy because, of course, I don't need to convince you, but, but we do need to be making the case. We need to be making the case all the time. I think the, the biggest mistake that, you know, people from my country, Westerners, Europeans, uh, made when they came to this part of the world in 1992, 93, 94, was, was that we assumed that everybody agreed with us that democracy and rights are, are wonderful. Um, and not only did we assume that that's great, but we, we started talking about Western values or, or European values, which made them somehow foreign. Um, you know, the, these are human values. These are, these, are, these are your birthright as much as anybody else's. And, and, um, but we didn't make the case. And we didn't, and, 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 and we didn't convince everybody. Um, there are plenty of people that were making the case, you guys are making the case, you know, and, and, and we needed to be listening to you and, and, and be doing that a little bit more, 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 more carefully and cautiously. Um, that's some, some mistakes that I think are, that, that um, you know, that some of us from the United States and, you know, com coming from outside, I, I think we, we need to be a little bit self-reflective about um, in terms of the mistakes we might have made over the last 30 years um, in, in the region. Um, the, the, I think that the, the biggest thing that can be done for democracy, you know, is, is, is not, it's not the consultation that needs to happen in order to get the idea. It's, it's the creating the, 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 the social fabric of, com of conversation and debate and, and, and discussion. It's, it's the horizontal discussions between civil society of, 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 on different themes. You know, the, the, the human rights defenders talking to the media people who are talking to the rule of law people. They need, to be, they, they need to be talking to each other, but also people that have different opinions on all of these, these issues. And of course there are different opinions on all of these issues. And you can still be pro-democratic and, and disagree with one another. Um, and these conversations need to happen. And they can't just be um, limited to the people that have the greatest expertise. 
the, just the, the people that know it all. Because there are people that don't know it all, that are maybe don't have that great, fantastic amount of expertise, but that have a perspective that's absolutely necessary for anything, to, for a good idea to come forward. You know, the, the exclusion of people from, from the regions, the exclusion of, of vulnerable communities, the exclusion of, you know, old people and people with disabilities and the LGBT community and, and feminists, and, uh, but, but not just the people that are they're marginalized because of, because of that, but just because they're outside of, they're outside of the, the clique of people that, that you know, seem to have the, the, the answers. Those, those people need to be involved, not because, not because they, they are the experts on the question at hand, but because their experience is as absolutely essential to find any answers that are, that are going to be, that, that, that are gonna be um, sustainable. You know, we talk about sustainability in so many ways, but we forget about that, that fundamental question of sustainability. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is why Freedom House came to, to Armenia. We didn't come with a lot of history. We didn't come with a lot of relationships. Um, we came on our own, you know, and maybe that is, is enabling us to, to um, convene some conversations like today's conversation, I think is, is, is wonderful. And I, and I don't want to talk anymore because I want there to be a debate. I want there to be that conversation between the, the, the room and, and, and the panel because, and, and, and not just for questions, you could just tell us things. <laughs> you know, let us, let us know what you think because, and let us have that engaged discussion and, um, because I think that doesn't happen too often. I don't know how often the Prime Minister has spoken publicly to civil society in the last few years. I don't think it's happened that often and, and I'm, I'm really grateful that he found the time, and, and, and other people from the government, from parliament, I'm really, I'm grateful that, that, that um, this has been, um, that there have been such great participation, but, but it's, it's important not because they're the ones that are here, it's because, because they are here in the room with other people that don't generally get to meet them, and I think that's the most important. So I think I'll, 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 I'll stop with that, and, um, and I'm happy to, you know, to un unpack all sorts of questions about freedom in the world, and how, you know, how freedom houses. You know, measures democracy. There's all sorts of other issues that I have all written here that I didn't go to, um, but I think this is probably enough. Thank you. Mark, Hajort uh, Our next uh, speaker is Mr. Sakuns. Uh, Mr. Sakuns uh, is the uh, president of the Helsinki Citizens Assembly Vanadzor office. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Uh, Sakuns is uh, very well known in Armenia and whenever we hear Helsinki Citizens Assembly we always uh, are reminded of Mr. Sakuns. He has been in Asparas Club for a long time and at the same time for many years he was targeted both before the revolution and after the revolution. And that is why for us it is very important to hear your comments, your remarks on uh, the situation of uh, of, uh, human rights and democracy in Armenia and how we can achieve the solidarity that uh, we were talking about. How can we start talking to each other? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Andranik. I will, uh, maybe I was not heard very well. Uh, Mickey, maybe you forgot to say that I'm also Sorosian <laughs> because uh, we cannot forget uh, what we are going, uh, the term we are going to use. Because very often uh, we try to forget certain phenomena we, by, uh, by for, uh, forgetting about inclusivity. Well, from the point of view of defending um, ourselves. Well, uh, this, uh, the, this debate that is taking place in Armenia currently is uh, taking place in a situation when uh, the m l largest challenge to democracy is taking place in Ukraine by the Puti Putin regime, by this uh, war launched by Putin in Ukraine which actually we shouldn't forget about it. We should consider it as an important factor. We should not omit it from our calculations. Otherwise, we will uh, move to a sphere. Well, what is, what is Armenian democracy? There is no such concept of Armenian democracy. No Armenian mathematics, there is no Georgian mathematics, there is no American mathematics uh, there, or chemistry. There is mathematics and that's it. There is an issue, issue of democracy in Armenia. And 
we do have faced a number of issues, and they should be considered uh, in the context of this largest global challenge, uh, which is uh, the war, unprovoked war, that is taking place in Ukraine now, and it has been taking place for more than three year, uh, three months. Sorry, and uh, against uh, the citizens of Ukraine, and they are launching a daily struggle for th their democracy. I would like to remind, uh, well, Hrant Matevosian uh, was using a phrase. He was saying we should lift the, the, uh, the, the, the Armenian society which should stop thinking that it is part of a large empire. I think I'm convinced that for many years after the independence, we still perceived that we were a part of a large empire. We haven't overcome this uh, mentality yet. So the protests that are taking place currently, it's actually for going back to the empire, for, going, for being part of an empire again. And it's a serious challenge from the point of democracy as well. Uh, they don't not that uh, not to be part of the civilization of democracy, but to be part of an empire as a possibility for security. But actually, history and historical experience and Europe's experience shows that that there is no other trustworthy, of reliable uh, and developing mechanism of uh, security than democracy simply does not exist. It has not been created. The, the other uh, security systems are threats not only for the citizens of the given uh, country as we see in authoritarian countries, but also for neighbor countries. But democracy, uh, the, the process that actually started uh, with the Velvet uh, Revolution, and it did kick off with the Velvet Revolution, it is actually accompanied by a number of issues. And the uh, protests that are taking place, they prove that there is democracy, but it's also uh, as a result of issues uh, faced by democracy. Uh, yes, we do have uh, common uh, challenges in the world, like discriminatory speech, hate speech, and there is a lot of effort to devalue uh, uh, democratic values, not only in Armenia, but also in democratic countries. But we also, uh, there is know-how on how to overcome this. And the do elections uh, constitute an important uh, mechanism of democracy? Of course they are. The electoral process has been, uh, fair elections have been uh, restored, but uh, that doesn't mean that uh, legitimacy is ensured, uh, 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 legitimacy is not uh, ensured for w once and for all. Uh, and again, history shows that in Nazi Germany, the political party got, did get a majority, but they later lost their legitimacy because uh, the, uh, the other democratic uh, institution comes forward. The absolute uh, power of uh, the majority cannot be a guarantor of democracy. The main value of democracy should be the restricted power of the majority. And we should, can mention some other principles. Uh, the implementation, the guarantee of implementation of which faces a number of issues. Accountable and transparent governance. Uh, the transparent and accountable governance uh, is uh, the guarantor of continuity of, uh, the, uh, of democracy. Have we achieved it? Of course, we haven't achieved that because the Constitution does not guarantee in itself. Mr. Ioannisian mentioned that we are not going to address the Constitution, but we shouldn't forget about that uh, main uh, challenge. We actually call them main, uh, these bears, yes? so that is important, uh, important actors. So if there is no uh, checks and balances and guarantee of checks and balances on the constitutional level, we cannot have accountable and transparent governance. Uh, even though people maybe on their individual level they do want to have it but there should be institutional mechanisms 
mechanisms that, for instance, uh, the, so that to ensure that the National uh, Security Office is under parliamentary oversight. Why uh, am I dealing, uh, talking about the National Security Service separately? Because uh, there are two, now two criminal cases initiated in Armenia. One is against uh, human rights defender Sashik Sultanyan for inciting uh, national international hatred and another uh, one is a pr uh, producer who actually used the term turk and uh, of course uh, it's this uh, this implementation of this article is a problem in itself uh, how can you imagine it that for even if you uh, justify that the word turk is a degrading uh, term. How can you imagine this case in the European Court of Human Rights? So in your country, the National Security Service is considering the uh, name of the ethnos as, uh, as a hate speech or uh, in inciting of hatred. Can you imagine that? So the, can you imagine this level of political culture, this non-democratic nature of the political culture? And uh, human, human rights defenders, uh, when, when people, talk, people talk about human rights defense, this is also uh, taken as a, an incitement of national hatred. So if, uh, if we follow that logical framework, then any human rights defender who talks about violations, he is the one who incites a national hatred so if you if we talk about violations is it incitement of hatred against armenians uh, the principle of accountable and transparent government and the uh, relevant mechanisms are the guarantors of the continuous and sustainable development of democracy. We already talked about the judicial system. I will not address it in more, much detail. Uh, as uh, for uh, the l prevalence of uh, law, it's actually a perception. It's also a matter of education. In our education system, we have a number of serious issues in uh, terms of uh, the perception of fundamentality of human rights. And that's why uh, when we actually try, uh, sometimes we attempt to see democ democracy only within the framework of the state. No, that's not t true. Uh, rights are universal. And um, well, the education system should f f find relevant solutions for ensuring better perception. And it's one of the most important issues. As for the uh, freedom to express opinion, it's one of the most important uh, pillars of democracy. Do we have all the guarantees for freedom of expression? So Voltaire has a uh, phrase. They say, you know, I, will, I don't agree with uh, your opinion, but I will actually uh, sacrifice my life for your opinion to be heard. And uh, when we are invited uh, to the public TV for uh, discussing the election results, but the same public TV does not cover, does not inform uh, about um, the SEPA agreement with the European Union, which is actually the commitment of the state, uh, it was not this. It was not imposed on us from one side. We, uh, the, with SEPA, we have mutual commitments. Yes, to cover, to explain, to inform continuously, because I think that uh, one of the most important opportunities for the. Uh, democratic development in Armenia is uh, Armenia's uh, SEPA agreement with the European Union, which actually involves all the sectors. And we are now referring to some of them. And uh, it is one, an important resource of establishment of democracy in Armenia. And we're seeing this issue now here. And when we're talking about with our partners, and you might have followed our Facebook page, we actually go to the regions, we inform them many people in the regions do not know about this agreement uh, the w w public TV which has the widest audience are not uh, they, their uh, audience is not uh, aware of the substance of the 
Climate Agreement and uh, the measures uh, taken within the framework of the agreement or future plans within the framework of the agreement. Uh, the other resource which is we, which we have for the democracy and is not properly implemented and used is uh, human European courts, uh, Court of Human Rights rulings with regard to Armenia. Let's take all the rulings of the European Court of Human Rights. They act all the structural issues are already uh, mentioned there. We don't have to reinvent uh, bicycle. Uh, the last decision was Oganesova versus Armenia, where all this uh, group of uh, persecution mechanisms is uh, already mentioned. And uh, this the and the person who has done it does not uh, this person uh, sorry this person now does not live in armenia uh, have we created the guarantees so that people can safely stay in armenia and live in armenia we uh, members of the civil society organizations who are uh, as you rightfully said are targeted we were called sorosians both before the revolution and after the revolution uh, and uh, they even had this disgraceful um, uh, events at, uh, in front of the and attacks in front of the Open Society Foundation and the uh, invasion of the building and also Azatutun uh, 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 Radio Liberty Office. So these are assaults and not only in terms of physical violence but in terms of hate speech and we didn't see any protection uh, separate individual representatives of the state even uh, resorted to the manipulation they said whose dog is Soros or they used I'm, I'm clo as close to Soros or uh, as Ishan uh, Seratelian is close to uh, democracy so these kind of formulations and these kinds of defensive actions by the authorities and this kind of resorting to manipulations uh, creates a, a relevant environment in the public. The supporters uh, do not talk, are silent in the public sphere. Yeah, please send it to me. I'm talking about the uh, when we actually uh, have the same uh, conversation with individual uh, persons. Uh, well, uh, we do have contacts with uh, people and we are aware of people's opinions, assessments, perceptions and attitudes. Of course we have a lot to do. As for the judiciary uh, system, until now the fact-finding uh, mission which was supposed to be created, it has not been created yet. Uh, and I would like to address this issue partic in, uh, particularly. We actually uh, suggested uh, the, to call it the uh, a Committee of Truth. Uh, from the very beginning uh, days, and it was actually published on December 28, uh, 2018, after the SNAP parliamentary elections, Armenia, uh, it was a roadmap of democratic development of Armenia, it was a, uh, and it was criticized by today's uh, r uh, participants of the rallies in the streets today. The main uh, purpose of the fact-finding mission was uh, to uh, collect uh, information and testimony on gross violations of human rights. Persons who for years had remained alone with their uh, violated human rights, they were not heard. They were they had to be given the opportunity to testify about the violations of their rights and if there were grave cases there should have been also compensation because the Velvet Revolution was uh, a result of deficit of social justice. Uh, and, and so that's why if we don't do it, people start saying, but did revolution really happen? Of course it did happen. I always say that it did happen. Like uh, after the French Revolution, like to, uh, if two years after the French Revolution Bonaparte came to power, it doesn't mean that the revolution didn't take place. 
so these changes of the idea of the mentality of the people that take place, they of course need and require institutionalization. I'd, I'm not saying that we are now having Bonapartism recovered in Armenia. Frankly uh, speaking, we're not living in at the end of the, uh, f fortunately, we're not living at the uh, beginning of the um, uh, 19th century. But actually, we create risks when we are not consistent when we do not follow up on re re restoration of justice and institutionalizing these expectations for restorations of justice that's, that can be the amendment in the Constitution and uh, and trust in the ju judicial system so that I know that my violated right will be recovered by the fair trial uh, and that should I, I should not expect that there will be some corruption risks involved uh, and I might not be able to recover my rights because of that and today's uh, event I would actually call today's uh, event uh, both the glory and uh, also the misery of the Armenian and democratic system. Of course, we can say, okay, Marquis, uh, everything is fine, but it's not the case. It's not the case. Because we should be able uh, to not fear and not to just survive uh, within the framework of limited democratic opportunities. De democracy requires uh, the, the bravery. And uh, as for the sec security, uh, democracy, and peace, and uh, the rele relevant discourse, we cannot uh, trust in peace and uh, security if there is no guarantee for protecting the law, protecting the right, because uh, uh, Europe was able to achieve uh, security because they were able to protect the rights, because impunity has been overcome in Europe. Uh, the Nuremberg trials so uh, were about the first step for uh, overcoming impunity. Have we been able to uh, overcome impunity? No, we haven't been able, uh, even after the Velvet Revolution. Uh, because, for instance, Yeranosian, who used special means in 2016, he is now just... Uh, uh, he is now uh, using democratic mechanisms against democracy. We always say that democracy should be able to defend itself, but uh, democracy is not about uh, police forces, uh, but about the establishment of justice and giving an evaluation to violated rights. And uh, if impunity continues, it uh, leads to new crimes. And from the point of view of peace, if war crimes have been uh, have happened, unless there is uh, an investigation for, of these war crimes, there will be no peace. It's not possible. And uh, civil society representatives have actually conducted a fact-finding mission. Where Ms. Larissa from Open Society Foundations is here. I would like to uh, applaud her because for many uh, years uh, they have really supported institutional development of democracy. Of course, the uh, U U.S. Embassy and the European Union had their uh, diplomatic commitments, but, and there was a lot of support by these uh, actors as well. But uh, the role of the Open Society Foundations uh, has be not to that has not does not have to be underestimated, and we sh should uh, tell the uh, authorities that uh, the issue of war crimes should be raised at the Security Council of the UN, at the Parliamentary Council of the uh, Council of Europe, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. I would like us to really see the situation in a more holistic way and uh, not just applaud to uh, what to the fact that there, everything is okay. We do have certain serious issues which uh, uh, require consistent endeavors and brave uh, approaches. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Zakons, for very important uh, remarks. I think that 
nobody who is here in the hall thinks that democracy does not uh, face any issues here. Uh, we th uh, believe that democracy is not fully established in Armenia. Uh, the, and uh, the struggle for democracy is uh, r regular. It's a process which has a, no end. I don't personally think that uh, there we all uh, we ever have good authorities. Authorities uh, usually have a restricting nature, and from that point of view, the, the work of the civil society organizations and media is uh, of crucial importance because they have this uh, function of watchdog. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Ketevan Abashidze. Uh, Ketevan is the... So Ketev, while talking to Ketevan, she asked me to introduce her this specific way and I'm going to, to, to read the whole, the, the, the whole introduction text because I think it's important and the work of the Human Rights House in the region is super important. So uh, Ketevan is a senior human rights officer at the Human Rights House Foundation, which is an international NGO uh, headquartered in Oslo uh, with an office in Geneva and representations in Brussels and Tbilisi. It works in partnership with the local coalition of NGOs and human rights houses to advance the right to be a human rights defender and fundamental freedoms underpinning independent civil society. It operates in all countries of the South Caucasus, also Belarus, Ukraine, Russia, Western Balkans, and Norway. So in Armenia, Human Rights House, Yerevan unites Women's Resource Center, Pink Armenia, Socioscope, Pen Armenia, Real World, Real People, Democracy Today, and the Sexual Assault Crisis Center, these organizations. Uh, I think the added value of Ketvan being in Armenia is uh, the perspective from, from Georgia because uh, she knows the, the, the region, she can draw the parallels between our countries. Georgia was the first country in the South Caucasus that uh, we can say chose the path of democracy, and I think it also paved the way for Armenia to, to go into this direction. And, I think we should recognize this, this is super important, but we also recognize that currently the, the situation of democracy in Georgia is deteriorating, which, is, which creates dan dan dangers for Armenian democracy as well. So uh, we're interested in your perspective and you are welcome to provide your introductory remarks. Thank you. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you, Andronik, for this introduction and for staying true what I sent to you. Thanks for that. Um, 30 years have passed since uh, the countries in Eastern Europe and South Caucasus have regained their independence. And as uh, a famous Belarusian writer, Svetlana Alexievich, puts it, freedom did not turn out to be an instantaneous holiday that we all hoped for. It turned out to be a rather hard road. And I think particularly today and coming from uh, Georgia, I would say it feels like all the dark forces of the past have returned. Uh, to really question everything that our societies have achieved. So how do we uh, forge our way forward and how do we push back to really reclaim the freedom and dignity that our societies have fought for over the past 30 years? And surely the strong civil society and empowered human rights defender are key to the answer. The situation of human rights defenders is really a litmus test that uh, really explains and shows the um, democratic progress of any given country. Today I will speak about only some of the uh, trends, not all of them, affecting countries uh, within the region where the network of Human Rights House operates. I will briefly touch upon Armenia, Georgia, uh, pre-war Ukraine and also Serbia. All of these are, uh, as you might recognize, hybrid regimes uh, within the classification of Freedom House under their nations in transit um, methodology. So, except of course the wars and occupation and particularly the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the biggest threat in the region, uh, in the hybrid state that I've outlined, is definitely the rise of far-right groups who um, have different structures and compositions and some intricacies, but they also have um, a lot in common. And that is um, the advocacy of uh, misguided traditional values, violence, homophobia. Uh, they frequently, but not always, are linked uh, to the Russian government. And they all attack 
and threaten human rights defenders, particularly women and minority rights defenders. Many commentators, and this is not our independent analysis here, have outlined that, for example, in Armenia, these groups might be linked to oligarchs or former government. In Georgia, the far-right groups are most likely linked to the Orthodox Church and definitely linked to the Russian government, and we see it very vividly, particularly now, as they propagate openly Kremlin propaganda. Uh, these groups in Georgia have become uh, more and more um, visible. They run their own nationwide TV channel. They are registered as a political party, and their leadership operates with absolute impunity against human rights uh, defenders in particular. Um, these groups, these far-right groups, were behind 5 July 2021 violence in Tbilisi, where a homophobic mob really uh, assaulted over 50 journalists, and one cameraman even died as a result of that. No one from the instigators has been punished to this day, though some um, implementers, over 30, up to 30 people, are now behind bars. Um, when it comes to Ukraine, pre-war Ukraine, I should say, the far-right groups there were mostly linked to local oligarchs, to, minister, to the Ministry of Internal Affairs, and also to war veterans. In Serbia, we see that the far-right groups are frequently targeting, are nationalistic, and are frequently targeting uh, human rights groups who work on understanding the past and the war crimes that have been committed in Serbia. Another issue that should be outlined are threats, uh, against specific human rights defenders and hate speech. Uh, through our study, we've done a little study a few years ago, uh, not actually a few years ago, it was last year. It feels like a long time ago. Everything before the war feels like a long time ago. Uh, so uh, we saw that in all countries of the region, protecting human rights is not safe. Human rights defenders face risks everywhere. And what was particularly alarming for us was that the risks against human rights defenders in hybrid countries like Georgia and Ukraine are on the rise. George and also Armenia, of course, it was found that they're also on the rise, the threats that human rights defenders face. And there are specific groups of rights defenders who are under particular threat. These are women uh, human rights defenders, LGBTQI rights defenders, anti-corruption and environmental activists, and also journalists and bloggers. You probably all remember the hate speech, the uh, harassment, the threats against Mamikon Hovsepian, Lara Haronyan, uh, Women's Resource Center Armenia, Sexual Assault Crisis Center, PINK. Uh, what is also another common characteristic between uh, Georgia and Armenia is that women human rights defenders face special threats, such as sexual violence uh, threats and threats targeted at their children. And also what unites these, these countries is the failure of the governments to protect human rights defenders against these threats and bring perpetrators to justice. The final issue I'd like to outline is um, uh, strategic lawsuits against public participation, the so-called SLAPs, which, uh, are usually a, which, which is usually a civil or a criminal uh, complaint or a lawsuit brought by a private individual, but can also be a government representative acting as a private individual against the work of uh, journalists, um, activists, human rights defenders, and they're vexatious and they aim at stopping the work or creating obstacles in legitimate and peaceful work of human rights defenders. Uh, you, of course, know better than me all the complaints that uh, there have been against Lara Haronyan again, against Sashik Sultanyan, the case that um, Artur has mentioned, because that is how his case formally began, right? By a formal complaint at the prosecutor's office against him. In Georgia, the slaps are really on the rise lately. Only three weeks ago, the um, chair of uh, the head of the state security service won a defamation lawsuit against two opposition TV channels for his criticism. And uh, also the member of the parliament from the ruling party, she won another uh, defamation lawsuit against one of the civil society leaders who um, raised concerns about her alleged involvement in corrupt schemes during public uh, procurement. When it comes to Serbia, investigative journalists face myriads and myriads, uh, myriads of slaps, uh, well, every month, it seems, lately. And also environmental activists and healthcare rights activists also usually are target of slaps, and they can be sued for defamation, for the expression that they use, or even for shouting slogans at public demonstrations. 
Um, what are some of the solutions that we at Human Rights Health Foundation and within the network try to work on? Of course, beyond documentation and advocacy and reminding states of their legal and political obligations. It is really a focus on building protection infrastructure for human rights defenders early on, also in hybrid countries, because we consider them to be at an early warning stage. And this infrastructure mechanisms for digital, physical, psychosocial security should be put in place early on. Our partners in Armenia are also focusing on that now before it is too late. Um, and another issue which is very important is the mobilization of communities and really creating synergies uh, with what we call unusual suspects. Uh, lawyers, psychologists, writers, journalists. In Georgia, Human Rights House Tbilisi, for example, who was also attacked on 5 July with a, py with a pyrotechnic device by these far-right groups, they found new partnerships with the journalists who have also suffered during uh, the homophobic violence. Actually, thanks to Pen Armenia, we have supported Georgian writers to maintain a free and independent literary award in Georgia. We also try to cooperate with psychologists and lawyers within our region, who then, of course, work with human rights defenders and help them stay afloat and continue their work. I would like to finish with um, a little paraphrase from famous uh, Malaysian human rights defender, Zainah Anwar, who said that, yes, we human rights defenders face many attacks, but we should use even this to open debates and conversations about issues that matter within our communities. And though, of course, the threats that we have all outlined today are numerous, we can only hope that instead of dividing people, they can be used for discussions, for soul searching, and for further consolidation of democracy, rather than for splitting people. Thank you. Very much. Uh, I, I encourage the, the audience to to also participate in the discussion and to ask questions or maybe make remarks uh, regarding the, the topics that we have discussed. Uh, so we have a raised hand. Uh, can we? Okay. First, uh, just a second for the microphone. Thank you. Uh, my name is Arnold Blayan. I am the Foreign Affairs Secretary of the Rally for the Republic Party. I am also the head of the Armenian Center for uh, Democracy and Security Issues. My question is addressed to Her Excellency, Madam uh, Andrea Victorin. Uh, during the last uh, panel, the previous panel, we were, as we were discussing the police re uh, reforms, and, uh, which is applaudable, and uh, Armenian citizens see uh, the evidence of, a, of an effective reform of the police on a daily basis. But also what, um, what the public sees is police arrests, and then those suspects are being released by the court order, by the order of a judge. So, and that creates, and, and I think right now this is the most uh, a needed question and the most uh, important question, which, which is of utmost importance, you know, to have a real judicial reform in Armenia. And as it has been this, uh, uh, raised by the Prime Minister himself at his introductory speech. So uh, my question is, um, now we do constantly hear that there are some nuances that are observed as obstacles in regards to our constitution when it comes to a really cleansement of, uh, of the judicial reform known as vetting. And um, I do believe the European Union has rich experience in tackling judicial reforms. And uh, are there any kind of consultations between the government and the European Union to find ways to, uh, uh, to finally get rid of those judges who are not supposed to be there and who have nothing to do with their, with their role that they, are, that they are doomed to do. So, because uh, one's democratic rights should be guaranteed by the judicial system, which is, not the, which is not the case right now. I'm not sure if my point was a question or was just a remark, 
but uh, maybe it should have been addressed during the previous panel when Mr. Andreasian was here. But you know, I think it still relates to this uh, to this panel's discussion as well. Thank you, Your Excellency. Yeah, yeah, you can you can reply. Can, can we keep it uh, as short as possible for like yeah. two minutes? Um, Thank you. I try my best. Uh, you see, we are supporting and we, we offer expertise where we are asked. We had, and Christina in a former position was part of this uh, panel discussion, when we, uh, when we took, for example, the example with what we did in Ukraine and there were judges uh, who were the advisors. What I would say first of all, let's be a realistic. Also, uh, I like the word integrity check, vetting, mm, also we are not very much, uh, neither the Council of Europe nor we are totally convinced that this is the right way. Uh, integrity check, yes. Secondly, you have to see it is a long procedure. Sorry to disappoint you. Um, and I can understand, I could not say I want to get rid of a number of judges. It's had, it has to be a, a clear, transparent process. Um, so what we do, we started with uh, the first court where these integrity uh, uh, checks took place. We are behind, we advise. Whenever we are asked, we would do more. But nevertheless, it is not simply, as you have to see, it has to be a procedure. If you would just kick out judges, you still have no independent uh, judiciary, so you have to stick to rules. That's a problem. So much. We have another question. Uh, thank you, Moshe Hosepian, uh, for, 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 uh, Organization of Agenda of uh, Persons with Disabilities. Uh, democracy and human rights situation is uh, often assessed by excluding uh, the uh, evaluation of the situation of the rights with per of persons uh, with disabilities. And uh, but when we also consider the issues of uh, uh, persons with disabilities, we see that the progress is not great. It's, they are either almost absent or they are very uh, little. Uh, it's just uh, just to Im imagine the, tra uh, the tra tragic nature of the situation. I will tell you that people with auditory issues, uh, they are in total information blockade because information is not accessible to them at all. The issue of uh, people with uh, mental issues, they are deprived of their freedom. They are kept in mental institutions against their will. And many of them are, are recognized dysfunctional. And it means that they are deprived of all their civil rights, including their right to uh, vote. So th currently, there are people in Armenia who are deprived of their right to vote. And uh, I guess there have been no actions in this regard. And it is also very important to consider the positive changes. In 2020, the law, 21, the law on uh, the rights of persons with disabilities was adopted, but we can. We should also consider how sustainably these developments are taking place. And the government of Armenia adopted a decision uh, when uh, it was prohibited for uh, orphans to get the certificates of uh, procurement of uh, uh, apartments. So other, so orphans with disabilities have been deprived of the right to uh, to get the apartments, while other orphans do enjoy this right. As a uh, as a negative uh, change, I would also also like to mention that the government in 2019 the government also initiated uh, this uh, voluntary protocol uh, ratified the voluntary protocol uh, on children's uh, rights convention the children's rights convention was uh, protocol was ratified while the the one for the persons with disabilities was called back without any explanation why it was called back because it actually had this mechanism of appeal uh, for uh, persons with disabilities or organizations uh, uh, protecting their rights, and we would definitely use that uh, mechanism, and that's the main 
uh, gap uh, that exists in the sector, that the amendments that are taking place are not sustainable and exclude persons with disabilities. And there's a question I would like to ask you this fo the following. How can we efficiently promote uh, sustainable cha independent changes uh, th that will be free from the discretionary approach of the public officials? Thank you so much. Is there a speaker? This is addressed to? OK, who, whoever likes to speak. Thank you. I have to say that back in the time, we have had several uh, discussions on this issue several times, but mainly about the independent life of disabled people uh, in order to create appropriate conditions for them. And uh, with regard to the ratification of the children's uh, rights protocols, uh, we had an explanation on the uh, part of disability um, f and uh, they asked for one year of uh, time to promote this agenda from the social uh, ministry. Uh, and But you are right. I have to agree with you that uh, we have to uh, achieve that the democratic processes are, are very uh, susceptible to risks. So we have we need very often we have um, we have discussions for long years and we adopt laws but we see that they are not sufficient and we cannot rest we cannot be satisfied because this law uh, establishes the principles and we need to form uh, principles uh, mechanisms uh, the n uh, normative um, acts and, uh, and decisions of the government but also physical environment and also public discourse environment so that to uh, respect uh, these principles. We have a lot of things to change in our heads, in our minds, and in our education, because very often and this, all, all these issues, besides all these issues, we uh, in the Human Rights Defenders Office, we see uh, a targeted and victimization, double victimization of uh, disabled people. And we need to address these issues in our education. And during these um, meetings with uh, children of different ages, I always ask, how do you feel when your classmates, when, when you see disability, uh, d disabled children as a result of uh, inclusive um, reforms? And I have seen fears among the elders, among the grown-ups, and the children are more excited to help their classmates. But I think that the government has a lot to do here to train the teachers, to create the environment, and also we, each of us, has something to do here. We had a, a, a call that uh, from a school that there was a parents um, group that were uh, considering to take their children out of the school because of this inclusiveness and w we have to address this by all everyone has to address it thank you as we uh, we work together a lot with uh, civil society organization which support the right of uh, people with disabilities um, to have a, to have a comprehensive approach i think it is necessary that it gets in in all the priorities of the government uh, a higher priority i would also advise because this is really there we are very closely working with un agencies as you have to see unfpa UN, uh, unicef they with them we are really doing different uh, things and they are also pressure groups as so they will also support you uh, i agree it is a long process it has to it has to uh, you, we have to have a change in minds yeah that's the main thing and i can tell you it is not 
<laughs> it is a, not a comfort, but I can tell you also in our countries, this is uh, sometimes still a problem. For example, we want to have in Germany, we want to have inclusive education. You have parents who complain <clears throat> in the class of my kid is a, a kid with disability and this, uh, this is a problem. So uh, where I think this should not be possible. Uh, so it is a, a question of change of policy, strategic approach. So this needs to, to be done through the ministry and awareness raising. And there I think the UN uh, and EU stand together really to take this as a target up. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have any remarks or questions from the audience? Can we? I heard from several speakers that uh, there are some groups which are fighting against democracy and we stated this but we didn't say how we should f uh, protect democracy are there any weapons are there any tools uh, to employ to fight against those groups which are against the, uh, which are fighting against democracy are there any such tools Yes, but this is very important and this is something that I've been thinking about to uh, justice and uh, this component of justice for a very long time have been part of the activist movements in the country and I think it has also included the class struggle, for example, if when we look at the 100 drums movements in Armenia or the electric Yerevan. Uh, but what we see, uh, and uh, because the power re rested on exploitation of the citizens, so. Uh, how, how, how dangerous are, are, are the movements that are happening you know, in the streets of Armenia currently and how we can institutionalize the democracy in the country so that we prevent this, uh, the infiltration of human rights in the country? Thank you. So who wants to, to address the, the questions? Can we keep it please as short as possible? Short calls. Very shortly, very briefly, let me say it this way, not democratic tools, but democratic, not democratic methods, but democratic tools, because the democratic methods are different. Hate speech cannot be democratic. Discrimination cannot be democratic. Violence, threats, discourses of violence and threats and behavior of violence cannot be democratic. This means that in a democratic state, the social security, uh, the interests of social security dictates several uh, application of several tools. First, of, uh, first uh, when there are violations, the perpetrators have to be uh, singled out and they need to receive an evaluation and it doesn't matter whether it is a government official or other citizen because everyone is equal in front of uh, before the law because it is the guarantee which doesn't allow to manipulate and to selectively uh, choose uh, the democratic uh, uh, methods in case of which the anti-democratic forces uh, try to attack the democratic institutions. So they are using the omissions to uh, discard uh, the democratic institutions. Second is to uh, bring democratic values to the public discourse. So the uh, authorities uh, need to be transparent and accountable and they shouldn't avoid speaking about the raised issues and uh, uh, provide ongoing and objective and accurate information. So this is the uh, meaning of transparency of uh, public authorities. I always say that due to war, we have serious issues. But until now, the circumstances of April war have not been public. Um, published. And this has no justification, no explanation. And uh, this uh, hinders uh, the 40-day, 40 44-day uh, war investigative uh, council and uh, the trust towards this council, this committee. When you don't publish uh, 
I'm speaking uh, as an advocate of human rights, I cannot have an argument because I have to formulate my demand uh, so that the public authorities are transparent and accountable based on which I can um, I can counteract the anti-democratic forces. Otherwise, it is impossible. It, it makes no sense. So the tools are quite broad, but the, the method, the uh, enforcement method or the legal method will bring the weakening of democracy, uh, democracy because democracy is the public opinion. It is the communication. Thank you. Support what uh, Artur has just said, and also just to mention that there is this notion of defensive democracy, uh, which is threatened uh, by basically exploitation of democracy, as we've heard today. And even not to go into these terms, democracy also has the mechanisms to ans answer to the rise of uh, violent groups. Uh, as Artur also outlined, uh, physical attack, threats of violence, which are very well documented and happen, they can be punished and they should be punished. Uh, as of today, uh, from today in fact, we have a new recommendation at the Council of Europe about uh, targeting and answering to the hate speech. And there is some hate speech which can be criminal when it instigates violence and when there is a serious threat and of course there is a delicate balance with freedom of expression. But still, physical assaults and uh, violence are not freedom of expression. And one can argue whether such a TV channel, for example, from the Georgian example, or such a political party who really uh, beats people and calls for such acts, exercises their freedom of expression. There is also, again, democracy should gear up and fight. We've heard today that it is not an um, instantaneous tour package or it's always a daily fight. There is also a movement in Europe, uh, both at the Council of Europe and at the European Union level, to target these strategic lawsuits against public participation, where this, uh, uh, this phenomenon is recognized, where the courts will be equipped with the opportunity to recognize them, and once it's uh, proven that it's potentially a slaps, such vexatious lawsuit, then the burden of proof will be shifted to the claimant, the one who tried to disrupt the actions of democratic actors, who then has to prove that no, in fact, it was a real lawsuit. There is also um, costs uh, uh, that will, c can be attributed to such uh, vexatious uh, lawsuit claimants, uh, also damages and penalties. So in a way, it's recognizing the problem, consolidating uh, around it, and not being afraid to use the mechanism that we already have. And I think particularly within this war context, when, well, again, coming from the Georgian perspective, uh, it seems right now that everything is in danger. It's a lot of important to really use all the tools that we have, which are democratic, are based on rule of law, but we should be sober about these tools. Two words, uh, independent media, fact-checking, media literacy, and education. It, we need to start early to educate uh, kids really how to behave in a public uh, uh, sphere. Um, and that they do not learn from, let's say, the people who are using all this hate speech here. And there is a clear rule. We have now a, a new regulation which says everything what is offline, a crime, is a crime online. And I think this is something, and this has nothing with, uh, to do with restriction of uh, freedom of media uh, or freedom of expression. There is a red line that should not be over uh, uh, used. Last question of this panel, please. Anton Yevchenko, Helsinki. Citizens' Assembly, I would like to apologize that I am occupying a space which is expressing, which has uh, arisen the professional anger in me. I want to address the question to Mr. Sakuns. Also, uh, although some deputies have left uh, the 
uh, hall, the democracy of uh, self-government authorities is one of the indicators of democracy for me. And uh, during the last uh, elect elections of uh, self-governing um, self bodies, uh, we had a process where the governing party, the ruling party, uh, lost in some uh, communities and didn't uh, have majority. And uh, sometimes they could manipulate the uh, results. They uh, put aside their mandates and uh, both in court processes and out of court processes. Uh, they have appointed Mr. Davros Sapeyan, who was appointed a leader of the community without having a majority. So uh, it was per se a sh um, blackmail, political blackmail that was applied. And uh, they This was the most vulgar case. And the second one is the case of Vanadzor City, when uh, the um, acting leader, Arta Arkady Peleshian, was also a member of the City of uh, uh, El Council of Elders. And after the, uh, before the uh, change of the um, uh, law, the, he couldn't even uh, take the post of the acting uh, uh, head, acting leader. So, uh, I think this is a threat to the dem to democracy, and the democratic gaps uh, are there, and there are some uh, rooms to make in, uh, democratic uh, uh, changes, and this creates a desire to manipulate the electoral results. N not to make the impression that this was a agreed uh, question to me. This is a, a sign of protection of labor rights. This is just a case, an instance, and this is an order. This was not an order to speak about this topic. So Vartina spoke about this in her speech. So we spoke about Vanadzor. We have uh, uh, made an announcement, which was a backstep of democratic uh, values. Why? Because the uh, uh, legislative change or legislative manipulations to regulate the local uh, democracy through legislative uh, manipulations for individuals is the same as to be, be the restriction of uh, not being elected twi more than twice. Uh, which is eliminated w by some parties. And secondly, you appoint an acting leader, a person which has not received a trust, a vote from the public, from the society. And moreover, where is, especially in case of Anadzor, where is the criminal subculture? Where is the fight against criminal subculture? Where the, the issue is not that a person has uh, been uh, in prison or uh, any other thing, but this the issue is the perception of the public. How do you appoint such a person as uh, a acting leader of the community. We have uh, voiced this issue because the content of this is a, f a message in terms of values. We attach importance to value uh, to that this is a message that such people can also be appointed in public posts, which is incompatible. Oh, and moreover, in a local and community government level, the principle of uh, democracy is that the source of power is the people. So you shouldn't make uh, legislative manipulations to substitute, to replace the choice of people and to replace it with a person who was uh, re-elected by the Council of Elders or through political agreements and to replace the choice of people through these uh, such processes. And uh, the, the, after these uh, elections of self-government bodies, uh, the 
these demands stay on the agenda and we have uh, demanded from the authority to change uh, their attitude to cancel uh, this appointment and change the legislative regulations. Unfortunately, the deputies are not here. I'm sorry for uh, extending my speech, but this is the reality. We take part in different platforms, in the anti-corruption prevention group, in uh, judiciary system reforms group, in police reform groups in the Constitutional uh, Reform uh, Council, but when it comes to this uh, elect, to the change of electoral uh, code or to the uh, politically sensitive issues, the information is absent, the response is absent, and the attention is absent. And this is the mo one of the crucial principles of democracy th that is to be heard, uh, not for your voice to be neglected. So this is a value, this is a principle. And when you have a, a backstab and when you don't com conform to these principles, uh, the rallies uh, are inevitable. So who am I uh, posing a demand to? To the authorities, obviously, because they have to comply with the democratic values and mechanisms and approaches by being transparent and accountable. Uh, I'm sorry for extending my speech. All the uh, head of police, uh, all their salaries have been increased and their I'm sorry uh, uh, for being irritated you transferred your uh, anger to me thank you Mr. Sakuns we are summing up our second panel with this uh, please let us hear the last remark Frankly speaking, I don't know whether uh, who this question is addressed, whether it is a question or a concern. Um, when we're speaking about the local democracy, I have uh, encountered a similar situation as Anton, Mr. Antonivchenko voiced. Democracy doesn't happen uh, uh, overnight, it happens through the carriers of democracy, starting from the uh, bottom when the people realize their potential to fight for their rights, when they fight for uh, some justice in their country, in their state, for an environment of justice, and uh, at, only at that time can the um, democratic values be considered strong. But otherwise, speaking about democracy on the level of NGOs or on uh, authorities, uh, or speaking about it in Yerevan is not sufficient. Democracy has to be covered everywhere and f first of all from the community level. In the recent decade, we have had um, quite good examples in Armenia where the communities uh, were fighting for their rights, so applying the democratic methods. So it was in response to the to the lack of mechanisms or bad legislative field or the non-enforcement uh, of laws. And uh, this was mainly uh, in the form of environmental fight on the community level when the people fought for their rights. And at the, in the recent uh, period, we witness some projects, uh, some legislative uh, projects, which seem to restrict the local uh, the, the the opportunity of citizens to fight on the local level and their the efficiency of their fight and uh, in this uh, legal um, field there are, uh, are no legal mechanisms um, introduced in this regard for example the uh, legislation on the land use on uh, and there were some uh, 
rallies against it and uh, they applied to the international organizations to support the civil organization, the civil society, including uh, the, um, the EU office. And today I am coming from another uh, discussion, that's why I was late, and the mining strategy of Armenia was being discussed. And at, in that field, on the local level, the citizen was not given an opportunity to take part and mechanisms to take part in decision making. And it was proposed to create a mechanism in the country, in the community, where the, during public consultations, uh, when citizens uh, hinder the public consultations on this strategy, it uh, it should um, give rise to uh, legal legal uh, restrictions. So we have to give attach importance to the mechanisms of local communities to fight. And here, oh, the international organizations uh, have to attach importance to support in uh, this uh, issue, uh, to support the uh, civil society, and to be a fighting partner in this regard. And because the concerns have to be considered at the local level from the bottom. Thank you. Uh, your concerns uh, will be considered by all the members of our panel, and we will close uh, our panel with this. I thank all the guests who took part in this. I think it is very important to hold such constructive discussions in Armenia because for a long time uh, we were deprived of this uh, opportunity. The, uh, there was no opportunity for the civil society organizations to take part in constructive uh, discussions because uh, the platform was uh, filled with uh, destructive uh, discourses. We will have a um, coffee break for 15 minutes and then we will hold our third panel dedicated to media. I have to uh, make a correction. Zomak came back from uh, the revolution and opened a business in Zovak. I have to make a correction. Thank you. One is uh, uh, very tired, but this discussion is very important. Let's just wait for one minute until everyone joins and we'll start the panel. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, everyone again here. My name is Kayane Abrahamian. It's my honor to moderate this last panel discussion. It's a very important forum, and uh, we should also express our gratitude to Freedom House uh, as well as the Union of Informed Citizens uh, NGO for organizing this event. Well, thank, we would like to thank Freedom House for its decades of work. And it's, uh, it has been the check and the balance of the media sector. And the, yeah, the media has uh, tra transpo transformed immensely. And Freedom House has had its uh, important uh, contribution in this endeavor. And using this occasion, I would like to 
thank uh, the Freedom House for these uh, activities. We will discuss uh, the issues related to this uh, fake news and media sector in Armenia. And they have really t uh, become a threat in Armenia. Media as such is uh, one of the foundations of democracy and one of the main roles of the media is to ensure oversight, to ensure accountability and the use of accountability mechanisms uh, towards the state and uh, especially in uh, the last uh, decade of well, uh, the media has uh, turned into polarized, politicized uh, uh, platform, which is a very serious issue, not only in Armenia, but all over the world. In, all around the world, we live in the so-called post-truth uh, times when fake news often have a larger impact on public consciousness and public perceptions than the, uh, the real true uh, news and particularly the investigative uh, news. And I think that we should join uh, efforts to fight against this situation, not only on the legislative level, uh, and but uh, th and this discussion is also going to give justifications uh, that uh, the legislative level is not the most important level of fight against uh, this phenomenon. We have the issue of uh, protecting democracy from disinformation, from fake news, from false uh, narratives. Um, if uh, in different respects, sometimes it is possible to struggle against fake news through fact-checking uh, in initiatives, uh, fact-finding uh, projects, but uh, it is very difficult to fight against false uh, narratives, and they have become uh, they present enormous risks uh, to our society, especially in the recent years when the democracy has been put into fake contradiction to uh, security. And as uh, the head of the EU delegation mentioned, there is no security, there is no development without democracy. And uh, this is one of the fundamental axioms that we should uh, take as a baseline of our activities. I'm trying to uh, talk as briefly as possible so that uh, our panelists will have the opportunity to provide their uh, comments. I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Sisak Gabrielian, uh, pr uh, Chairperson of the Commission of uh, Education, Sports, Culture and uh, uh, Sport uh, and Science of the um, Standing Committee of the National Assembly of Armenia, an MP of the National Assembly of the Republic of Armenia. He's a former journalist and has uh, been one of the leaders of the development of the media of the media field, and uh, a number of. Uh, Legislative draft laws had to be drafted, but they weren't. It's also I also have my share of blame. Uh, very often uh, we have uh, been too slow with our initiatives, but and but recently some amendments have been adopted, which are really problematic. And I think that we are going to address these issues today. I would like to single out one important uh, issue. Uh, recently, the, there there is some consensus between consensus between the government and the uh, CSOs uh, that the relevant legislation has to be changed, and also the memorandum of understanding has been uh, signed, and we are having this collaboration now. Hopefully, the, uh, we won't see the results too late. You're most welcome, Mr. Gabrielian. Thank you, uh, Ms. Abrahamian. Okay. Uh, uh, well, I, I actually didn't understand which uh, legislative amendments you mean. Maybe you could later tell me. Th I, and to spare your time, uh, 
I, I, I actually uh, share uh, the assessments uh, given by my colleagues, and this was a good occasion to actually meet people who I haven't been able to meet for months, and we actually had very fruitful discussions in the course of the event. As I can understand, uh, we should talk about uh, disinformation in this panel more, and to some extent, uh, I might s uh, say that uh, this information is not only an Armenian issue, because uh, m uh, during uh, my business trips to different countries, when we talk about this information and may media, they mostly talk about fake news in their countries. And I have to say, state with regret that uh, almost all stakeholders uh, say that they do not have a defin definitive uh, solution or regulation for this issue. And uh, many countries uh, try to come up with certain regulations to fight against uh, this issue. Uh, personally, I divide this issue into two parts. Um, I either call it obje objective subjective or uh, disinformation and misinformation. Yes. Uh, so uh, the deliberate disinformation is clear to all of us. Uh, I want to uh, single out the opposition, uh, the ruling power. We, when we look at it, we see if we, uh, who's, we, from which side it is actually guided. Um, and objectively, uh, the, uh, also the state agencies also uh, have uh, their share of blame because in uh, the state agencies, we really face an issue of ensuring accessibility of pro uh, providing uh, information. Very often, this informa infor information becomes disinformation uh, because public uh, agencies and officials are, are either not uh, uh, quick enough to respond or do not respond at all. And very often these gossips uh, spread and then uh, they appear in the headlines of the news. And uh, I do admit uh, that both the government and the National Assembly have uh, a lot to do in this regard. And as Ms. Abrahamian mentioned, uh, recently uh, the legislature, executive, and uh, dozens of uh, CSOs have signed a memorandum. Um, and it consists in uh, the fact that uh, we actually are committed to to jointly discuss uh, any amendment uh, relevant to the media. And these uh, three groups um, have um, underlined, we have underlined th 12 uh, directions that we consider a, a priority. It's starting, starting from financial accountability, disinformation, self-regulation, etc. And in the coming days, uh, we are going to have our next uh, meeting. It's, uh, and we are going to already, so the National Assembly will uh, take a commitment on what directions it's going to work, the CSO on its part, the government on its part. And personally, in my opinion, uh, I am sure that the citizens uh, approach you and say, you know, close this media outlet uh, or that my media outlet. But I th in my personal opinion, the best method of uh, fight against disinformation is information. If there is no information, disinformation thrives. and. Um, I am really very happy that uh, different media outlets have started fact-checking activities. And uh, yesterday I noticed uh, uh, an um, article in CivilNet. They also have a fact-checking platform. And they had actually done fact-checking about one of uh, st the statements of my, one of my partners. And I was really happy to uh, see it because it's a good indicator for me that uh, people not only uh, listen to the statement of a public official, but they also try to check uh, 
the validity and authenticity of this statement, I think that the best way to fight uh, this information is creating such pl platforms as much as possible. And I, as I have also mentioned, we should improve the communication of public uh, uh, agencies with the uh, public. Uh, maybe you will have further questions um, on this uh, regard, but I will. Uh, my, I, I want to spare your time and leave more uh, room for further questions. Thank you. We will speak about concerns at the end because I think our speakers will also address the question. Uh, the, our next speaker is the senior advisor at OSC Freedom of the Media Office, Mrs. Bettina Ruges. Ms. Bettina Ruges, during the last uh, five years, uh, the EU and other different EU member countries have been fighting uh, to of against uh, disinformation with uh, stricter methods in terms of uh, restriction. Um, well, this is a thing which we avoid in Armenia or um, myself or my colleagues as uh, civil society representatives. Uh, we will um, criticize if uh, the government adopts such an approach of uh, restrictions, especially um, in terms of supervision, uh, oversight of content. This is something that uh, anyhow, nevertheless, there is no well-established democratic institutions in Armenia, which are mainly the uh, judiciary system and uh, the law enforcement uh, bodies uh, can create problems. Uh, so I would like you to present the best practices, in, uh, uh, in best international practices which are well established against the, uh, the disinformation which can be applicable in Armenia. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. I don't know whether I really can. <laughs> um, I don't know whether I really can <laughs> present very good and very best practices because uh, also in Europe uh, it, it's it's a difficult situation. And um, I start with uh, saying that I'm very happy to be here because uh, it was actually here in Armenia mm -hmm. when I was uh, when I was still project manager for the Deutsche Welle Academy that uh, Armenian colleagues like Nune mm -hmm. and others really. Uh, told me uh, or told me about the complexity of, of uh, this information and, and how complex it is and uh, what, what all we have to consider. And now I'm a senior advisor to the representative on freedom of the media. <clears throat> She unfortunately could not come because she has to deliver a report. And uh, it's also worth mentioning that her mandate is 25 years uh, since the mandate of the representative was established. And 25 years ago, the, there was a completely, completely different picture of, uh, uh, of, of the media and eco environment. We had a newspaper once a day, uh, and we had TV news in the evening, and we had radio. And uh, if you compare it to today, while I'm speaking every second, there is 10,000 tweets, uh, 10,000 10, tweets shared. And among this, we don't know how much disinformation and misinformation and fake news these tweets that actually now are shared contain. But we know it is very, it is very fast. Uh, and one reason why it also can fa uh, fa very fast, it's uh, of course we have this technology um, uh, development, and we also have to, and we also know it is far more cheaper to spread disinformation. Uh, if we compare a disinformation campaign for one year, can be can be call, can be bought for four hundred thousand uh, dollars per year. If you compare it to quality journalism, if I speak of the German uh, public service broadcaster ZDF, who has a budget, who needs hundred million dollars just for for producing news programs per year. So this is already this is all. And of course, you don't need a license for spreading this information. You can do it like this. So one really can speak of an uh, information disinformation black market uh, that that is spreading and flourishing. And uh, we we understand that this is also uh, it is it is cheap and easy to mimic journalist 
professional looking uh, journalist websites and um, they also influence public opinion and also what they do, they undermine trust uh, in quality media. And for 50,000 euros, for instance, you can just dollars, you can buy, uh, you can buy a discrediting campaign for a journalist who actually is, is providing, uh, who's providing factual and good news. Um, and then, of course, there's also the security issue, as uh, the COVID uh, situation showed. We don't know, due to, due to this information, how many, how many lives have been lost due to this information. I can also give examples from Europe when people still would believe that the cure against horse disease is better than a vaccine, uh, would walk still on the streets uh, in Vienna every weekend. Uh, but uh, we, I can, I can see already from Europe there. I think it must have been thousands of people who, who just uh, by by believing more in disinformation, uh, have 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 suffered from this. And then we also can observe that authoritarian government, authoritarian governments and populists like uh, to undermine trust in democratic institutions and also in the value of international cooperation. And the methods are the same. So they declare that their uh, doubtful news are the true ones or uh, their alternative facts. And then they claim that um, facts presented by uh, journalists servicing the public is, uh, is actually fake. And this, all this disinformation, of course, decreases, uh, um, decreases confidence in uh, public institutions, in journalism, and also in relationships uh, uh, between states. And so all in all, uh, we observe uh, a steady decline in media freedom in the OSCE region, although we have heard that Armenia made, uh, made, some, made progress. Uh, but but the, general, the general situation is, uh, uh, it, it, is uh, it is more, it is countries where you would expect uh, it is better, uh, it's declining. And this goes hand in hand with, with other pressures on media. So yes, there are defamation law lawsuits, we heard all this, um, there are slap cases, and uh, for example, there's also physical attacks and psychological attacks on journalists. Uh, this is also on, on disinformation. And I heard also, I heard also this, this afternoon that this, of course, also attacks, uh, concerns a lot, uh, female journalists who, who have already, uh, will also hear it. And this is also happening, as you said, uh, it's happening in Germany during, during uh, uh, protests, uh, Journalists from public, st st uh, uh, public uh, service broadcasters, they have now to go with bodyguards uh, to, 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 some, to certain demonstrations because they have to be attacked. And this, again, raises the cost, of course, for, for production. So um, this is, uh, what is the solution? Yeah, as I said, I'm, uh, I, 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 can, I, don't, I don't think that uh, there, there is still, there is still a, 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 a one, 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 one good method to say, uh, and we observe there is, uh, there is this, this, this uh, tendency to, to do some wholesale burning and blocking of, uh, uh, of, of sources of alleged uh, disinformation. And uh, maybe you also have heard that the European Union had a sanction and, and uh, in, in a sanction package is, uh, has bo uh, blocked and banned uh, Sputnik and, and Russia today, uh, which was uh, which was taken, which was taken with, uh, which also had a lot of criticism in, inside the European Union, uh, because this all may have a chilling effect on public discussion and lower the, uh, the trust in, 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 in also in society, because one is also asking, so is this now a standard? Um, is this now a standard? And, 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 and what, what, how will you, will you con if you once started it, will you, uh, will you, will you apply to others? And, um, and also, uh, we could also see that there's enough, we are technology, uh, technologically advanced 
to circumvent these measures. So it doesn't mean if you block if you block a TV station or if you block a website that it's gone. It just goes to other channels and, and, and people who want to follow and people who want to follow, uh, want to get this inf information, they, uh, they will just still get the information. And yes, uh, the OSC has, prin has principles uh, <clears throat> and follows the, the international established practices that uh, Blocking and banning can be applied in exceptional circumstances, and these are then uh, spelled out in Articles 19 and 20 uh, of the ICCPR. But it's it's really it's really important that when fighting disinformation, that one strikes that one strikes a balance. Uh, uh, between also freedom of speech and free flow of information and access uh, and access to information, and uh, and there is also this concern that this uh, if if you prohibit it that you also uh, that yeah this might be applied to 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 journalists maybe who who present inconvenient facts uh, that that are not heard but maybe that are that are due listening. And um, overall, I, uh, it, it still has to be seen whether, whether, this, whether this helps in raising trust in media and trust in public institutions and in professional media. And then the best antidote, one of the best, is, is, is probably in engaging in um, independent, diverse quality germ journalism, uh, which is, which is, of course, if you have, if you have enough, if you have enough in this, in this sea and in this, in this, in the sea of, of disinformation, you have, a, you, you can counterbalance with, with quality information. This is, uh, this is, of course, uh, this is, of course, uh, then uh, uh, this is uh, regarded as one of the most helpful uh, uh, tools, and this is why we need more of media freedom and not less. But this, of course, for this, of course, you have to have a set uh, of practices uh, and, and standards in, uh, in, in practice. This is then funding, uh, funding system. Uh, and, and sustainable business models for media, which are still complicated also, also in Europe, and also in Europe, public service broadcasters are always threatened that uh, their budgets are cut, although we see there's a more uh, demand for news. Then, of course, you have also to, to engage in, in fact-checking, which is also another burden on journalists uh, to do, and it's an extra, and it's extra work. Then uh, one also has to see to 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 work on quality uh, journalism education, um, which also one has to revise, has to think uh, what what is is what is is the principles of journalism and the tools that have been uh, have been established 30 years ago when it was important to be quick. Is this still the, 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 the best thing when you can see that you will never probably be quicker than, than internet? Is there, is there maybe some other areas to, uh, to follow? And then, of course, quality media must be protected by law and supported uh, by, uh, must be supported and uh, with, with all means and from all sides. Media self-regulation is important, and one can see that in countries with uh, with, uh, with free media and, and a free media system, they can uh, uh, they can uh, they can also bring uh, they can also spare the, the government from interference in this if the media can do it. But again, one has to one also has to take into consider consideration that media companies and maybe social media companies might not have the interest. It is not in their interest to. Um, uh, yes, to, 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 to uh, protect human rights, especially rights of freedom of expression, but rather, uh, but rather they need to stay in business and to promote, uh, and to promote everything. And uh, as it was mentioned 100 times here, and I can also only confirm it, media, media literacy is of, course, is of course very important, but it takes time. It takes time, and it's most probably the most resource in intensive. You have to go to schools, and of course many people are also saying now that you have to do something on adult education, because when you now see who's, who's vulnerable to disinformation, it is rather groups that are old, and nobody knows how really to to reach them, um, but yes, and it takes a lot of effort and cooperation. And what does the uh, representative on media 
and, uh, on me uh, and freedom of the media in this regards uh, many things so there is uh, it, she has she has tools and every every representative decides uh, on her uh, uh, on her personality on her own consideration what to do they can if there is uh, blunt violations they can uh, they can make uh, she can make interventions she can address uh, certain issues she observes in a country uh, like in armenia also um, to to authorities in a letter and requesting information and also given her comment what what she thinks she can also go in, in, in severe cases she can go public and, and, and make this announcement um, the current uh, Alpha M Rema, um, Teresa Ribeiro visited Armenia in March and she also had the opportunity to discuss uh, various issues uh, with, uh, with authorities and uh, there is still an ongoing exchange uh, the RFOM also provides legal assistance if it is uh, requested and it was also done for, for Armenia. And uh, in addition to that, uh, the RFOM has launched a project on uh, media information literacy which uh, will assist participating states with concrete guidance and recommendations on the develop uh, on on on, net, uh, on media uh, literacy strategies that can also become part of the agenda and uh, we have a series of expert roundtables. They are focusing on disinformation. Uh, this is already what we started last year, and it's various topics. We have also one on um, we have also so some on self-regulation. Uh, we are hoping uh, we are we are going to have one on public service media and maybe hopefully also with the part participation uh, on of, of from Armenian uh, from Armenian side. So this is what the RFM can do. She can uh, the, the office can provide a platform for for international learning and also for comparison uh, among the uh, the 57 states. So to all 57 states, uh, they provide guidance and also a room uh, a place a platform for exchange uh, for exchange in this field because yes uh, you are not alone with this and I think everybody can say uh, uh, you are not alone with this and I think everybody is very much struggling but um, but I think with joint efforts and to see so and also to learning from each other's best practices and also learning what is the international standard and what is not to harm other and not to at the end not to limit freedom uh, of expression and and and, and build uh, trust in the public. Uh, this uh, uh, this is uh, this is very important then for for this exchange. So and with this, I will conclude and uh, thank you for the attention. Thank you, Miss Rogers. Uh, two important remarks were made by you, which I would like to particularly address. Uh, the fact that disinformation and spread of uh, fake news and false narratives uh, is ha has a major impact and disrupts democratic uh, institutions and the integrity of democratic institutions. And this really should uh, become uh, an important uh, tendency that, uh, to uh, address these issues. And the second uh, remark that I would like to uh, particularly address is that media and particularly audiovisual and broadcast uh, media, which are also businesses, they do not, uh, they won't really uh, be happy with uh, restrictions. And we should specifically mention that uh, freedom of speech is not a totally unrestricted and uh, right. So 
It is uh, restricted by the Armenian legislation and 10th art article of the Convention, European Convention, that uh, that this it can be uh, restricted, of course, based on law. So it's not an absolute right. So it was very important for that Ms. Regis uh, particularly emphasized that quality media should be protected by law and the public interest of uh, getting uh, real information should be protected by law. Uh, Mr. Hakopian, uh, head of the Commission on Television and Radio, has been fighting uh, in this uh, sphere for a long time, trying to ensure that at least uh, the media that are under the regulation of the head uh, of the commission on television and radio could be regulated in some way of course uh, it's not a, uh, these attempts are not always a success but let's try to discuss which is the limit and what restrictions can we impose which will not disrupt the freedom of uh, speech but will also not will not disrupt the public interest you're most welcome mr hakopian thank you very much uh, I have he uh, heard very interesting opinions. I uh, agree with uh, many of them. I will just have a small comment. Maybe you, you will not agree with me. When we talked about disinformation and hate speech, uh, different speakers repeated several times uh, that it disrupts, that it is against this, uh, democracy, that it is against democratic values, uh, that it puts under risk democracy. I would actually view it in a more globally. Uh, democracy is uh, about a state um, model for a uh, more prosperous society, and it actually it actually puts into risk uh, our uh, value system, our fundamental value system, irrespective of whether it is a democratic country or an authoritarian country. So uh, it actually disrupts the social fabric and it uh, does not allow people to work together and advance their country. So uh, it's not only a challenge to democracy, we shouldn't narrow it down. So this information is a more global challenge. and. Um, we shouldn't undermine its uh, uh, role because if uh, it, it will result that if we did not uh, did not have democratic system, then this information would be okay. Uh, so it's not the case, right? So uh, now I will go to. I don't want to go to off the topic. A few days ago, I went, came back uh, from the annual uh, meeting at, in Antwerpen of the re uh, meeting of European regulating bodies. We hadn't gathered for two years because of COVID, and we had really very good um, meetings for two years. And one of the topic, important topics, was hate speech and disinformation information. But, well, there is a very interesting thing. When they were talking about uh, means of overcoming it, uh, means of regulation, uh, it was mostly, uh, uh, the, it was, uh, they talked about uh, hate speech that is present or disinformation that is in the social media or generally in the internet. And when I was asking, you know, very often you forget to mention about broadcast media, that is the audiovisual uh, service uh, providers who have uh, licenses and broadcast on uh, digital multiplexes or uh, broadcast on cable uh, TV. They um, actually said that these issues are all dissolved there and it's uh, brought to the minimum. When they talk about uh, media, uh, about the risks, they mostly talk about the new media because in the old media, I mean the classical media, the TV, the radio, uh, which we see in our cable networks and uh, public multiplex. So whatever happens in some of our TVs, the vocabulary used, the manipulative statements, they are already impossible in Europe. So they are all, uh, they have already advanced uh, to uh, working on in the internet because it is solved in the TVs. So one of our major issues is at least uh, um, 
because the internet is very difficult to regulate. At least we can solve these issues in this area. So I actually mentioned four main issues, uh, which need urgent addressing. One is the regulation mechanisms. I mean, uh, the subst substantive uh, restrictions that have already been in place in Europe for uh, a few years, because in Armenia, unfortunately, we always, yes, you know, we say uh, media freedom is uh, restricted uh, to, so, to some extent. Uh, by the constitution, by the law, uh, etc. But that's only the second part. But the, uh, we have actually taught the society that there is freedom of uh, speech, which is uh, sacred, and it does not need any intervention. And in this respect, I, we should, in the first place, uh, introduce uh, regulation mechanisms. And here I would like to remind you that uh, two years ago, when uh, the law on audiovisual media was adopted, was being adopted, the Commission provided certain uh, recommendations. Of course, it was not a panacea, but it did not solve the uh, issues, but it would actually reduce both disinformation and manipulations and uh, uh, hate speech, but actually, our uh, interestingly, no, uh, none of our suggestions were uh, approved, and I don't know at which level it was actually removed and discarded. I will bring a few examples, and you can just uh, answer for yourselves whether it's it's a restriction of freedom of speech or not, because uh, they always said that it you know it's restricting the the freedom of speech. That's why we do not uh, 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 accept it. Well, we uh, suggested the following restrictions uh, that uh, if it, when there is uh, a concrete, the, the, so you have to have certain relation between the image and uh, the text, yes? So you shouldn't show an image with that she does not have to uh, to do anything for, uh, with the text so that's uh, an obvious manipulation that is used by the media and if this restriction was adopted would would it be a risk to for freedom of speech what do you think and um for instance uh, uh uh, and the, the text, uh, uh, the relevance of the text, yes, for instance, uh, in the current uh, situation, very often people uh, see the headline and do not see the substance. So the headline does not have to do anything with the substance. This was another restriction we wanted to ensure. And uh, as for events, very often uh, they are edited and presented to the TV and radio audience. And the discussions of public interest should ensure unbiased nature of the opinions and also uh, provision of opposing ideas. And uh, if someone, if an op opponent uh, refuses to come, it does not to uh, relieve this TV from uh, uh, providing opposing uh, views. Yes, for instance, uh, the pr TV host can say, you know, there is also an alternative view. What do you think about it? So that's uh, what we actually uh, suggested. And there was another restriction that we suggested uh, that uh, TV hosts uh, should uh, provide uh, the political affiliation of the people who provide certain opinions. Um, for instance, a person comes and says that, you know, we are from the uh, uh, pr uh, Canine Protection Committee, but this, I, we know that they are politically affiliated people. So it was a four-page document, but they just uh, reduced it to half a page. I don't know who's responsible for that, but we don't know. But uh, Mr. Gabriel Lan actually said, you tell me what, uh, uh, what you are discontent with. Actually, the commission uh, is uh, discontent with uh, such a refusal such refusals. Uh, so this referred to regulations, because if we do not have regulations, uh, the self-regulations uh, will uh, lose their efficiency. We will, first of all, 
have want we should we will we want to have regulations and then self regulation second issue is uh, all audiovisual flows should be uh, subject to regulation those that look tv like yes so for instance internet tvs 90% uh, of internet tvs are not tvs they are just propaganda machines of uh, different political parties and they obviously illegally uh, work illegal, uh, ob obviously illegally, and uh, you know very often experts say don't touch the internet. But very often uh, the internet has a more impact than uh, the traditional uh, classical media, and. Very often, uh, because they do not regulate uh, the internet, the internet and the TV face unequal uh, competition uh, between each other. So they can do internet media can do whatever they want. Uh, they are financed by some shadow uh, funds, and they actually pollute the whole information field here. In the Europe, in Europe, they have that experience. I don't even want to refer to Europe because. Uh, countries with different political models, Russia, China, uh, Japan, anyhow, they have started to have uh, at least minimal regulations of the internet. And third important issue is refers to uh, well, we basically talk about this information by our broadcasters, physical persons, legal persons, etc. But what if that disinformation is uh, disseminated by foreign broadcasters? Uh, we can actually regulate it locally by our laws, by the commission. What shall we do with foreign actors? Uh, open the uh, open the telegram channels. They are full of uh, this information, both in Russian and English, Chinese, and even Armenian language. Uh, if you open the public uh, multiplex, there are uh, foreign broadcasters, and they provide a distorted image of the world, and it's very difficult to fight against it. Let's take the cable networks and uh, the Armenian. Uh, TVs are, uh, are uh, constitute 17 percent. The rest are foreign uh, actors, and uh, you know uh, outside. You know that there are ve even in democratic uh, countries there are very strict regulations. So the uh, foreign broadcasters who do propaganda they are blocked. But we do not have uh, regulations here in Armenia. And as for the fourth uh, issue is the self-regulation. Self-regulation mechanism sounds very good. It's very important. It reduces the intervention of the uh, state, but it doesn't work in Armenia. Before self-regulation, we have to learn to regulate and then allow them to self allow the media to self-regulate. Uh, we don't, uh, uh, yes, uh, leave self-regulation up to the drivers, right? The drivers cannot, can do not actually gather and say, you know, I uh, did a violation. There is a police. There is the police which um, holds them holds them accountable. So the same should be done in our sector. And the opposition and the ruling power, they will sometimes find common language, they will fight against each other, uh, and it actually impacts our in-depth um, value system. It actually distorts our ideas of the world. And I think that these issues need urgent addressing. We can have theoretical talks about democracy, how the good the democracy and freedom of speech are. But in such crisis situations that are, have been accompanying Armenia for already the third year, it's the COVID-19. You can't imagine how much disinformation there was about COVID-19 in Armenia. Have we ever counted on how many deaths have been caused by this information because uh, uh, the med medmen were allowed to talk about uh, talk uh, stupid things about the copy with 19 that covid 19 does not exist uh, that uh, it's done by um, 
conspiracy theories, etc. Uh, so we actually uh, appealed to the prosecutor's office and said there are uh, certain basis, grounds for initiating a criminal case, but that we were rejected. Is it democracy? No, I think this is anarchism. And uh, as for the war, uh, the pre-election campaign, which was the dirtiest one in the whole history of Armenia, we actually co continue to talk about it all the time. But uh, hate speech continues to grow while we talk here. We need very specific steps and in very short period. Uh, I'm sorry for such a uh, sad uh, registration of uh, things. Thank you, Mr. Hakopian. Thank you, Mr. Hakopian, for raising such important issues and from such a perspective which also gives rise to discussions. And I'm glad that our next uh, speaker is uh, Ms. Nunes Sarkisyan from Media, Media Initiative Center, the founder who has been in the uh, media field and the, the pioneer of the development of media field. And I would like to uh, and like her to address these issues. The question, where is uh, the border? Where is the limit uh, of uh, protecting democracy from uh, these uh, attacks? And, and not only in terms of the disinformation, but also false narratives, the spread of false narratives, which are more deeply distorting the public perceptions in general. And also, uh, where is the limit, where is the border of um, protection of right to speech, right of expression? Uh, it is not only by laws that uh, the solutions may be provided, but the mentality has to change. But before achieving the change of mentality, maybe we should, uh, we need uh, strict uh, restrictions uh, to contribute to this change in mentality. These are discussions which uh, have to be discussed extensively, but maybe we need um, faster uh, solutions, please. Yes, it's maybe symbolic uh, that uh, I am here today with my old uh, friend and opponent, Mr. Tigran Hakopian, because our debate is endless and but I think it actually brings to uh, constructive conclusions. And I really hope that uh, at some point we will come to certain solutions, especially in case of uh, audiovisual media. My colleagues uh, uh, during the whole course of day, they uh, said a lot of important things because uh, media has a, a big role at different levels of democracy and people attach a lot of importance to it. People are convinced that uh, uh, can, they can be media people. But in this digital era, maybe that's the case. Maybe any pe people very often can become media people. Both uh, social figures, political figures, students, they can become uh, media media people and we have been using this uh, claim uh, for years but I will now go back to this information because in some cases when uh, I, of course I'm an oppositionary but I have uh, I'm more for softer approaches because I maybe believe in realistic approaches when we uh, talk about this information uh, well knowing the history to a certain extent uh, and irrespective of the fact which country it is which uh, a geopolitical area it is we know that uh, this information has always been part of the human civilization. We can bring the example of Daniel Defoe. According to legends, uh, he was mainly uh, publishing fake information in his media, and uh, it has become a way to have political influence, to earn money. And of course, we do not uh, evade this realization, and Armenia can also be, uh, cannot stay out of it. Uh, 
and including the post, like all the post-Soviet countries, which have very rich uh, cultures, uh, uh, traditions of disinformation. So the whole Soviet information field, of course, not a hundred percent. There were some good journalists, uh, some positive cases, but as an overall ob ob uh, ob uh, concept, uh, it was uh, based on this information, not necessarily fake news, but different methods of uh, disinformation by using different tools. Uh, do we suffer from the illusion that these 30 years, which have been very contradictory for the Armenian history and including for the history of the media, uh, have we been able to break these traditions? Um, So have we been able to break the approaches of the political institutions, state institutions, and on the other hand, the expectations of the society? Of course not. Naturally, we live uh, in a field of uh, immense uh, disinformation, taking into account that disinformation intensifies when we uh, witness different kind of clashes and conflicts. And this, in these 30 years, this conflicts and clashes have been endless uh, in terms of elections, in terms of wars, internal political clashes in the country, to some extent cultural clashes. And very often we had uh, certain clashes with our country, not necessarily physically uh, in, uh, as wars, but information wars. And of course it gives rise to disinformation. How to f well, and I also wanted to add one thing. Um, I'm not. I'm not going to say a new thing. I don't. Uh, I don't think that there are is, uh, one person in the hall that thinks uh, that our concern uh, is not related to the living in an era, a digital era, era because this information is not only now. Uh, created by uh, our leaders, but any person. So any person can spread this information in uh, the 21st century. And of course, the risks are exacerbated by, uh, based on this circumstance. And here we can also talk both on, uh, about political influences and uh, certain ambitions of uh, the individual to become a newsmakers, yes, so-called newsmakers. Of course, we are mostly under political uh, disinformation. Well, if we try to draw parallels between uh, disinformation and COVID, this uh, word infodemics uh, sound resonated with me. And I would like to come back to this uh, concept infodemics. What is happening to us is infodemics. We have a virus which is uh, everywhere and uh, is an integral part of our information field. And uh, in order to continue, I would like to say, do we need a vaccination or do we need treatment? So what a, vac what a vaccine is for me is the laws. What is treatment are the values. The treatment are the values. And uh, well, to decide whether through laws we can try to restrict uh, or uh, stop this information, in my opinion, not fully, not completely. Of course, uh, to some extent, we we might take certain constructive steps, but to have uh, total influence on it, it is impossible. As an example, I would like to m uh, mention uh, the steps that the state institutions tried to implement. Maybe they had uh, th did it for a good purpose. And it, it, they did it both uh, during the COVID-19 and during the war. But we saw that uh, all this disinformation and media and and, uh, and this this uh, this concealing of the information did not affect posit uh, our society positively, and. And it was actually done by all the media resources, concealing information during the war. And uh, irrespective, the, the, 
they were actually part of, of uh, they might be uh, victims to restrictions or they might be participants in propaganda. And I agree with Mr. Gabrielian on how we should fight against this information. Of course, we should do it through information. So how, what do we understand under uh, this uh, sentence? It is also a matter of discussion, but uh, there are different means of commu uh, ways of communication. And there are uh, um, certain means of communication that are absent among different uh, uh, sectors of the society. We can call it a, a gap, communication gap or communication conflicts. This can may, might be both uh, political uh, or it might be a clash between the society and the state, the ruling power or the opposition or the ruling power or within the society or within the media. And that's the most painful thing for me, taking into uh, account uh, my uh, professional activity of dozens of years and so I have never seen such internal intolerance within the media film in all my life. Uh, the media actually initiate criminal case, uh, court cases against each other and I had never witnessed such a sad situation in my professional activity. I think many of my colleagues share my concerns. Well, uh, what's the uh, way out for me? Um, it might be difficult and it might take long time, but I think that general education, overall education, uh, and I think that education is in crisis in our country. And if we are not able to regulate issues with regard to education, uh, it would be naive to think that we would solve the issues regarding disinformation. And uh, coming back to COVID and infodemic, uh, people very often forget about scientific developments, centuries old scientific de developments. They just tried to became very, tried to believe in uh, strange advice, strange opinions. And I can bring in numerous examples, uh, but I want to spare your time. And uh, media literacy is an important component uh, of uh, this endeavor. So Media Initiative Center uh, has uh, been dealing with media literacy projects uh, for years, but it cannot be just no, uh, part of non-formal education. It should be actually part of the education system system in the country and I'm very happy that the Ministry of Education is finally uh, trying to implement uh, certain um, uh, project, uh, to try to introduce certain media literacy schools, uh, but it, this is done very slowly and digital transformations and developments take uh, are much more rapid. We should modernize the sector. The last thing is about fact-checking pr uh, uh, platforms and fact-checking as a phenomenon. You know that very often we also, uh, you know that we also do fact checking and uh, FIPAM, uh, fact investigation platform also, had uh, CivilNet do uh, fact uh, checking and th this has actually become a separate genre and we really now f thankfully have a separate genre, separate direction in the media, the fact checking direction, but we forget that it is actually uh, an essential part of uh, media. We, can, we should not publish anything without checking. Uh, I, uh, we don't like to bring the example of BBC, but I remember that my uh, BBC partners were actually uh, telling that during the recent uh, revolutionary movements in Iran, the recent years, unless they checked uh, information from four sources on what happened, they would never publish it unless they checked it from four sources. That's a very small example, but I do realize that it is very strongly linked uh, to the resources the media possess, the scarcity of resources, scarcity of human resources, uh, lack of knowledge, lack of knowledge circulation, lack of time of, uh, that the media have. 
and uh, because of this uh, overloadedness of the media and the editors and the journalists, uh, we have this situation. Of course, these are serious issues that need to be addressed because they lead to the economic situation in the country, etc. And maybe I would like to already stop here. And if you have any further questions, I will later respond to them. Thank you. Thank you. Media literacy is a fun is one of the fundamental remedies, but uh, it is a long term solution which will not give uh, outcomes in the short term. I'm sorry for making a change in, uh, in the format of our discussion because Mr. Gabrielian has to leave early. But nevertheless, I would like to go back to my uh, initial claim that there have been problematic changes in the law. And I would like to address that so that there is uh, no miscommunication. I am speaking about the criminalization of uh, severe insults and uh, if there is a consensus uh, among uh, the civil society organizations that this is a uh, pr this is problematic freedom house also holds this approach and mainly the this um, there is a, a problem with the legal cl clearness certainty of this law and um, it has no uh, impact on the prevention of uh, f spread of uh, false information. And I, th I think that after the law uh, came into effect, there has been 800 criminal cases, which I think is uh, problematic. And I think we should look for other uh, solutions, uh, maybe again restrictive, but not criminalizing and not at least um, uh, the law enforcement uh, system that we have at the moment is going to have uh, serious uh, consequences. Thank you. Uh, if you allow me, I will be brief. I have been here. Uh, I was one of the first people who has been here. Uh, you mentioned Freedom House. For me personally, it will be interesting to hear from the representatives of the Freedom House uh, when you say when you criticize this law. Please uh, bring the examples um, uh, of uh, three countries uh, uh, besides Germany and other countries. I can say that. Uh, there are the same formulations, and I am interested. I wonder how this is problematic in Armenia, but in many uh, European countries, uh, the uh, severe insults are criminalized. If you can uh, convince me of the opposite, I will work on that direction, and we will uh, see how we can change it, because I have been in a part of the discussions of the law. I mentioned Germany and France, where uh, the severe insults are criminalized. Uh, I think uh, there are. Uh, 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 I mentioned that many European regulations cannot be applicable to Armenia, considering the Armenian enforcement practice uh, and the serious. I agree with Mr. Sakuns when he says that there is no Armenian democracy. There is democracy, if there is, but we have to clearly understand that our democracy in Armenia is not well established, and democratic institutions are not well established in Armenia. But when someone criticizes me, I read uh, the reports and I want to understand what the cause is, what is the reason that, uh, for example, I in uh, Germany, uh, severe insults are restricted and criminalized. But in Armenia, they have to be decriminalized. Mark? This. Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't want to hear now, but I am interested in general. I am aware that there are some countries where severe insults are criminalized. And that's why. Ms. Sarksian would like to respond, Mr. Melikan and Mark, uh, if you would like to comment. Very briefly, I don't want to speak extensively because this has been discussed extensively. I would like to address the 
um, minutes uh, the memorandum that Mr. Gabrielian said. I am glad that we have achieved a signature of such a uh, document. But I want to state that, from my perspective, this there. This is a consensus about consensus, so we are trying to come to a platform where we can uh, discuss uh, certain developments. And uh, what we are talking now uh, are real, the problems related to the to the to some laws uh, have been part of our discussions, and uh, this uh, field of discussions in recent years has been narrowed, even uh, if not to say they are absent. And the purpose of discussions is uh, to adopt, no, to not adopt any single law, uh, to exclude a law without understanding how, what uh, kind of uh, media field we are going to have and where we are headed this much. Thank you. I would like to uh, comment on the issue of severe insults and defamation. I would like to familiarize with the German legislation, but there are some issues with the uh, law. First of all, it is not defined what a severe insult is, and the law enforcement bodies are deprived. Who says? that it is not defined. I understand. I, I remember very well what uh, severe insult is, how it is defined. Uh, what do you mean uh, should be defined? It is clearly stated, and it is not only my opinion. It uh, is in conformity with the Constitution. Uh, so it uh, says that insult is um, uh, a curse of sexual nature. If there is a person who doesn't know what sexual nature is, uh, I will not uh, believe it. Uh, uh, we all know what it is, uh, but we don't express it. So w what else should there be that is not there? According to OSC norms and standards, uh, Armenia has uh, international commitments. And I think that the OSC representative will um, uh, assure, conf uh, conform confirm that uh, our, it doesn't derive of the Armenian commitments or the law enforcement practice of the judiciary also states in many norms that the laws that are uh, that uh, give uh, additional security to public officials do not derive from the European uh, uh, Human uh, Rights Court. Um, because when you assume a post, it assumes, it implies that you have to be subject to severe criticism and uh, this severe criticism, but you're interpreting it wrongly. Miss uh, Abramian, uh, out of 800 cases Miss Abramian mentioned, uh, only 20 were addressed uh, to public officials and the 700 are addressed to citizens. Uh, this is, uh, it is not for the, uh, but the decisions, what about the decisions of the uh, courts? 650 were addressed to citizens, not public officials. I think when we regularly speak about the laws that need to be discussed with the CSOs, it implies that they need to mutually listen to each other. And both local and international organizations have called for cancelling the law. Because uh, I, um, almost everybody thinks that it doesn't derive from the committee commitments of the of Armenia international commitments. Uh, 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 you don't admit that the prob uh, that uh, the law is problematic. Yesterday we spoke up with our colleagues and of, uh, from the Ministry of Justice, and they assured that after the new code, uh, criminal code, comes into force, it will not be uh, supplemented with uh, this provision. And we hope that the National Assembly will hear um, the criticism of our local organizations and international organizations and the memorandum that was, uh, uh, and uh, you will um, follow the memorandum that was signed. It is not me who says it. When we say demo democratic Armenia, I mean 
also the role of the constitutional court. I, I'm saying that the constitutional court has uh, stated very recently that it is uh, in coherence with uh, the, the co co constitution and there is no fundamental rights violation in uh, this provision. And uh, the uh, chief uh, in uh, prosecutor has also mentioned that uh, including this provision uh, was uh, temporary because we had uh, come to a situation where uh, curses uh, were very widely ap applied and it was a public uh, risk, a public threat, and um, the state uh, can punish uh, the public threats by criminalizing them. And uh, the prosecutor also mentioned that m uh, in two years, m maybe let's objectively view uh, this uh, in the rallies and uh, the, uh, um, the, the uh, curses of sexual nature have um, have disappeared maybe in two years or three years when there is uh, when everything is calmer is quiet we can start debating around ideas and and obviously this uh, provision will disappear will be cancelled as many norms in the criminal code uh, have uh, been uh, cancelled because they don't uh, pose a public threat. Uh, not to disturb the format of the forum, let's give uh, the floor to Mr. Melikan and uh, give him an opportunity not to be late of uh, your next commitment. Of course, I don't want uh, to take uh, much time from Mr. Gabrielian, but I would like to mention that uh, when uh, you're preparing the bills, uh, it would be great f to first uh, send it to international organizations for their expertise and after that adopt the law and not do it vice versa. Yes, adopt the law and then uh, get some criticism for the and opinion from the Freedom House, the Council of Europe, about their conformity to international standards. And uh, talking about this uh, notorious law, I have to mention that there is a provision that if it was sent to the Council of Europe, that would definitely get a negative opinion and conclusion from the Council of Europe. It's that the state officials, political figures, um, uh, that are subjected to insult and curse, they are actually basically more protected based on their activity. The punishment is uh, stricter than in case of uh, ordinary citizens. If you remember the law in detail, then you will uh, agree with me that there is such a provision. And uh, I think that in order uh, we this, we signed this memorandum in order to make these relevant corrections. And uh, your team members were telling us, you know, Armenia is not Sweden, uh, that uh, we should uh, ban anonymous, uh, using anon uh, the possibility of uh, anonymous sources. But when it came to the council, went to the Council of Europe, uh, they said no. Let's use them, let them use the sources, but take the liability on themselves. That's what we actually suggested from uh, the beginning to you. But it took one year so that we could achieve it. Uh, I think that such debates uh, and discussions uh, will not um, happen if uh, the three parties. Uh, keep conform to the requirements of the memorandum. There is another uh, remark. Uh, I don't uh, want uh, to restrict uh, anyone's uh, speech, so I will just give you the, f the floor to you as well. Uh, I'm a reference to, uh, to Deputy Prime Minister. When I worked in uh, the Human Rights Defender's Office, when it came to our office for uh, our opinion, uh, 
I was actually the one who participated in providing an opinion on this uh, draft. We should actually uh, mention that no international organization uh, had any recommendation on uh, criminalization of the insult. Uh, we actually had a protocol that refers uh, to defamation, uh, to the criminalization of defamation, that is criminalizing it, but not uh, arresting a person. So we can... Uh, so we, criminalization of uh, insult and uh, defamation can take place, but ca there cannot be arrest for um, defamation. And so the Constitutional Court recently has uh, published its ruling on this matter. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Gabrielian, thank you very much for the participation. I hope uh, that our cooperation with international uh, partners is going to be continuous and our mm, memorandum will be adhered to. Uh, sorry that we started a bit late. Uh, and Mr. Karapetian, I would like to give the floor to you. Please, you are mostly welcome. And I think that we will address this uh, discussion again. But now you are representing the fast fact investigation platform. And in this regard, you are doing an Im crucial work. Uh, but we have to highlight that in general, in all over the world, many research, many studies have uh, shown and uh, recorded that fake news at least Ten are uh, uh, spread ten times faster and have a bigger impact than uh, refuting them and clarifying them. And in this case, what tools are there to employ for fact checking? Mr. Gabrielan also said that here the information vacuum. Uh, should be not created and uh, the strategic communication has to be implemented timely and to timely provide information not to create disinformation. I would like to speak about this. What are the solutions actually? Thank you. I, in Gen reality, we are. We seem to be tired because it is the end of the day. But the episode uh, that was earlier is very important in the context of my speech because I was going to speak about the commitment of the authorities and how democratic authorities uh, 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 counteract uh, some security challenges when they are faced with them and how they choose uh, closing up, closing down and giving in rather than opening up because I have a text uh, prepared and in order to spare your time, I will try to uh, s uh, read it f uh, quickly. Let me start with a memory which has uh, something to do with our today's um, uh, discussion from uh, 11 years ago in Norway when extreme nationalist Andreas Breivik shot dead dozens of people as a sign of protest to his government's immigration policies and multicultural values. It happened so that a few weeks after the terrorist attack, the Norwegian foreign minister came to Armenia and I, as a journalist accredited to his press conference, had the opportunity to ask a question to the minister. I asked how Norway reacted to Breivik's terrorism, whether security restrictions would not be imposed on its country for security reasons or whether immigration policy would be reviewed or tightened. To, view, to which the minister replied that his country would not only not restrict the freedoms of the people after the terrorist attack, but on the contrary, it has responded with a more open and more liberal policy. This is the response of a country with a stable democratic tradition at the forefront on all scales. Uh, to the challenges of strengthening security without restricting democratic freedoms. And what 
did we do, or rather, what did our government do, which has declared the path of democratic development in the face of security threats in the last year and a half? We cannot deny that the Velvet Revolution of 2020, uh, 2018 really brought us freedoms that we have hardly had at any time in our history. And uh, for us, the media, it, w it first of all meant a completely new situation in the field of freedom of uh, the press and speech, uh, much higher accountability of state institutions, much more accessible officials, starting from the country's top official, the prime minister, who regularly gave several hour press conferences to various ranks of officials and politicians who freely expressed their views on various platforms. And also, which I especially consider important, they were debating with each other live. And journalists. Uh, the situation started to go in the opposite direction after the catastrophic war of 2020, especially due to the internal unrest that followed and the aggressive mood at a large part of the opposition. It was uh, during this period that a term appeared that, in my opinion, describes uh, the situation quite accurately, a media terror. I was um, a public servant, uh, the spokesperson of the mayor at that time, and I remember well uh, that I felt the blows of that media terror on my skin when literally out of blue a horrible misinformation could spread on a telegram channel of unknown origin and irritate the already irritated nerves and to provoke tremor in the country. And unfortunately, the government reacted by giving in to this uh, situation and instead of being more open, more accountable, the current government prevent, preferred to close down, to renounce a number of freedoms given to the press after the revolution. And uh, we spoke uh, a lot about this in the hall. I think most of the people sitting here know that uh, the restricting of the movement of journalists in the territory of a National Assembly sharply raising the thresholds for compensation uh, for slander and insult. Uh, the, this uh, infamous uh, regulation about defamation, uh, they also tightened the accredi accreditation procedure, criminalized uh, serious insults, etc. So, uh, th Officials began to communicate much less with the public, and I will bring several uh, numbers, uh, which was uh, ba which is based on analysis made made by Fact Investigation Platform. In uh, 2020, Pashinyan gave 17 interviews. In 2009, uh, 34 in 2020, and in 2021, only 20 interviews, which is uh, almost about seven times less than last year. Of course, the abundance of interviews in 2020 was mainly due to the war. That is, most of the interviews took place during the war. Nevertheless, the sharp decline in number is obvious. During the first two years of his tenure, Pashinyan had six big press conferences. This is uh, this uh, uh, creates nostalgia uh, um, with me and my colleagues, where. Uh, all the more or less known mass media of the country were present and had the opportunity to ask questions. And there were five, six hour press conferences and uh, six such uh, press conferences took place during two years. Meanwhile, during 2021, no pre press conference of such a format took, took place. In the second half of the 2021, there was only one or two press conference in brackets without the participation of journalists where uh, the questions were edited by the prime minister's staff and after that read by the inter interviewer. In 2020, the Prime Minister had 20 briefings uh, and after 2020, none. Uh, so these are telling numbers and I presented only some statistics uh, from the Prime Minister's media activity. But we can imagine that the activity of the other officials, ministers, deputies and others has sig significantly decreased as well.
not only uh, the quali quantitative uh, activity, but also qualitative activity, because many public officials give in interviews who are loyal to the ruling party. And uh, the opposition figures, on the contrary, they gave interviews in their own media in a comfortable environment. And the debate and sharp issues, uh, if not to say are completely gone, or have significantly dis decreased. This is, I think, a very bad tendency and a very bad response to media terror and disinformation, which uh, is um, explained by security threats. Another unacceptable um, phenomena, I regret that Mr. Gabrielian left because he said that uh, this information has to be responded with, uh, mis uh, with information. I greet that uh, slogan, but uh, in reality, we have the opposite tendency. Uh, the uh, the um, authorities have started uh, fighting against disinformation with their own disinformation. They, uh, the uh, public officials dissatisfied with uh, uh, biased media have themselves started to grow disinformation factories. Uh, months ago, Narek Martirosyan uh, investigated for Infocom and found out that there were several fake websites registered under the name of Tarun Chahoyan, Deputy Chief of Staff of the Prime Minister, which regularly spread disinformation about political opponents. This is a most noteworthy circumstance because Mr. Chahoyan has recently started to position himself in the media field as an official speaker, as an unofficial speaker of the Prime Minister. And it is also a fact that the disinformation uh, generated by those fake websites is regularly spread by the media outlets connected with the NA president, with the deputies, or by the f uh, by the f uh, media that belong to the family of the prime minister. This is not my judgment. This is at least a well-known fact and a uh, in the journalistic community. And I do not think that such a way of working benefits a country that has declared democracy as a brand, at least from the point of view of strengthening democratic traditions. What should be done to sum up? Uh, what should be done uh, to develop the level of media literacy of the society? And uh, this is a process, and the state has a commitment here uh, to develop uh, it the um, sub respective subjects in schools and also the regulation bodies uh, both uh, out of court and in the court to develop uh, the regulation practices and I think uh, we are trying to create uh, as many precedents as possible. We apply uh, f about um, uh, information uh, debates of different political officials. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Karabedian. Uh, you really made very important remarks, especially representing what kind of a regression we have. Thank you for the figures and numbers. We have to deal with them. We have to address them. We have to assess them properly so that uh, later we can overcome um, these issues. And I wouldn't like to exploit your patience. And now I would like to give the floor to questions. Please introduce yourselves and try to speak as briefly as possible and uh, formulate your co uh, question or remark within one minute. On the left side, please. And then is um, the lady at the end. And then Mr. Melikan. So please provide the microphone. We remember that in the pre-election campaign, Media AM cooperated with uh, the Georgian media field. And uh, so it was possible to, 
to eliminate uh, this information and fake news, they were actually labeling it after the checking the um, uh, fake news. So how can uh, the state agencies, ca can the state agencies also cooperate with this Facebook tool? Because it actually had a very positive impact on reducing this information and fake news on Facebook. Of course, there were certain uh, complaints by different organizations, but it was a tool that had impact. Uh, is it not possible to do it, or there is no uh, willingness to do that? Well, uh, I try not to speak on that topic, but uh, I can't avoid it. I think it's very important. Could you just present yourself, uh, introduce yourself? I just wanted to make sure uh, that I know you. You know very well what uh, happened. I should remind uh, that Media AAM, Media Initiative uh, Centers, with its uh, Media AAM project, has been cooperating with uh, our Georgian partners, who in their turn cooperated with uh, Facebook, uh, that is, third party independent fact checking. Uh, software and that uh, project actually took only two uh, months that it's only a two month project and it didn't continue we do not mind continuing it, but if you remember, uh, we also had a meeting. You were present at that uh, discussion, if I'm not mistaken. We have to be this uh, members of the IFC, which is a fact check international fact checking platform, and uh, their fact. Uh, checkers can uh, cooperate with them. If I'm not mistaken, you are pro Mr. Garabetian's uh, platform is going to apply to become members. We are also preparing to, pre uh, an uh, to introduce an application. And this is a process. And un unless this process is over, we cannot do it um, directly. But I'm very happy that we are having this discussion. We can. Uh, actually talk about it uh, later as well. But overall, I think that Facebook uh, and um, the whole communication uh, with Facebook is a major issue, not only in Armenia, but in a number of countries, and uh, especially in countries who are, which are small and are not able to have these direct contacts with these uh, large enterprises. And um, this information that is filtered um, uh, due to fact-checking uh, activities, and the information, this news were labeled due to fact uh, checking activities. They had actually the possibility to directly apply and, uh, pro, uh, and it, uh, complain about uh, and submit a complaint about it. Uh, well, sometimes there was this issue of both the de desire and willingness and lack of also lack of capacities. Very often we tried to help people, but we didn't uh, achieve the aim. Maybe it was done on purpose so that these issues are not uh, solved. Uh, you know that as a result, we are now in undergoing trials. We are uh, uh, in the criminal proceeding, uh, pr uh, court proceedings are taking place. And I think it's a strategical litigation process. Uh, and, but coming back to Facebook, I would like to say that there is a um, serious, uh, there are serious issues with uh, Facebook, uh, with communication with Facebook and other major platforms. And uh, coming back to the idea of uh, having a media field development concept at the end of the. Year, here. Mr. Melikian is also here, Mike Par or one of our partners. I think we should think also about uh, digital, the so-called uh, creation of the uh, institution of the digital um, ambassador, which will allow us to be more engaged in the with um, better engaged with the activity of this um, large uh, digital uh, platforms. Uh, uh, 
and so that uh, we could at least affect the decision making that refers to our uh, country. I hope I re responded to your question. Yes, yeah, so legislation. It is true that um, the European Court of Human Rights uh, has some case law which uh, does not find a violation in cases when people are jailed for grave insults. But this is very controversial and very unpredictable uh, case law by the court that has been highly criticized. And also what is established in the case law of the court is that if uh, a public official is gravely insulted during the course of um, any public activities and uh, discharging of their public duties, their degree of tolerance should be very high and it would be very rare for the court to find any violation. Therefore, I would strongly disagree with the suggestion that this law is compatible with the freedom of expression. And then also to mention that in fragile democracies like ours, uh, by our some I mean Georgias and Armenias, it's um, very problematic to jail people for that. And then I think we should also within the civil society look into not only some standards established in some older jurisdictions, older democracies, or some controversial case law of the European Court, but also emerging standards, which we can find with the UN special procedures, for example, and guide ourselves with more advanced standards where they try to push away from such approach. Such approach. Thank you much uh, really very interesting and that's what I mentioned that this we have fragile democracy and in this case it's really controversial to have this uh, law uh, next question mr. Melikian please Can you hear my voice? Oh, well, I have a very short comment uh, because uh, the reference uh, to the constitutional court ruling is becoming fashionable, that uh, it is uh, normal to uh, criminalize uh, insult. I don't want to us to speculate on this uh, issue. We know that during these 30 years, uh, the constitutional court has made different rulings based on different political contexts. Texts. And even with regard to this issue, the constitutional, um, this uh, the highest uh, the th threshold for a penalty of uh, uh, the insult uh, of the, for, for the grave insult, they actually also agreed with the increasing this uh, threshold. And one of the provisions of this uh, constitutional court ruling said that, uh, before that uh, the co compensation should be in an amount to in, uh, that will not cause shock to the uh, defender. So actually, these two decisions of the Constitutional Court, they contradict to each other. As the political situation changes, uh, the rulings of the Constitutional Court uh, really also change. So I don't consider the ruling of the Constitutional Court as a serious uh, evidence and uh, argument and uh, the three countries that have been mentioned by the representative of uh, the ruling power I can actually bring more examples two thirds of the OSC countries have uh, kept this criminalization they have not decriminalized it because uh, they don't need it there is no need for it uh, and uh, they don't. This uh, provision is not used. It might not be used even for dozens of years. They they just don't uh, take the pain to decriminalize it. And uh, developed democratic countries try to uh, have a new approach uh, for newly emer emerging democracies, saying that you know you can exploit it. And we know that uh, the prime minister, when the prime minister 
was an editor-in-chief of a newspaper. He was actually uh, used a formulation how degenerates appear in state agencies. Actually, a criminal case was initiated against him back when he was uh, an editor-in-chief. And uh, due to the intervention of international organizations, it was this case was terminated. Of course, we think about uh, legislative regulations, but we shouldn't um, overestimate it recently. I had a number of interviews with uh, international experts, and I would just uh, I would like to mention one thing. When I was talking with the Lithuanian expert, and I was asking them, "Well, how, where have you achieved? What have, have you achieved in the fight against fake uh, users and disinformation?" They said, "He said, you know, we actually do, are not going to regulate this uh, stupid uh, information." It is considered that uh, each person ha can uh, just uh, 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 say stupid things, and uh, you should just create an environment in which uh, people are able to distinguish uh, this uh, uh, foolish information from real information. It's, of course, a very complicated uh, endeavor, but we should be very active. Uh, we should be engaged more actively. It's more about uh, literacy of uh, the person and media literacy of the person. So why we doesn't uh, self-regulation work in our context for a very simple reason. As our, my interviews showed, uh, the, the law actually acts separately on its own, and self-regulation acts uh, on, on its own. Uh, uh, in the, we, we actually tried to unite it in the law on audiovisual um, media, but it's kind of a very fragmented uh, attempt. And the international uh, experience shows that we should create a regulation or self-regulation model in Armenia, where the legislative uh, regulation and the self-regulation should be uh, interrelated uh, mechanisms. Mr. Do you have? Do we have any comments with regard to what Mr. Melikian said? Uh, I said. I failed really twice, and I, I also want to follow up because, first of all, I'm German citizen, and I'm also representing this. And and I was really, when this was raised, this is defamation. I was really thinking the whole time. So when was there a case that this was really put into practice, this defamation law? And I think I I finally found a case, and I, I think it confirms a bit what you said. I think it was a case of uh, of of a politician, Renate Künast, who. Uh, uh, yes, this is what uh, this is what the speaker said. Um, there might be there might be there might be some words or something that has go belong, but it's really really rarely impl uh, implemented, and she really had to fight long to uh, to get it. It's really one one tries to one tries to avoid it, and it, it was also raised uh, by the colleague from uh, from from Georgia. Um, it is expected that people, public uh, public people, uh, must endure uh, must endure a certain uh, a, a attack. Uh, so these um, and and also from observing this discussion, I think yes. So it is easy to say Germany has it or France has it or there is the European Court, but there is the local context, right? And I mean, you bring example. You you all have a have a. History. You started already with saying, "Oh, I had this discussion," and this is, of course, then difficult coming from looking at the international perspective to say, "Yes, okay, we have it," but, and um, and the discussion, for instance, in Germany would be different in this case because, of course, also Germany is a bigger country. There, there's more institutions. Uh, there is more other regulations. So, what is when when you talk about these? these laws or, or giving an example and taking it out of a context where, where everything else is, is, is different, yes? But just to say, okay, this country has it and this is allowed, we are allowed to have it too. Uh, and, uh, and I think it was also raised, of course, uh, this is also, there's also a lot of critique. So what, what you are exchanging, this is of course
also also the case in, in Germany, and this is what the people also have to tolerate and, and in other countries. So, yes, and, and I still think that when, uh, when, laws are, um, when laws are looked critically, one really has to say maybe this is a law, but, but is everything around is available to, to avoid abuse. Of, 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 of such a law. And this has to be, I, I think this always has to be respected when, when we talk about regulation and what is the negative consequence about it, yes? So is this abuse and, and this is really prevent. So this politician, I think it didn't help her much. So she, she, she fought, I think she fought five years and everybody knows about it. But did it prevent, did it prevent uh, an, uh, our current foreign minister from it? Did it prevent others from, from being abused? No, it didn't. I, I think they all face uh, they all face the same. This is nothing to stop uh, to stop defamation. So, thanks. Self regulation has to be supplemented, combined with uh, some elements of regulation, but not in any case. We can say that if there is no uh, regulation, there must be no self-regulation. This is a complex procedure process because this is linked with the whole field uh, because it, uh, the field has to be established and it has to be a collaborative and professional field where it would be interesting for people to discuss also professional issues. But in any case, this road, this path is very important because it creates a serious responsibility. Uh, law and regulation uh, are, should be based on your values and your professional approaches. And the second one I w think well, I would like to say is when fact-checking and media literacy and such mechanisms of education are in place, we have to think about what uh, values underlie them, because all these approaches and mechanisms, whatever you may call, can become a tool of disinformation. And in this regard, we have to be very careful, because such we have observed such cases and precedents all over the world and in Armenia, so uh, we shouldn't uh, fall from one extreme to another, but this is a hard road and I think uh, that in some sense uh, fact-checking is self-regulation for me, is a path to self-regulation. Thank you. And by the way, I uh, such uh, fact-checking platforms have been established in Armenia, which already uh, generate uh, additional disinformation. So, um, next question, uh, Sarkisyan Janna, journalist, educator, pedagogue. I would like to say that if your speech about is about a state agency, the SNCO, no, you are not talking about the SNCO. I would like to build up on what Jacob said, that um, there could be no fight against fake uh, factories with another fake factory, and uh, the, we need to have crystal clear uh, institution which uh, w everyone will trust, and um, rumors, and there will be no rumors or um, slenders around it because we know that fakes are grown for different uh, purposes by different uh, institutions and it is the field is well uh, studied examined and uh, there are uh, stories about different peoples and uh, opinions are generated about people and fight against it has to be f uh, waged uh, with the with full force and we don't have um, such tools um, at the administrative level to fight against it. And uh, the second issue that I have um, faced uh, in the schools about media literacy is uh, just an uh, integrated lesson. And as a pedagogue working in different schools with different uh, classes, uh, children, the level, media literacy level is very low. and. Uh, uh, 
it is not efficient. I know that Media Initiative Se uh, Center has uh, created manuals for pedagogues and um, uh, media literacy guidelines uh, for pedagogues, but knowledge is not sufficient and m a lot of work has to be done. But uh, by the way, you didn't mention that it is good that they are in place. It is uh, slow. It is good that the standards are in place and they are integrated to some extent, but the uh, process is very slow. But you didn't say that it is very good that they are there. But we need to study how efficient they are. And uh, according to my observations, they haven't been very efficient. Thank you. Thank you, Arnold Belean, for the country uh, party representative. I want to address my question to Mr. Tigran Hakopian. Uh, after the uh, during the, after the war of Artsakh, a hybrid war followed, and today's opposition, so-called oppositions, the street opposition is uh, the result of it. And at the same time, uh, the so-called lack of inform informed uh, citizens uh, are uh, victims uh, to Russian inform informative special operations. And uh, this is especially very sensitive uh, for the people uh, in the Marses, in the regions outside Yerevan. For example, they know that there is no Ukraine uh, uh, and uh, the West has uh, destroyed it because they haven't received a counter argument, a second source of information. I understand that we're restricted by, uh, by in terms of the broadcast of uh, of some media outlets, but can we at least restrict one Russian language? Uh, can we uh, broadcast one Russian language uh, media outlet to receive other sources of information? And at the same time, uh, according to after the recent changes, CNN was uh, dis disappeared, and uh, after that, an impression was uh, was created that in English uh, speakers uh, did not have the opportunity to receive uh, uh, news in English. Okay, but they are all mutually connected. And the next thing is uh, I want to understand whether there are regulations. I understand that uh, many Armenian language uh, media outlets translate from Russians, but they use the same terminology which is accepted in that country. And I understand that we are restricted uh, to use uh, a Ukrainian war, the phrases Ukrainian war and Russian war. Uh, but can we at least not use uh, the term Russian special operation on TV or radio. What do you mean by saying restricted? So are we a part of the Russian Empire? Are we a region of the Russian Empire? Then why do I not hear the terms, the phrases that I just mentioned? At least we can uh, uh, mention the Russian-Ukrainian conflict term terminology. OK. I. We'll try to answer your question. And with this regard, I, we uh, y use the term of uh, Republic of uh, Southern Ossia. Is it based on a government uh, order? No, on, on the TV broadcasts. Every TV has its terminology. This is what I'm asking. Is there a regulation if the Armenian uh, Republic has not re recognized uh, the state of uh, uh, of Osea? Shall we uh, use the term of Republic of Osea? They, they are so self-proclaimed. We should use self-proclaimed. You raised uh, several topics. Uh, this is not related to me. Maybe others will respond, but I will briefly answer. First of all, foreign broadcasters, uh, which uh, 
bring a different uh, agenda to our uh, uh, media field. I started speaking about it several years ago. You remember it very, very well, and you remember the response of the Russian embassy. Uh, any uh, civil society organization which speaks about the trust of the society, and uh, none of them, uh, and more especially. Uh, no one uh, protected, backed the disposition of Tigran Hagopian. And uh, so this proposal to discuss, to uh, make it a topic of discussion in Armenia did n was not followed up. And the uh, question is not addressed correctly. We have nothing to do about this. And the rest, uh, the intergovernmental regulations, uh, the regulations in the Armenian media field is not related to our committee. We do not have the right to um, political initiatives and legal initiatives. And regarding its CNN, according to the law, neither U.S. Uh, government nor CNN have uh, expressed a desire to be in our digital multiplex. And uh, secondly, for five years, CNN rebroadcasting uh, company did not make payments for broadcasting. Uh, so uh, there was no profit. If not, there was damage. So CNN was only one of uh, the few uh, media outlets that were uh, broadcasting our media multiplex. So there is, they don't want. It is their right. So CNN is comprised of, uh, 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 is based on business models. It is not. A, it, it is just spreading information, and it is satisfied that uh, almost. Uh, it is present in almost all uh, network operators of Armenia. And secondly. We are an independent republic, and uh, the government, uh, based on its political liability and uh, different uh, d desires, different preferences of the country, they can use one term, term on, or another, and different broadcasters can use uh, different terms. Uh, those people who consider uh, that they should uh, use uh, the special operation, military operation by Russia, they use it. Uh, and this is what pluralism is. This is um, of freedom of speech is there is no regulation there can be no regulation and i think i didn't forget anything else no thank you you replied already I do understand that everyone is tired, so I will try to br uh, uh, be brief. This will be a more of a rhetoric question. I have the impression that when, uh, f uh, when I, for instance, try to uh, forget what happened uh, in the recent five years, we, uh, I have the impression that since 1991 we lived next to Belgium in a, uh, in a developed uh, country which is uh, on a plateau. And so all these uh, desires and uh, wishes are very important. Media literacy is very of crucial importance. And on my uh, side, I have uh, put efforts, and I will continue to put efforts for it to develop, but we actually live in a, in a, an era of force majeures. Uh, the COVID-19 has just uh, ended. The war uh, ended 1.5 uh, years ago, and after February 24, we actually opened our eyes to a more cruel world. and. 
I would like to ask my question, of course, my rhetorical question to Mr. Gabrielian, but who is not here anymore, but also to other uh, speakers uh, here. Don't we need to develop legislation that would refer to force majeure situations such as COVID-19, especially the war? Uh, the hazard of which uh, has not been fully implement eliminated. And in a period when uh, this information is this, uh, spreading at a rate, uh, at an incredible rate, and that incredible manif has in having incredible manifestations that they are just, uh, they can make the work of the media literacy of 10 years, and they can nullify it in only a few days. So this information is mostly uh, spread in these uh, um, force majeure situations. And uh, when Mr. Akopian was saying, yes, we should uh, count how many victims we had during the COVID-19 uh, due to this information. And we, might also, and we also have had victims uh, during the war due to uh, illiterate work of the media or due to evil propaganda, political uh, interests. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martirosian. I just want to add one thing that in the audiovisual uh, media, uh, there was some supplement made. Mr. Hakopian, do you have any comments or remarks in this uh, regard? Or maybe other speakers, do we actually need uh, to have uh, a s certain specific media regulation provisions during emergency situations? Maybe we could also make it a subject of discussion of this uh, current media uh, strategy. Yes, there is uh, a short provision, and uh, in that period, the media should be guided by the law on uh, by uh, the by the rules of the state of emergency or martial law. But in reality, as the COVID nineteen showed, uh, the the service of the commandant's office, the office of the commandant's office, uh, uh, it just uh, aroused the rage of the media and nothing else because uh, they didn't base uh, their uh, regulations based on evidence and, uh, and uh, so they, the only debate was uh, that TV hosts wear a mask uh, during the TV program, and which is something absurd. And we, I actually call it kitchen fight uh, against COVID. And after we uh, complained, these restrictions were lifted. And here the issue uh, is the ecosystem. That is, what model we should uh, employ in emergency situations, not only the committee, not only the commandant's office, the government, but also the society. What uh, system, what methodology should be applied? And it is very very difficult because I'm, I want to repeat myself. My, don't c accept my criticism uh, as something negative. Um, it, uh, uh, actually, uh, the freedom of uh, the speech. Yeah, it's uh, um, it, it, well. It, this assumption is based on uh, uh, the supposition that freedom of media is something sacred, but. Uh, of course, the definition of the freedom of uh, the speech should be de redefined in our uh, current realities, because uh, not the f not the freedom of speech is uh, actually put into risk, but the right of the people to get information is now under risk, because uh, uh, under the cover of. Uh, freedom of speech, people actually get this information and uh, that f financing and not 
the, and this is not regulated in uh, Armenia, and neither it is regulated in the whole world. Yes, we fall behind a little bit. Uh, we actually fight for what is technically almost solved now. It's very difficult to restrict freedom of uh, the speech. You close it in one place, then you listen it from another source. Uh, but what do we see? What do we hear? Uh, to what extent it actually impacts human consciousness, human psychology? Uh, our uh, national uh, identity, uh, our immune system. We should try to uh, grow. We should understand, uh, consider that. We should choose our models and not just uh, be based on a model that has been just proposed to us. Uh, we shouldn't just listen to what they say, they tell us from the outside and just apply it. Yeah, maybe we can uh, just uh, bring some foreigners and they will write the laws for us. Uh, so when we, you do not adapt these uh, suggestions, you actually increase the risks. That's the issue and it's actually a matter of serious discussion. You may not agree with me, but I'm saying what uh, is there. It's one of the elements of uh, the issues um, we face and we do not uh, discuss it because it's not fashionable to discuss it. Sorry for talking too much. Well, I would like to mention that although uh, I was not a proponent of wearing masks uh, in uh, during TV programs, well, uh, we were not the only country to have uh, this uh, requirement. Not only TV hosts, but everyone was wearing uh, mask masks. But this is just a short uh, remark. But what I wanted to say is, um, as a self, uh, as part of self-regulation, uh, maybe as a part of a mechanism of self-regulation, uh, we actually have uh, for a uh, uh, strategy for force majeure situations and certain provisions which can be useful. Thank you. Ms. You have some regulations. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so um, I, I can maybe also speak in two again with two hats. So the, the OECE, they, uh, they observed uh, that some states had uh, had put uh, take to co to COVID to to restrict access. And, and there was, it was criticized also uh, uh, when when the states did it because uh, and it later on also happened so when when you have this restriction it uh, again it was also this was taken as a pretext to 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 do other regulations to to again uh, it um, to to develop other regulations which actually uh, limited uh, this and if you if you and now when you have this uh, the situation of war i think this is again the article 20 uh, when you say yes uh, uh, it, you, it is it is a force majeure, and then there's other and there's other uh, situation, other rules apply. Um, but uh, and what is then forgotten when when you apply it? It should be limited and it should be precise. And this is again, this is again, it, it, maybe regulations are, are are necessary, but then it's often they are often it's often forgotten to. Uh, to lift them, and and uh, and then they become so vague that they can again be ab abused, and this is and this is what is observed, and uh, yeah. So, uh, for instance, in my country, in Germany, there were no, uh, um, and maybe this also shows the effective or not effectiveness. So, um, in, in in Germany, there were no regulations on this, and everybody was able to report freely. Of course. Uh, following this, um, and I think the people also, uh, for for a certain time, also trusted the government uh, because uh, they they had trust because it was they were also allowed to criticize and uh, and to do it. 
But then, interestingly, I can tell you uh, in, with the example which I still found uh, interesting, so we had the case of Germany, Austria and Switzerland, the countries which would, you would say uh, enjoying a lot of freedom and also enjoying, uh, enjoying a very good health system. And it was interesting to observe that these three countries were below the average in Europe when it came to, to, to vaccination because people were very critical about it. So again, it raises this, is regulation really effective or is there, is there also other approaches? Again, it, one also has to, have, has to take a holistic approach to, uh, uh, to, 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 con, uh, to talk to people um, and, and to, to implement, uh, implement something. And because of this, it, again, we also had a divide in, this, uh, in the society because, of course, there were many people or are still people refusing to to accept uh, to accept it and uh, to uh, and, and many and, and the majority is now also have to follow longer restrictions for this so then again it's the question so does it would would something have changed if you if you imp, uh, if you imp, uh, if you impose regulations i think one always have to see a bigger picture is this really the effective tool to do it uh, and and do you have to do other measures uh, uh, to to take into this Next question, and I understand that we are well behind our agenda and we're abusing our time, but I cannot uh, restrict anyone's uh, freedom of expression. So, Mr. Sakuns, uh, please. Uh, and I think I haven't missed any other hands. Uh, please. Uh, uh, express uh, your observation, your remarks. Uh, do you have the microphone? The microphone is gone. This is a technical restriction, nevertheless. Thank you. Uh, frankly speaking, because this forum is uh, really very important, uh, we also should provide uh, the evidence in an accurate way. Because in the morning it was mentioned that it's the first time to, for Freedom House to organize such an event, but I think the Council of Europe uh, organized such an event in 2009 or 10. Of course, uh, uh, it was a bit different, but it had this. Uh, it was a similar one, and we also had the Human Rights Forum by Fidesz, which was uh, again, uh, uh, which actually also uh, caused a great stir because uh, even the human rights defenders were restricted from participating in it. Well, uh, I just wanted to mention that it's not the first forum to be held. Well, uh, the restrict uh, from the point of view of restriction of rights, uh, except for the European, con uh, uh, sub except for the substance of the European Convention. Uh, and except for none uh, uh, f being free from uh, torture and slavery. So the rest of the restrictions are, uh, re uh, they refer to others' rights, uh, uh, preservation of the constitutional order, etc. cetera. Uh, but uh, the restriction, with regard to the restriction, we should always know that strict restrictions have never solved issues. We should talk about regulations rather than restrictions. Uh, Mr. Hakopian, uh, the Eastern Partnership uh, uh, Forums uh, pl uh, platform actually referred to uh, the broadcast issue of Russian media back in 2014. It particularly referred to uh, the uh, the uh, situation after the cri uh, an annexation of Crimea, about the Euromaidan, uh, about uh, uh, 
and in this announcement there was uh, uh, mentioning that through Russian media they are using enmity, etc. It's not about this information. It was about the uh, about um, hate and enmity and national enmity uh, that is uh, that is a requirement of the Armenian legislation. It's not actually within the framework of activity of an NGO. It's actually a requirement of the law. It's uh, the law that bans such uh, speech to be used. It's actually unacceptable from the point of view of security of a democratic country. If the country does not have the mechanisms, then we should create ones, but that uh, especially in this context uh, of uh, war of Russia against Ukraine, the Russian media who are uh, under the strict restriction of Russia's uh, authorities, they are actually broadcast in the Republic of Armenia. They completely contradict uh, the s security and values in a, of a democratic country. And hence, there should be steps to, uh, in that direction, but they shouldn't be done by the civil society, but by uh, the regulations by uh, the Armenian authorities, the government, the National Assembly, and particularly Particularly, the uh, state uh, body uh, regulating this uh, sector, what, what is done, why is it not done, in, in, and I don't mean only the Russian uh, broadcasters, it may be also Armenian uh, broadcasters. I'm not even talking about who finances this. It's actually about information uh, security, and uh, the information security issue shouldn't be put on the shoulders of the civil society or a self-regulatory body. Uh, security should be addressed by the our national security should be addressed by our uh, government and from this point of view if we do not uh, have mechanisms uh, or if they are to uh, why do we don't have uh, them or why they are weak if we have them what is being done in order to solve this issue the civil society is ready to participate uh, if uh, there is a relevant political will. Thank you very much. And uh, also, I would like to add that uh, we know that um, the prevention of uh, of the blockage of Russian today, Russia today, which uh, spreads uh, obvious uh, disinformation. So these methods uh, of uh, of restricting the freedom of speech, to what extent they are proportional, and why we shouldn't uh, uh, use it in uh, the Republic of Armenia, which is a member of the Council of Europe. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hakusakons. By saying disinformation, well, it's more of a working team. I agree uh, that a working term. I agree that uh, these are actually calls that are banned by legislation, etc. All of the elements are there. I didn't say that uh, the uh, civil. Uh, Society did not refer to uh, this issue. Yes, they. Uh, we talked about it in 2013, 2014, etc. But the, I just mentioned that that discourse did not get any support back then. If it got support, the law would be designed in a different way. Because you say that you are uh, discontent with criminalization and you actively work in that direction. You s propose your suggestions. You provide the international best practice. And in this case, there was no such uh, acti activity. And if you think that it's uh, an issue of less uh, imp uh, prominence for Armenia, and then uh, okay, but this issue, I, th I see that this issue was ignored, and this issue should have been uh, solved before the adoption of the law. And this uh, law allowed to uh, sign an intergovernmental agreement with Russia. Uh, people know what efforts I have uh, taken in order to make the formulations at least softer, but I didn't uh, manage it uh, because this 
issue was ignored by the civil society back then, and I, I will repeat what I said. It was ignored by the civil society. The commission does not have any levers to affect it. And there was also a suggestion of, from some groups, from some organizations, journalists, that uh, uh, we should uh, liberalize the law to the extent possible. They have liberalized it to the extent that we do have no levers to uh, to restrict the activity of Russian media. Not, I don't mean only the Russian, but uh, tomorrow it may be Chinese media or other media. Uh, so we do not have any levers to affect the content that does not abide with the law. And uh, the side that p the party that signed this intergovernmental agreement, uh, they have actually had to have to apply to the other party. And this is not a working mechanism. Uh, a year ago, I was uh, at the deputy minister, uh, pr prime minister's office. I suggested to uh, have uh, to develop certain protocols to create a working group and send these protocols to the Russian side and see, try to see what co uh, consequences it can have, for instance, uh, a discriminatory attitude uh, or uh, uh, so whatever, wherever there is intervention to our domestic life, yes, uh, a year has passed, the working group has not been uh, created and there has been no response. So what we are able to do, we are doing it to the best of our ability, but there is no support by, neither by the citizens nor by the executive and legislative bodies. We. Nune is my very good friend, and I really endlessly love her. And uh, the applications only go from the side of the application. It goes to the no no NGOs no uh, apply. For, uh, no government. The government does not initiate anything. Uh, we have actually applied to the observer body nine times. No other organization has uh, applied. Other organizations just complain on Facebook, in Twitter, in the National Assembly, but nobody takes the burden of formulating it and send it to the observer body or to the regulating uh, body uh, that follows the maintenance of ethics by TVs and etc. Uh, so that's not self-regulation. Self-regulation should be overseen by, over, uh, overseen by the society and by the public. There are good mechanisms and there are very good mechanisms that simply do not work in Armenia. We are not a country that has a neighbor like Belgium. Uh, self-regulation should, uh, should go in parallel with regulation. And we can, of course, every day uh, apologize that we uh, violated a norm of ethics, and then the next day uh, um, make f 10 more violations. And there are no legal mechanisms uh, that would hold them accountable. So this is actually a topic of uh, in a large discussion. But we do face issues that are not solved. Uh, dozens of conferences, seminars are taking place. But these issues are not finding any solution. I'm just saying let's collect these issues and start the solution because this is not a blow to the democracy. It's a blow to our state because even if we are not a democracy, don't we have the right to survive, to overcome this post-war situation? You see it as a blow to the model. I see it as a blow to our country. I think it's a deeper issue than just a blow to the model. Thank you. Ms. Sarkson. We're finishing. I would like to conclude to sum up the panel. But I, I don't want to, Mr. Hagopan to say the last words in this panel. That's why I want to comment in any case as a p part of the observer body. The Council of Radio and TV is not the only a body. and. We want uh, to have more conclusions and, and uh, the, 
we have also an agreement with the Council. And secondly, we never neglected particularly the Russian broadcasters on the ground uh, air and we had uh, discussions on audiovisual legislation. Uh, in 90s, I was uh, personally a part of it. I was fighting so that the Russian TV's w channels were in the uh, on the air, and the Russian channels, which, uh, uh, if you remember, they had the right to be broadcast, and they were uh, competitors of the Armenian broadcasters, and it was a issue, a problem, and we were saying and promoting and encouraging the broadcasters to stand on their feet and to make this change. And in the last uh, uh, change, in the recent bill of uh, the law, which was not passed, and it is not the bill that we were dreaming about. And we so it's not it really doesn't doesn't really correspond to the reality i personally am ready to do my best so that overground uh, broadcast it, any package on overground pack uh, broadcasting uh, and frankly speaking i would like to say that uh, any there, there should be any channel uh, rebroadcasting ch channel because we have for instance cable tvs for that Thank you, Ms. Sarksyan, and let's just conclude today's uh, meeting. Uh, I don't want to e exploit your uh, time. The floor is yours. So, uh, um, this topic that you are discussing, I can only confirm it is it is very very it is very very complex, and it's not only between states. It is also when we talk about transfrontier trans television, there's also an act that allows countries to, to receive uh, to receive each others. And this is, for instance, also the, uh, what, what is facing with the European Union. Uh, and also in, when we take the case of Germany, they, they found, and then each country can say, do we have something or not? So they had, uh, uh, they, they decided to give not Russia today the, the license because they said we don't, in Germany, given our history, we don't give a, a country, a, a state broadcaster the right to broadcast. But the uh, impact was, uh, the impact was it meant a lot of lawsuits and, uh, and the consequence was also that Deutsche Welle, the Deutsche Welle was kicked out of Moscow, so they cannot broadcast there. And Deutsche Welle, who, would, who I would say, uh, yes, they are funded by the states. And then there was the discussion, so why are they among the, the, the German cable operators? And, the, and, and uh, the regulator in Germany, to show the consistency, also decided just last week that Deutsche Welle has to get out of the, uh, the, out of the cable television. So there's always, uh, there's always one has to see what is the provision. And also, one has to one has to accept that some laws that have been decided. And again, we come back to the 30 years ago when all when many have been very optimistic and saw there is this uh, there is this new opportunities with technology and 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 a different political climate. All these laws that come from that time, they were really about exchange. And, and it, it was a time when you would say, yes, it, it is interesting. And, and these laws come that from the time when you, would, uh, when you would assume there is a positive and there is a positive time. All these laws, um, I think they, they turn and they turn very difficult to implement when you have a time of, uh, yeah, when you have a different, completely different uh, climate and when you see 
um, when you see also that there's more technology, uh, that the technology is uh, maybe is, is, is still, it brings a lot of uh, positive things, but it brings a lot of negative things. But these laws now also allow for, and there's many countries who have decided on indiv individual cases to block, and then they find like, okay, we don't extend the contract for, for rent, but then this can also, and this also again leads to, to distrust and, and leads to long lawsuits and which at the end also then, then are revoked. If you have a judicial system, they are revoked and, and, and everything is put into place. So it is, it is complicated and I think it needs to, uh, as it was said, uh, but I, I think there is at least some, some more with all talks. I think there's, more, there's also more insights and more understanding for this topic, which is complex and can of not decide it in, 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 yeah, in one session and in one country. Thank you, honorable guests. I'm sorry for abusing your uh, patience. I thank all the organizers for this event because it will contribute to the democratic development and democratization of the country. Goodbye. Ravi Dumeng, Antonella Lucian.